Section 1 of The Faith of Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Ackerman. A Relic of the Pliocene by Jack London. I washed my hands of him at the start. I cannot father his tales, nor will I be responsible for them. I make these preliminary reservations observe as a guard upon my own integrity. I possess a certain definite position in a small way, also a wife, and for the good name of the community that honors my existence with its approval, and for the sake of her posterity and mine, I cannot take the chances I once did, nor foster probabilities with the careless improvidence of youth. So, I repeat, I wash my hands of him, this Nimrod, this mighty hunter, this homely, blue-eyed, freckle-faced Thomas Stevens. Having been honest to myself, and to whatever perspective, all of branches my wife may be pleased to tender me, I can now afford to be generous. I shall not criticize the tales told me by Thomas Stevens, and further, I shall withhold my judgment. If it be asked why, I can only add that judgment I have none. Long have I pondered, weighed, and balanced, but never have my conclusions been twice the same, forsooth, because Thomas Stevens is a greater man than I. If he have told truths, well and good. If untruths, still, well and good. For who can prove, or who disprove? I eliminate myself from the proposition, while those of little faith may do as I have done, go find the same Thomas Stevens, and discuss to his face the various matters which, if fortune serve, I shall relate. As to where he may be found, the directions are simple anywhere between the fifty-third north latitude and the pole, on the one hand, and, on the other, the likeliest hunting grounds that lie between the east coast of Siberia and the farthermost Labrador. That he is there, somewhere, within that clearly defined territory, I pledge the word of an honorable man whose expectations entail straight speaking and right living. Thomas Stevens may have toyed prodigiously with truth, but when we first met, it were well to mark this point, he wandered into my camp when I thought myself a thousand miles beyond the outermost post of civilization. At the sight of his human face, the first in weary months, I could have sprung forward and folded him in my arms, and I am not by any means a demonstrative man. But to him his visit seemed the most casual thing under the sun. He just strolled into the light of my camp, passed the time of day after the custom of men on beaten trails, threw my snowshoes the one way, and a couple of dogs the other, and so made room for himself by the fire. Said he'd just dropped in to borrow a pinch of soda, and to see if I had any decent tobacco. He plucked forth an ancient pipe, loaded it with painstaking care, and, without as much as a by your leave, whacked half the tobacco of my pouch into his. Yes, the stuff was fairly good. He sighed with the contentment of the just, and literally absorbed the smoke from the crisping yellow flakes, and it did my smoker's heart good to behold him. Hunter? Trapper? Prospector? He shrugged his shoulders. No. Just sort of knocking around a bit. Had come up from the great slave some time since, and was thinking of traipsing over into the Yukon country. The factor of Koshim had spoken about the discoveries on the Klondike, and he was of a mind to run over for a peep. I noticed that he spoke of the Klondike in the archaic vernacular, calling it the Reindeer River, a conceited custom that the old-timers employ against the Chichaquas and all tender feet in general. But he did it so naively, and as such a matter of course, that there was no sting, and I forgave him. He also had it in view, he said, before he crossed the divide into the Yukon, to make a little run up Fort of Good Hope way. Now, Fort of Good Hope is a far journey to the north, over and beyond the circle, in a place where the feet of few men have trod, and when a nondescript ragamuffin comes in out of the night, from nowhere in particular, to sit by one's fire and discourse on such terms of traipsing and a little run, it is fair time to rouse up and shake off the dream. Wherefore, I looked about me, saw the fly, and underneath the pine boughs spread for the sleeping furs, saw the grub sacks, the camera, the frosty breasts of the dogs circling on the edge of the light, and above, a great streamer of the aurora bridging the zenith from southeast to northwest. I shivered. There is a magic in the Northland night that steals in on one like fevers from malarial marshes. You are clutched and downed before you are aware. Then I looked to the snowshoes, lying prone and crossed where he had flung them. Also I had an eye to my tobacco pouch. Half, at least, of its goodly store had vamoosed. That settled it. Fancy had not tricked me, after all. 
Crazed with suffering, I thought, looking steadfastly at the man, one of those wild stampeders strayed far from his bearings and wandering like a lost soul through great vastness and unknown deeps. Oh, well, let his mood slip on until mayhap he gathers his tangled wits together. Who knows? The mere sound of a fellow creature's voice may bring all straight again. So I let him on and talk, and soon I marveled, for he talked of game and the ways thereof. He had killed the Siberian wolf of westernmost Alaska, and the chamois in the secret Rockies. He averred he knew the haunts where the last buffalo still roamed, that he had hung on the flanks of the caribou when they ran by the hundred thousand, and slept in the great barrens of the muskox's winter trail. And I shifted my judgment accordingly the first revision, but by no account the last, and deemed him a monumental effigy of truth. Why, it was, I know not, but the spirit moved me to repeat a tale told to me by a man who had dwelt in the land too long to know better. It was of the great bear that hugs the steep slopes of St. Elias, never descending to the levels of the gentler inclines. Now God so constituted this creature for its hillside habitat that the legs of one side are all of a foot longer than those of the other. This is mighty convenient, as will be readily admitted. So I hunted this rare beast in my own name, told it in the first person, present tense, painted the requisite locale and gave it the necessary garnishings and touches of verisimilitude, and looked to see the man stunned by the recital. Not he. Had he doubted, I could have forgiven him. Had he objected, denying the dangers of such a hunt by virtue of the animal's inability to turn about and go the other way, had he done this, I say, I could have taken him by the hand for the true sportsman that he was. Not he. He sniffed, looked on me, and sniffed again, then gave my tobacco due praise, thrust one foot into my lap, and bade me examine the gear. It was a muckluck of the Inuit pattern, sewed together with sinew threads and devoid of beads or furbelows, but it was the skin itself that was remarkable, in that it was all of half an inch thick. It reminded me of walrus hide, but there the resemblance ceased, for no walrus ever bore so marvelous a growth of hair. On the side and ankles the hair was well nigh worn away, what a friction with the underbrush and snow, but around the top and down the more sheltered back it was coarse, dirty black, and very thick. I parted it with difficulty and looked beneath for the fine fur that is common with northern animals, but found it in this case to be absent. This, however, was compensated for by the length. Indeed, the tufts that had survived wear and tear measured all of seven or eight inches. I looked up into the man's face, and he pulled his foot down and asked, "'Find hide like that on your St. Elias bear?' I shook my head. "'Nor on any other creature of land or sea,' I answered candidly. The thickness of it and the length of the bear puzzled me. "'That,' he said, and said without the slightest hint of impressiveness, "'that came from a mammoth.' "'Nonsense!' I exclaimed, for I could not forbear the protest of my unbelief. The mammoth, my dear sir, long ago vanished from the earth. We know it once existed by the fossil remains that we have unearthed, and by the frozen carcass that the Siberian sun saw fit to melt from out of the bosom of the glacier, but we also know that no living specimen exists. Our explorers—' At this word he broke in impatiently. "'Your explorers? Pish! A weakly breed. Let us hear no more of them.' But tell me, O oh man, what you may know of the mammoth and his ways. Beyond contradiction, this was leading to a yarn, so I baited my hook by ransacking my memory for whatever data I possessed on the subject in hand. To begin with, I emphasized that the animal was prehistoric, and marshaled all of my facts in support of this. I mentioned the Siberian sandbars that abound with ancient mammoth bones, spoke of the large quantities of fossil ivory purchased from the Inuits by the Alaska Commercial Company, and acknowledging having myself mined six- and eight-foot tusks from the pay gravel of the Klondike Creeks. All fossils, I concluded, found in the midst of debris deposited through countless ages. I remember when I was a kid, Thomas Stevens sniffed. He had a most confounded way of sniffing, that I saw a petrified watermelon. Hence, though mistaken persons sometimes delude themselves into thinking that they really are raising or eating them, there are no such things as extant watermelons. But the question of food, I objected, ignoring his point, which was puerile and without bearing, the soil must bring forth vegetable life in lavish abundance to support so monstrous creations. Nowhere in the north is the soil so prolific, ergo the mammoth cannot exist. I pardon your ignorance concerning many matters of this Northland, for you are a young man and have traveled little, but, at the same time, I am inclined to agree with you on one thing. The mammoth no longer exists. How do I know? I killed the last one with my own right arm. 
Thus spake Nimrod, the mighty hunter. I threw a stick of firewood at the dogs, and bade them quit their unholy howling, and waited. Undoubtedly, this liar of singular felicity would open his mouth and requite me for my St. Elias bear. It was this way, he at last began, after the appropriate silence had intervened. I was in camp one day. Where? I interrupted. He waved his hand vaguely in the direction of the northeast, where stretched a terra incognita into which vastness few men have strayed, and fewer emerged. I was in camp one day with Klooch. Klooch was as handsome a little kamux as ever whined betwixt the traces or shoved nose into a camp kettle. Her father was a full-blood Malamute from Russian Pastilic on Bering Sea, and I bred her, and with understanding, out of a clean-legged bitch of the Hudson Bay stock. I tell you, oh man, she was a corker combination, and now, on this day I have in mind, she was brought to pup through a pure wild wolf of the woods, gray and long of limb with big lungs and no end of staying power say was there ever the like it was a new breed of dog i had started and i could look forward to big things as i have said she was brought neatly to pup and safely delivered i was squatting on my hams over the litter seven sturdy blind little beggars when from behind came a bray of trumpets and a crash of brass there was a rush like the wind squall that kicks the heels of the rain and i was midway to my feet when knocked flat on my face at the same instant i heard klooch sigh very much as a man does when you've planted your fist in his belly you can stake your sack i lay quiet but i twisted my head round and saw a huge bulk swaying above me then the blue sky flashed into view and i got to my feet a hairy mountain of flesh was just disappearing in the underbrush on the edge of the open. I caught a rear-end glimpse with a stiff tail as big in girth as my body standing out straight behind. The next second only a tremendous hole remained in the thicket, though I could still hear the sounds as of a tornado dying quickly away, underbrush ripping and tearing, and trees snapping and crashing. I cast about for my rifle. It had been lying on the ground with the muzzle against a log but now the stock was smashed, the barrel out of line, and the working gear in a thousand bits. Then I looked for the slut, and... and what do you suppose? I shook my head. May my soul burn in a thousand hells if there was anything left of her. Klooch, the seven sturdy blind little beggars, gone. All gone. Where she had stretched was a slimy, bloody depression in the soft earth, all of a yard in diameter, and around the edges a few scattered hairs measured three feet on the snow, threw about it a circle, and glanced at Nimrod. The beast was thirty long and twenty high, he answered, and its tusks scaled over six times three feet. I couldn't believe myself, at the time, for all that it had just happened, but if my senses had played me, there was the broken gun and the hole in the brush. And there was, or rather there was not, Klooch and the pups. Oh, man, it makes me hot all over when I think of it. Klooch, another Eve, the mother of a new race, and a rampaging, ranting old bull mammoth like a second flood wiping them, root and branch, off the face of the earth. Do you wonder that the blood-soaked earth cried out high to God, or that I grabbed the hand-axe and took the trail? The hand-axe, I exclaimed, startled out of myself by the picture. The hand-axe and a big bull mammoth, thirty feet long, twenty feet... Nimrod joined me in my merriment, chuckling gleefully. Wouldn't it kill you, he cried. Wasn't it a beaver's dream? Many's the time I've laughed about it since, but at the time it was no laughing matter. I was that dang mad, what of the gun and klooch. Think of it, oh man! A brand new, unclassified, uncopyrighted breed, and wiped out before ever it opened its eyes or took out its intention papers. Well, so be it. Life's full of disappointments, and rightly so. Meat is best after a famine, and a bed soft after a hard trail. As I was saying, I took out after the beast with a hand axe, and hung to its heels down the valley. But when he circled back towards the head, I was left winded at the lower end. Speaking of grub, I might as well stop long enough to explain a couple of points. Up thereabouts, in the midst of the mountains, is an almighty curious formation. There is no end of little valleys, each like the other, much as peas in a pod, and all neatly tucked away with straight rocky walls rising on all sides. And at the lower ends are always small openings where the drainage or glaciers must have broken out. The only way in is through these mouths, and they are all small, and some smaller than others. As to grub, you've slushed around the rain-soaked islands of the Alaskan coast down the Sitka way, most likely, seeing as you're a traveler, and you know how stuff grows there. Big, and juicy, and jungly. 
Well, that's the way it was with those valleys. Thick, rich soil with ferns and grasses and such things in patches higher than your heads. Rain three days out of four during the summer months, and food in them for a thousand mammoths, to say nothing of small game for man. To get back. Down at the lower end of the valley, I got winded and gave over. I began to speculate, for when my wind left me, my dander got hotter and hotter, and I knew I'd never know peace of mind till I dined on roasted mammoth foot. And I knew, also, that that stood for Skookum Mamuk Pupakuk, excuse Chinook, I mean that there was a big fight coming. Now, the mouth of my valley was very narrow, and the walls steep. High up on the one side was one of those big pivot rocks, or balancing rocks as some men call them, weighing all of a couple hundred tons. Just the thing. I hit back for camp, keeping an eye open so the bull couldn't slip past and got all my ammunition. It wasn't worth anything with the rifle smashed, so I opened the shells, planted the powder under the rock, and touched it off with slow fuse. Wasn't much of a charge, but the old boulder tilted up lazily and dropped down into place, with just space enough to let the creek drain nicely. Now I had him. How did you have him? I queried. Who ever heard of a man killing a mammoth with a hand axe? And for that matter, with anything else? Oh, man, have I not told you I was mad? Nimrod replied with a slight manifestation of sensitiveness. Mad clean through, what of Klooch and the gun. Also, was I not a hunter? And was this not new and most unusual game? A hand axe? Pish, I did not need it. Listen and you shall hear of a hunt such as might have happened in the youth of the world when cavemen rounded up the kill with hand-axe of stone. Such would have served me well. Now is it not a fact that man can outwalk the dog or the horse, that he can wear them out with the intelligence of his endurance? I nodded. Well, the light broke in on me, and I bade him continue. My valley was perhaps five miles around. The mouth was closed. There was no way to get out. A timid beast was that bull mammoth, and I had him at my mercy. I got on his heels again, hollered like a fiend, pelted him with cobbles, and raced him around the valley three times before I knocked off for supper. Don't you see? A race course, a man and a mammoth, a hippodrome with sun, moon, and stars to referee. It took me two months to do it, but I did it, and that's no beaver dream. Round and round I ran him, me traveling on the inner circle, eating jerked meat and salmon berries on the run, and snatching winks of sleep between. Of course, he'd get desperate at times and turn. Then I'd head for soft ground where the creeks spread out, and lay anathema upon him and his ancestry, and dare him to come on. But he was too wise to bog in a mud puddle. Once he pinned me against the walls, and I crawled back into a deep crevice and waited. Whenever he felt for me with his trunk, I'd belt him with the hand axe till he pulled out, shrieking fit to split my eardrums, he was that mad. He knew he had me, and didn't have me, and it near drove him wild. But he was no man's fool. He knew he was safe as long as I stayed in the crevice, and he made up his mind to keep me there. And he was dead right, only he hadn't figured on the commissary. There was neither grub nor water around that spot, so on the face of it he couldn't keep up the siege. He stand before the opening for hours, keeping an eye on me and flapping mosquitoes away with his big blanket ears. Then the thirst would come on him, and he'd ramp round and roar till the earth shook, calling me every name he could lay tongue to. This was to frighten me, of course, and when he thought I was sufficiently impressed, he'd back away softly and try to make a sneak for the creek. Sometimes I'd let him get almost there, only a couple hundred yards away it was, when out I'd pop and back he'd come, lumbering along like the old landslide he was. After I'd done this a few times, and he'd figured it out, he changed his tactics grasp the time element, you see. Without a word of warning, away he'd go, tearing for the water like mad, scheming to get there and back before I ran away. Finally, after cursing me most horribly, he raised the siege and deliberately stalked off to the water hole. That was the only time he penned me. Three days of it. But after that, the hippodrome never stopped. Round and round and round, like a six days go as I please, for he never pleased. My clothes went to rags and tatters, but I never stopped to mend, till at last I ran naked as a son of earth, with nothing but the old hand-axe in one hand and a cobble in the other. In fact, I never stopped, save for peeps of sleep in the crannies and ledges of the cliffs. As for the bull, he got perceptibly thinner and thinner, must have lost several tons at least, and as nervous as a schoolmarm on the wrong side of matrimony. 
when I'd come up with him and yell, or lane him with a rock at a long range, he'd jump like a skittish colt and tremble all over. Then he'd pull out on the run, tail and trunk waving stiff, head over one shoulder, and wicked eyes blazing. And the way he'd swear at me was something dreadful. A most immoral beast he was, a murderer and a blasphemer. But, towards the end, he quit all this, and fell to whimpering and crying like a baby. His spirit broke, and he became a quivering jelly mountain of misery. He'd get attacks of palpitation of the heart, and stagger around like a drunken man, and fall down and bark his shins. And then he'd cry, but always on the run. Oh, man, the gods themselves would have wept with him, and you, yourself, or any other man. It was pitiful, and there was so much of it, but I only hardened my heart and hit up the pace. At last I wore him clean out, and he lay down, broken-winded, broken-hearted, hungry, and thirsty. When I found he wouldn't budge, I hamstrung him, and spent the better part of the day wading into him with a hand-axe, he a-sniffing and a-sobbing, till I worked far in enough to shut him off. Thirty feet long he was, and twenty high, and a man could sling a hammock between his tusks and sleep comfortably. Barring the fact that I had run most of the juices out of him, he was fair eating, and his four feet alone, roasted whole, would have lasted a man a twelve-month. I spent the winter there myself. And where is this valley? I asked. He waved his hand in the direction of the northeast, and said, Your tobacco is very good. I carry a fair share of it in my pouch, but I shall carry the recollection of it until I die. In token of my appreciation, and return for the moccasins on your own feet, I will present to you these mucklucks. They commemorate Klooch and the seven blind little beggars. They are also souvenirs of an unparalleled event in history, namely, the destruction of the oldest breed of animal on earth, and the youngest. And their chief virtue lies in that they will never wear out. Having effected the exchange, he knocked the ashes from his pipe, gripped my hand good night, and wandered off through the snow. Concerning this tale, for which I have already disclaimed responsibility, I would recommend those of little faith to make a visit to the Smithsonian Institute. If they bring the requisite credentials and do not come in vacation time, they will undoubtedly gain an audience with Professor Dolvidson. The mucklucks are in his possession, and he will verify, not the manner in which they were obtained, but the material of which they are composed. When he states that they are made from the skin of the mammoth, the scientific world accepts his verdict. What more would you have? End of A Relic of the Pliocene Recording by Brian Ackerman A Hyperborean Brew Section 2 of The Faith of Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica A. C. Snyder Section 2 of The Faith of Men by Jack London A Hyperborean Brew The Story of a Scheming White Man Among the Strange People Who Live on the Rim of the Arctic Sea Thomas Stevens' veracity may have been indeterminate as X, and his imagination, the imagination of ordinary men, increased to the nth power, but this, at least, must be said. Never did he deliver himself of word nor deed that could be branded as a lie outright. He may have played with probability, and verged on the extremest edge of possibility, but in his tales the machinery never creaked. That he knew the Northland like a book, not a soul could deny. That he was a great traveller, and had set foot on countless unknown trails, many evidences affirm. Outside of my own personal knowledge, I knew men that had met him everywhere, but principally on the confines of nowhere. There was Johnson, the ex-Hudson Bay Company factor, who had housed him in a Labrador factory until his dogs rested up a bit and he was able to strike out again. There was McMahon, agent for the Alaska Commercial Company, who had run across him in Dutch Harbor and later on among the outlying islands of the Aleutian group. 
it was indisputable that he had guided one of the earlier United States surveys, and history states positively that in a similar capacity he served the Western Union when it attempted to put through its Trans-Alaskan and Siberian telegraph to Europe. Further, there was Joe Lamson, the whaling captain, who, when ice-bound off the mouth of the Mackenzie, had had him come aboard after tobacco. This last touch proves Thomas Stevens' identity conclusively. His quest for tobacco was perennial and untiring. Ere we became fairly acquainted, I learned to greet him with one hand and pass the pouch with the other. But the night I met him in John O'Brien's Dawson Saloon, his head was wreathed in a nimbus of fifty-cent cigar smoke, and instead of my pouch, he demanded my sack. We were standing by a faro table, and forthwith he tossed it upon the high card. Fifty, he said, and the gamekeeper nodded. The high card turned, and he handed back my sack called for a tab, and drew me over to the scales, where the weigher nonchalantly cashed him out fifty dollars in dust. "'And now we'll drink,' he said, and later, at the bar, when he lowered his glass, "'Reminds me of a little brew I had up Tatterat way. No, you have no knowledge of the place, nor is it down on the charts. But it's up by the rim of the Arctic Sea.' not so many hundred miles from the American line, and all of half a thousand God-forsaken souls live there, giving and taking in marriage and starving and dying in between whiles. Explorers have overlooked them, and you will not find them in the census of 1890. A whale-ship was pinched there once, but the men, who had made shore over the ice, pulled out for the south and were never heard of. But it was a great brew we had, Musu and I he added a moment later, with just the slightest suspicion of a sigh. I knew there were big deeds and wild doings behind that sigh, so I hailed him into a corner between a roulette outfit and a poker layout, and waited for his tongue to thaw. Had one objection to Musu, he began, cocking his head meditatively. One objection and only one. He was an Indian from over on the edge of the Chippewyan country. But the trouble was, he'd picked up a smattering of the scriptures, been camp-made a season with a renegade French-Canadian who'd studied for the church. Moose who'd never seen applied Christianity, and his head was crammed with miracles, battles, and dispensations and what not he didn't understand. Otherwise, he was a good sort and a handy man on trail or over a fire. We'd had a hard time together and were badly knocked out when we plumped upon Tatterat. Lost outfits and dogs crossing a divide in a fall blizzard, and our bellies clove to our backs and our clothes were in rags when we crawled into the village. They weren't much surprised at seeing us because of the whalemen, and gave us the meanest shack in the village to live in and the worst of their leavings to live on. What struck me at the time as strange was that they left us strictly alone. But Musu explained it. Shaman, sick tum tum, he said, meaning the shaman, or medicine man, was jealous, and had advised the people to have nothing to do with us. From the little he'd seen of the whalemen, he'd learned that mine was a stronger race and a wiser so he'd only behaved as shamans have always behaved the world over, and before I get done you'll see how near right he was. These people have a law, said Musu. Whoso eats of meat must hunt. We be awkward, you and I, O oh master, in the weapons of this country, nor can we string bows nor fling spears after the manner approved. Wherefore the shaman and Tumasuk, who is chief, have put their heads together, and it has been decreed that we work with the women and children in dragging in the meat and tending the wants of the hunters. And this is very wrong, I made answer, for we be better men, Musu, than these people who walk in darkness. Furthermore, 
we should rest and grow strong, for the way south is long, and on that trail the weak cannot prosper. But we have nothing, he objected, looking about him at the rotten timbers of the igloo, the stench of the ancient walrus meat that had been our supper disgusting his nostrils. And on this fare we cannot thrive. We have nothing save the bottle of painkiller, which will not fill emptiness. So we must bend to the yoke of the unbeliever and become hewers of wood and drawers of water. And there be good things in this place, the which we may not have. Ah, oh, master, never has my nose lied to me, and I have followed it to secret caches among the fur bales of the igloos. Good provender did these people extort from the poor whalemen, and this provender has wandered into few hands. The woman Ipsukuk, who dwelleth in the far end of the village, next she igloo of the chief, possesseth much flour and sugar, and even have my eyes told me of molasses smeared on her face. And in the igloo of Tomasuk, the chief, there be tea. Have I not seen the old pig guzzling? And the shaman owneth a caddy of star, and two buckets of prime smoking. And what have we? Nothing. Nothing! But I was stunned by the word he brought of the tobacco, and made no answer. And Musu, what of his desire, broke silence. And there be Tukaliketa, daughter of a big hunter and wealthy man, a likely girl, indeed a very nice girl. I had figured hard during the night while Musu snored, for I could not bear the thought of the tobacco so near which I could not smoke. True, as he had said, we had nothing, but the way became clear to me, and in the morning I said to him, Go thou cunningly abroad after thy fashion, and procure me some sort of bone, crooked like a gooseneck, and hollow. Also walk humbly, but have eyes awake to the lay of pots and pans and cooking contrivances. And remember, mine is the white man's wisdom, and do what I have bid you, with sureness and dispatch. While he was away, I placed the whale oil cooking lamp in the middle of the igloo, and moved the mangy sleeping furs back that I might have room. Then I took apart his gun and put the barrel by handy, and afterwards braided many wicks from the cotton that the women gather wild in the summer. When he came back, it was with the bone I had commanded, and with news that in the igloo of Tomasuk there was a five-gallon kerosene can and a big copper kettle. So I said he had done well, and we would tarry through the day. And when midnight was near, I made harangue to him. This chief, this Tomasuk, hath a copper kettle, likewise a kerosene can. I put a rock, smooth and wave-washed, in Musu's hand. The camp is hushed, and the stars are winking. Go thou, creep into the chief's igloo softly, and smite him thus upon the belly, and hard, and let the meat and good grub of the days to come put strength into thine arm. There will be uproar and outcry, and the village will come hot afoot. But be thou unafraid, veil thy movements, and lose thy form in the obscurity of the night and the confusion of men. And when the woman Ipsukuk is a thee, she who smeareth her face with molasses, do thou smite her likewise, and whosoever else that possesseth flour and cometh to thy hand. Then do thou lift thy voice in pain, and double up with clasped hands, and make outcry in token that thou too hast felt the visitation of the night. And in this way shall we achieve honor and great possessions, and the caddy of star, and the prime smoking, and thy Tukiliketa, who is a likely maiden. When he had departed on this errand, I bided patiently in the shack, and the tobacco seemed very near. Then there was a cry of a fright in the night that became an uproar and assailed the sky. I seized the painkiller and ran forth. There was much noise and a wailing among the women, and fear sat heavily on all. 
Tumasuk and the woman Ipsukuk rolled on the ground in pain, and with them there were diverse others, also Musu. I thrust aside those that cluttered the way of my feet, and put the mouth of the bottle to Musu's lips, and straightway he became well and ceased his howling, whereat there was a great clamor for the bottle from the others so stricken. But I made harangue, and ere they tasted and were made well, I had mulcted Tumasuk of his copper kettle and kerosene can, and the woman Upsukuk of her sugar and molasses, and the other sick ones of goodly measures of flour. The shaman glowered wickedly at the people around my knees, though he poorly concealed the wonder that lay beneath. But I held my head high, and Musa groaned beneath the lute as he followed my heels to the shack. There I set to work. In Tumasuk's copper kettle I mixed three quarts of wheat flour with five of molasses, and to this I added of water twenty quarts. Then I placed the kettle near the lamp, that it might sour in the warmth and grow strong. Musu understood, and said my wisdom passed understanding, and was greater than Solomon's, who he had heard was a wise man of old time. The kerosene can I set over the lamp, and to its nose affixed a snout, and into the snout the bone that was like a gooseneck. I sent Musu without to pound ice, while I connected the barrel of his gun with the gooseneck, and midway on the barrel I piled the ice he had pounded, and at the far end of the gun barrel, beyond the pan of ice, I placed a small iron pot. When the brew was strong enough, and it was two days ere it could stand on its own legs, I filled the kerosene can with it and lighted the wicks I had braided. Now that all was ready, I spoke to Musu. Go forth, I said, to the chief men of the village, and give them greeting, and bid them come unto my igloo, and sleep the night away with me and the gods. The brew was singing merrily when they began shoving aside the skin flap and rolling in, and I was heaping cracked ice on the gun barrel. Out of the priming hole at the far end, drip, 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 into the iron pot fell the liquor, hooch, you know. But they'd never seen the like, and giggled nervously when I made harangue about its virtues. As I talked, I noted the jealousy in the shaman's eye. So, when I had done, I placed him side by side with Tumasuk and the woman Ipsukuk. Then I gave them to drink, and their eyes watered and their stomachs warmed, till from being afraid they reached greedily for more and when I had them well started, I turned to the others. Tumasuk made a brag about how he had once killed a polar bear, and in the vigor of his pantomime nearly slew his mother's brother, but nobody heeded. The woman Ipsukuk fell to weeping for a son lost years agone in the ice, and the shaman made incantation and prophecy. So it went, and before morning they were all on the floor, sleeping soundly with the gods. The story tells itself, does it not? The news of the magic potion spread. It was too marvelous for utterance. Tongues could tell but a tithe of the miracles it performed. It eased pain, gave surcease to sorrow, brought back old memories, dead faces, and forgotten dreams. It was a fire that ate through all the blood, and, burning, burned not. It stoutened the heart, stiffened the back, and made men more than men. It revealed the future, and gave visions, and prophecy. It brimmed with wisdom and unfolded secrets. There was no end of the things it could do, and soon there was a clamoring on all hands to sleep with the gods. They brought their warmest furs, their strongest dogs, their best meats, but I sold the hooch with discretion, and only those were favored that brought flour and molasses and sugar, and such stores poured in that I set Musu to build a cache to hold them, for there was soon no space in the igloo. Ere three days had passed, Tumasuk had gone bankrupt. The shaman, who was never more than half drunk after the first night, watched me closely and hung on for the better part of the week, 
but before ten days were gone, even the woman Ipsacook exhausted her provisions and went home weak and tottery. But Musu complained. Oh, master, he said, we have laid by great wealth in molasses and sugar and flour, but our shack is yet mean, our clothes thin, and our sleeping furs mangy. There is a call of the belly for meat, the stench of which offends not the stars, and for tea such as Tomasuk guzzles, and there is a great yearning for the tobacco of Niwak, who is shaman, and who plans to destroy us. I have flour until I am sick, and sugar and molasses without stint, yet is the heart of Musu sore, and his bed empty. Peace, I answered. Thou art weak of understanding and a fool. Walk softly and wait, and we will grasp it all. But grasp now, and we grasp little, and in the end it will be nothing. Thou art a child in the way of the white man's wisdom. Hold thy tongue and watch, and I will show you the way my brothers do overseas. And so doing, gather to themselves the riches of the earth. It is what is called business. And what dost thou know about business? But the next day he came in breathless. Oh, master, a strange thing happeneth in the igloo of Niwak the shaman. Wherefore we are lost, and we have never worn the warm furs, nor tasted the good tobacco. What of your madness for the molasses and flour? Go thou and witness, whilst I watch the brew. So I went to the igloo of Niwak. And behold, he had made his own still, fashioned cunningly after mine. And as he beheld me, he could ill conceal his triumph. For he was a man of parts, and his sleep with the gods when in my igloo had not been sound. But I was not disturbed, for I knew what I knew, and when I returned to my own igloo, I decanted to Musu, and said, Happily, the property right obtains amongst this people, who otherwise have been blessed with but few of the institutions of men. And because of this respect for property, shall you and I wax fat, and, further, we shall introduce amongst them new institutions that other peoples have worked out through great travail and suffering. But Musu understood dimly till the shaman came forth with eyes flashing and a threatening note in his voice, and demanding to trade with me. For look you, he cried, there be of flour and molasses none in all the village. The like have you gathered with a shrewd hand from my people, who have slept with your gods, and who now have nothing save large heads and weak knees and a thirst for cold water that they cannot quench. This is not good, and my voice has power among them. So it were well that we trade, you and I, even as you have traded with them for molasses and flour. And I made answer, This be good talk, and wisdom abideth in thy mouth. We will trade, for this much of flour and molasses givest thou me the caddy of star and the two buckets of smoking. And Musu groaned, and when the trade was made, and the shaman departed, he upbraided me. Now, because of thy madness, are we indeed lost. Niwak maketh hooch on his own account, and when the time is ripe, he will command the people to drink of no hooch but his hooch. And in this way are we undone, and our goods worthless, and our igloo mean, and the bed of Musu cold and empty. And I answered, by the body of the wolf say I, thou art a fool, and thy father before thee, and thy children after thee, down to the last generation. Thy wisdom is worse than no wisdom, and thy eyes blinded to business, of which I have spoken, and whereof thou knowest nothing. Go thou, son of a thousand fools, and drink of the hooch that Niwak brews in his igloo, and thank thy gods that thou hast a white man's wisdom to make soft the bed thou liest in. Go, and when thou hast drunken, return with the taste still on thy lips, that I may know. 
and two days after, Niwak sent greeting and invitation to his igloo. Musu went, but I sat alone with the song of the still in my ears, and the air thick with the shaman's tobacco, for trade was slack that night, and no one dropped in but Anjit, a young hunter that had faith in me. Later Musu came back, his speech thick with chuckling, and his eyes wrinkling with laughter. Thou art a great man, he said. Thou art a great man, O master, and because of thy greatness thou wilt not condemn Musu thy servant, who oft times doubts and cannot be made to understand. And wherefore now, I demanded, hast thou drank overmuch, and are they sleeping sound in the igloo of Niwak the shaman? Nay, they are angered and sore of body, and Chief Tumasuk has thrust his thumbs in the throat of Niwak, and sworn by the bones of his ancestors to look upon his face no more. For behold, I went to the igloo, and the brew simmered and bubbled, and the steam journeyed through the gooseneck even as thy steam, and even as thine it became water where it met the ice, and dropped into the pot at the far end, and Niwak gave us to drink, and lo, it was not like thine, <laughs> for there was no bite to the tongue, nor tingling to the eyeballs, and of a truth it was water. So we drank and we drank over much, yet did we sit with cold hearts and solemn, and Niwak was perplexed, and a cloud came on his brow, and he took Tamasuk and Ipsukuk alone of all the company and set them apart, and bade them drink and drink and drink, and they drank and drank and drank, and yet sat solemn and cold till Tumasuk arose in wrath, and demanded back the furs and the tea he had paid, and Ipsukuk raised her voice, thin and angry, and the company demanded back what they had given, and there was a great commotion. "'Does the son of a dog deem me a whale?' demanded Tumasuk, shoving back the skin flap and standing erect, his face black and his brows angry. Wherefore I am filled like a fish bladder to bursting, till I can scarce walk, what of the weight within me? La, la, I have drunken as never before, yet are my eyes clear, my knees strong, my hand steady. The shaman cannot send us to sleep with the gods, the people complained, stringing in and joining us, and only in thy igloo may the thing be done. So I laughed to myself as I passed the hooch around, and the guests made merry. For in the flour I had traded to Niwak, I had mixed much soda that I had got from the woman Ipsukuk. So how could his brew ferment when the soda kept it sweet, or his hooch be hooch when it would not sour? After that our wealth flowed in without let or hindrance. Furs we had without number, and the fancy work of the women, all of the chief's tea, and no end of meat. One day Musu retold for my benefit, and sadly mangled, the story of Joseph in Egypt, but from it I got an idea, and soon I had half the tribe at work building me great meat caches, and of all they hunted I got the lion's share and stored it away. Nor was Musu idle. He made himself a pack of cards from birch bark, and taught Niwak the way to play seven up. He also inveigled the father of Tukaliketa into the game. And one day he married the maiden, and the next day he moved into the shaman's house, which was the finest in the village. The fall of Niwak was complete, for he lost all his possessions, his walrus hide drums, his incantation tools, everything and in the end he became a hewer of wood and drawer of water at the beck and call of Musu. And Musu, he set himself up as shaman or high priest, and out of his garbled scripture created new gods and made incantation before strange altars. And I was well pleased, for I thought it good that church and state go hand in hand, and I had certain plans of my own concerning the state. 
events were shaping as I had foreseen. Good temper and smiling faces had vanished from the village. The people were morose and sullen. There were quarrels and fighting, and things were in an uproar night and day. Musu's cards were duplicated, and the hunters fell to gambling among themselves. Tumasuk beat his wife horribly, and his mother's brother objected, and smote him with a tusk of walrus till he cried aloud in the night, and was shamed before the people. Also, amid such diversions no hunting was done, and famine fell upon the land. The nights were long and dark, and without meat no hooch could be bought, so they murmured against the chief. This I had played for, and when they were well and hungry I summoned the whole village, made a great harangue, posed as patriarch, and fed the famishing. Musu made harangue likewise, and because of this and the thing I had done, I was made chief. Musu, who had the ear of God and decreed his judgments, anointed me with whale blubber, and right blubberly he did it, not understanding the ceremony. And between us we interpreted to the people the new theory of the divine right of kings. There was hooch galore and meat and feastings, and they took kindly to the new order. So you see, O oh man, I have sat in the high places, and worn the purple, and ruled populations, and I might yet be a king had the tobacco held out, or had Musu been more full and less knave. For he cast eyes upon Isanetuk, eldest daughter to Tumasuk, and I objected. O oh brother, he explained, thou hast seen fit to speak of introducing new institutions amongst this people, and I have listened to thy words and gained wisdom thereby. Thou rulest by the God-given right, and by the God-given right I marry. I noted that he brothered me, and was angry, and put my foot down. But he fell back upon the people, and made incantations for three days, in which all hands joined, and then, speaking with the voice of God, he decreed polygamy by divine fiat. But he was shrewd, for he limited the number of wives by a property qualification, and because of which he, above all men, was favored by his wealth. Nor could I fail to admire though it was plain that power had turned his head, and he would not be satisfied till all the power and all the wealth rested in his own hands. So he became swollen with pride, forgot it was I that had placed him there, and made preparations to destroy me. But it was interesting, for the beggar was working out his own way an evolution of primitive society. Now I, by virtue of the hooch monopoly, drew a revenue in which I no longer permitted him to share. So he meditated for a while, and evolved a system of ecclesiastical taxation. He laid tithes upon the people, harangued about fat firstlings and such things, and twisted whatever twisted texts he had ever heard to serve his purpose. Even this I bore in silence, but when he instituted what may be likened to a graduated income tax, I rebelled, and blindly, for this was what he worked for. Thereat he appealed to the people, and they, envious of my great wealth, and well taxed themselves, upheld him. Why should we pay, they asked, and not you? Does not the voice of God speak through the lips of Musu the shaman? So I yielded, but at the same time I raised the price of Hooch, and lo, he was not a whit behind me in raising my taxes. Then there was an open war. I made a play for Niwak and Tumasuk because of the traditionary rights they possessed, but Musu won out by creating a priesthood and giving them both high office. The problem of authority presented itself to him, and he worked it out as it has often been worked before. There was my mistake. I should have been made shaman and he chief, but I saw it too late, and in the clash of spiritual and temporal power I was bound to be worsted. 
A great controversy waged, but it quickly became one-sided. The people remembered that he had anointed me, and it was clear to them that the source of my authority lay not in me, but in Musu. Only a few faithful ones clung to me, chief among whom Anjit was, while he headed the popular party and set whispers afloat that I had it in mind to overthrow him and set up my own gods, which were most unrighteous gods. And in this the clever rascal had anticipated me, for it was just what I had intended, forsake my kingship, you see, and fight spiritual with spiritual. So he frightened the people with the iniquities of my peculiar gods, especially the one he named Busyness, and nipped the scheme in the bud. Now it happened that Kluktu, youngest daughter to Tumasuk, had caught my fancy, and I likewise hers. So I made overtures, but the ex-chief refused bluntly, after I had paid the purchase price and informed me that she was set aside for Musu. This was too much, and I was half of a mind to go to his igloo and slay him with my naked hands. But I recollected that the tobacco was near gone, and went home laughing. The next day he made incantation, and distorted the miracle of the loaves and fishes till it became prophecy, and I, reading between the lines, saw that it was aimed at the wealth of meat stored in my caches. The people also read between the lines, and, as he did not urge them to go on the hunt, they remained at home, and few caribou or bear were brought in. But I had plans of my own, seeing that not only the tobacco but the flour and molasses were near gone. And further, I felt it my duty to prove the white man's wisdom and bring sore distress to Musu, who had waxed high-stomached what of the power I had given him. So that night I went to my meat caches and toiled mightily, and it was noted next day that all the dogs of the village were lazy. No one suspected, and I toiled thus every night and the dogs grew fat and fatter, and the people lean and leaner. They grumbled and demanded the fulfillment of the prophecy, but Musu restrained them, waiting for their hunger to grow yet greater, nor did he dream to the very last of the trick I had been playing on the empty caches. When all was ready, I sent Anjit and the faithful ones whom I had fed privily through the village to call assembly. And the tribe gathered on a great space of beaten snow before my door, with the meat caches towering stilt-legged in the rear. Musu came also, standing on the inner edge of the circle opposite me, confident that I had some scheme afoot, and prepared at the first break to down me. But I arose, giving him salutation before all men. O oh, Musu, thou blessed of God, I began. Doubtless thou hast wondered in that I have called this convocation together, and doubtless because of many foolishnesses thou art prepared for rash sayings and rash doings. Not so. It has been said that those the gods would destroy they first make mad and I have been indeed mad. I have crossed thy will, and scoffed at thy authority, and done diverse evil and wanton things. Wherefore, last night, a vision was vouchsafed me, and I have seen the wickedness of my ways. And thou stoodst forth like a shining star, with brows of flame, and I knew in mine own heart thy greatness. I saw all things clearly. I knew that thou didst command the ear of God, and that when you spoke, he listened, and I remembered that whatever of the good deeds that I had done, I had done through the grace of God and the grace of Musu. Yes, my children, I cried, turning to the people, whatever right I have done, and whatever good I have done, have been because of the counsel of Musu. When I listened to him, affairs prospered. When I closed my ears and acted according to my folly, 
things came to folly. By his advice it was that I laid my store of meat, and in time of darkness fed the famishing. By his grace it was I was made chief, and what have I done with my chiefship? Let me tell you, I have done nothing. My head was turned with power, and I deemed myself greater than Musu, and behold, I have come to grief. My rule has been unwise, and the gods are angered. Lo, ye are pinched with famine, and the mothers are dry-breasted, and the little babies cry through the long nights. Nor do I, who have hardened my heart against Musu, know what shall be done, nor in what manner of way grub shall be had. At this there was nodding and laughing, and the people put their heads together, and I knew they whispered of the loaves and fishes. I went on hastily. So I was made aware of my foolishness, and of Musu's wisdom, of my unfitness, and of Musu's fitness, and because of this, being no longer mad, I make acknowledgment and rectify evil. I did cast unrighteous eyes upon Kluktu, and lo, she was sealed to Musu. Yet is she mine, for did I not pay to Tumasuk the goods of purchase? But I am well unworthy of her, and she shall go from the igloo of her father to the igloo of Musu. Can the moon shine in the sunshine? And further, Tumasuk shall keep the goods of purchase, and she be a free gift to Musu, whom God hath ordained her rightful lord. And further yet, because I have used my wealth unwisely, and to oppress ye, O my children, do I make gifts of the kerosene can to Musu, and the gooseneck, and the gun barrel, and the copper kettle. Therefore I can gather to me no more possessions, and when ye are athirst for hooch, he will quench ye, and without robbery, for he is a great man, and God speaketh through his lips. And yet further my heart is softened, and I have repented me of my madness, I who am a fool and a son of fools, I who am a slave of the bad god busy Nass, I who see thy empty bellies and know not wherewith to fill them. Why shall I be chief and sit above thee and rule to thine own destruction? Why should I do this which is not good? But Musu, who is shaman and who is wise above men, is so made that he can rule with a soft hand and justly. And because of the things I have related do I make abdication and give my chiefship to Musu, who alone knoweth how he may be fed in this day when there be no meat in the land. At this there was a great clapping of hands, and the people cried, Klosha, Klosha, which means good. I had seen the wonder worry in Mushu's eyes, for he could not understand, and was fearful of my white man's wisdom. I had met his wishes all along the line, and even anticipated some, and standing there, Self-shorn of all my power, he knew the time did not favor to stir the people against me. Before they could disperse, I made announcement that while the still went to Musu, whatever hooch I possessed went to the people. Musu tried to protest at this, for never had we permitted more than a handful to be drunk at a time. But they cried, Klasha, Klasha, and made festival before my door and while they waxed up roarious without, as the liquor went to their heads, I held counsel within with Angit and the faithful ones. I set them the tasks they were to do, and put into their mouths the words they were to say. Then I slipped away to a place back in the woods where I had two sleds, well loaded, with teams of dogs that were not overfed. Spring was at hand, you see, and there was a crust to the snow, so it was the best time to take the way south. Moreover, the tobacco was gone. There I waited, for I had nothing to fear. Did they bestir themselves on my trail, their dogs were too fat, and themselves too lean to overtake me. Also, I deemed their bestirring would be of an order for which I had made due preparation. 
First came a faithful one, running, and after him another. "'O oh, master!' the first cried, breathless. "'There be great confusion in the village, and no man knoweth his own mind. And they be of many minds. Everybody hath drunken over much, and some be stringing bows, and some be quarrelling one with another. Never was there such trouble.' And the second one, and I did as thou biddest, O master, whispering shrewd words in thirsty ears, and raising memories of the things that were of old time. The woman Ipsacook waileth her poverty and the wealth that no longer is hers, and Tumasuk thinketh himself once again chief, and the people are hungry and rage up and down. And a third one. And Newick hath overthrown the altars of Musu, and maketh incantation before the time honoured and ancient gods, and all the people remember the wealth that ran down their throats, and which they possess no more. And first Isanitic, who be sick dumtum, fought with Kluktu, and there was much noise, and next, being daughters of the one mother, did they fight with Tukaliketa, and after that did they three fall upon Musu, like wind squalls from every hand, till he ran forth from the igloo, and the people mocked him, for a man who cannot command his womankind is a fool. Then came Anjit. Great trouble hath befallen Musu, O master, for I have whispered to advantage, till the people came to Musu, saying they were hungry and demanding the fulfillment of prophecy, and there was a loud shout of, "'Idle willy, idle willy, meet!' So he cried peace to his womenfolk, who were overwrought with anger and with hooch, and led the tribe even to thy meat caches, and then he bade the men open them and be fed, and lo, the caches were empty, there was no meat, they stood without sound, the people being frightened, and in the silence I lifted my voice. O oh, Musu, where is the meat? That there was meat we know. Did we not hunt it and drag it in from the hunt? And it were a lie to say one man hath eaten it? Yet have we seen nor hide nor hair. Where is the meat, O oh, Musu? Thou hast the ear of God. Where is the meat? And the people cried, Thou hast the ear of God. Where is the meat? and they put their heads together and were afraid. Then I went among them, speaking fearsomely of the unknown things, of the dead that come and go like shadows and do evil deeds, till they cried aloud in terror and gathered all together like little children afraid of the dark. Niwak made harangue, laying this evil that had come upon them at the door of Musu. When he had done, there was a furious commotion, and they took spears in their hands, and tusks of walrus, and clubs, and stones from the beach. But Musu ran away home, and because he had not drunken of hooch, they could not catch him, and fell one over another, and made haste slowly. But even now they do howl without his igloo, and his women-folk within, and what of the noise he cannot make himself heard. O oh, Angie, thou hast done well, I commanded. Go now, taking this empty sled and the lean dogs, and ride fast to the igloo of Musu, and before the people who are drunken are aware, throw him quick upon the sled and bring him to me. I waited and gave good advice to the faithful ones till Anjit returned. Musu was on the sled, and I saw by the finger marks on his face that his womenkind had done well by him. But he tumbled off and fell in the snow at my feet, crying, O oh, master, thou wilt forgive Musu thy servant for the wrong things he has done? Thou art a great man. Surely wilt thou forgive? Call me brother, Musu, call me brother. I chided, lifting him to his feet with the toe of my moccasin. Wilt thou evermore obey? Yea, master, he whimpered, evermore. Then dispose thy body so across the sled. I shifted the dog-whip to my right hand, and direct thy face downwards toward the snow, and make haste for we journey south this day. 
and when he was well fixed I laid the lash upon him, reciting at every stroke the wrongs he had done me. This for thy disobedience in general, whack! And this for thy disobedience in particular, whack, whack! And this for Isanituk, and this for thy soul's welfare, and this for the grace of thy authority, and this for Kluktu, and this for thy rights God-given, and this for thy fat firstlings, and this and this for thy income tax, and thy loaves and fishes, and this for all thy disobedience, and this, finally, that thou mayst henceforth walk softly and with understanding. Now cease thy sniffling, and get up. Gird on thy snowshoes, and go to the fore, and break trail for the dogs. Chook! Mush on! Git! Thomas Stevens smiled quietly to himself as he lighted his fifth cigar and sent curling smoke rings ceilingward. But how about the people of Tatarat? I asked. Kind of rough, wasn't it, to leave them flat with famine? And he answered, laughing, between two smoke rings, were there not the fat dogs? End of A Hyperborean Brew Section 2 of The Faith of Men by Jack London This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of the faith of men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Men by Jack London. Tell you what we'll do. We'll shake for it. That suits me said the second man, turning as he spoke to the Indian that was mending shoes in a corner of the cabin. Here you, Billy Bedham. Take a run down to Olson's cabin like a good fellow, and tell him we want to borrow his dice box. This sudden request in the midst of a council on wages of men, wood, and grub surprised Billy Bedham. Besides, it was early in the day, and he had never known white men of the caliber of Pentfield and Hutchinson to dice and play till the day's work was done. But his face was impassive, as a Yukon Indian should be, as he pulled on his mittens and went out the door. Though eight o'clock, it was still dark outside, and the cabin was lighted by a tallow candle thrust into an empty whiskey bottle. It stood on the pine board table, in the middle of a disarray of dirty tin dishes. Tallow from innumerable candles had dripped on the long neck of the bottle and hardened into a miniature glacier. The small room, which composed the entire cabin, was as badly littered as the table, while at one end, against the wall, were two bunks, one above the other, with the blankets turned down just as the two men had crawled out in the morning. Lawrence Pentfield and Corey Hutchinson were millionaires, though they did not look it. There seemed nothing unusual about them. While they would have passed muster as fair specimens of lumbermen in any Michigan camp, but outside, in the darkness, were holes yawned in the ground, where many men engaged in windlassing muck and gravel and gold from the bottoms of the holes, where other men received fifteen dollars per day for scraping it off the bedrock. Each day thousands of dollars worth of gold were scraped from bedrock and windless to the surface, and it all belonged to Pentfield and Hutchinson, who took their rank among the richest kings of Bonanza. Penfield broke the silence that followed on Billy Beatum's departure by heaping the dirty plates higher on the table and drumming a tattoo on the cleared space with his knuckles. Hutchinson snuffed the smoky candle and reflectively rubbed the soot from the wick between thumb and forefinger. "'By Jove, I wish we could both go out,' he abruptly exclaimed. "'That would settle it all.' 
Penfield looked at him darkly. If it weren't for your cursed obstinacy, I'd be settled anyway. All you have to do is get up and go. I'll look after things, and next year I can go out. Why should I go? I've no one waiting for me. Your people, Penfield broke in roughly. Like you have, Hutchinson went on. A girl, I mean, and you know it. Penfield shrugged his shoulders gloomily. She can wait, I guess. But she's been waiting two years now, and another won't age her beyond recognition. That'd be three years, think of it, old man, three years in this end of the earth, this falling-off place for the damned. Hutchinson threw up his arms in an almost articulate groan. He was several years younger than his partner, not more than twenty-six, and there was a certain wistfulness in his face that comes into the faces of men when they yearn vainly for the things they have been long denied. This same wistfulness was in Penfield's face, and the groan of it was articulate in the heave of his shoulders. I dreamed last night I was in Zinkins, he said. The music playing, glasses clinking, voices humming, women laughing. I was ordering eggs. Yes, sir, eggs, fried and boiled and poached and scrambled, and in all sorts of ways, and downing them as fast as they arrived. I'd have ordered salads and green things, Hutchinson criticized hungrily, with a big rare porterhouse and young onions, radishes, the kind your teeth sink into with a crunch. I'd have followed the eggs with them, I guess, if I hadn't awakened, Pentfield replied. He picked up a trail-scarred banjo from the floor and began to strum a few wandering notes. Hutchinson winced and breathed heavily. Quit it, he burst out with sudden fury, as the other struck into a gaily lifting swing. It drives me mad. I can't stand it. Pentfield tossed the banjo into a bunk and quoted, Hear me babble, what the weakest won't confess. I am memory and torment. I am town. I am all that ever went with evening dress. The other man winced where he sat and dropped his head forward on the table. Pentfield resumed the monotonous drumming with his knuckles. A loud snap from the door attracted his attention. The frost was creeping up the inside in a white sheet, and he began to hum. The flocks are folded, boughs are bare, the salmon takes the sea, and oh, my fair, would I somewhere might house my heart with thee. Silence fell, and was not again broken till Billy Beatum arrived and threw the dice on the table. Um, cold, he said. Olson, um, speak to me, um, say, um, Yukon freeze last night. Hear that, old man, Penfield cried, slapping Hutchinson on the shoulder. Whoever wins can be hitting the trail for God's country this time tomorrow morning. He picked up the box, briskly rattling the dice. What'll it be? Straight poker dice, Hutchinson answered. Go on, roll them out. Pentfield swept the dishes from the table with a crash and rolled out the five dice. Both looked tragedy. The shake was without a pair, a five-spot high. A stiff, Pentfield cried. After much deliberating, Pentfield picked up all the five dice and put them in the box. I'd shake to the five if I were you, Hutchinson suggested. No, you wouldn't. Not when you see this, Pentfield replied, shaking out the dice. Again, they were without a pair, running this time in unbroken sequence from two to six. A second stiff, he groaned. No use your shaking, Corey. You can't lose. The other man gathered up the dice without a word, rattled them, rolled them out on the table with a flourish, and saw that he had likewise shaken a six-high stiff. Tied you anyway, but I'll have to do better than that, he said, gathering in four of them and shaking to the six. And here's what beats you. 
but they rolled out deuce, tray, four and five, a stiff still, no better, no worse than Penfield's throat. Hutchinson sighed. Couldn't happen once in a million times, he said. Nor in a million lives, Penfield added, catching up the dice and quickly throwing them out. Three fives appeared, and after much delay, he was rewarded by a fourth five on the second shake. Hutchinson seemed to have lost his last hope. But three sixes turned up on his first shake. A great doubt rose in the other's eyes, and hope returned to his. He had one more shake, another six, and he would go over the ice to salt water and the states. He rattled the dice in the box, made as though to cast them, hesitated, and continued to rattle them. Go on, go on, don't take all night about it, Penfield cried sharply, bending his nails on the table. So tight was the clutch with which he strove to control himself. The dice rolled forth, and upturned six, meeting their eyes. Both men sat staring at it. There was a long silence. Hutchinson shot a covert glance at his partner, who still more covertly caught it and pursed up his lip in an attempt to advertise his unconcern. Hutchinson laughed as he got on his feet. It was a nervous, apprehensive laugh. It was a case where it was more awkward to win than lose. He walked over to his partner, who whirled upon him fiercely. Now just shut up, Corey. I know all you're going to say, that you'd rather stay in and let me go, and all that, so don't say it. You've your own people in Detroit to see, and that's enough. Besides, you can do for me the very thing I expected to do if I went out. And that is? Penfield read the full question in his partner's eyes and answered. Yes, the very thing. You can bring her to me. The only difference will be a Dawson wedding instead of a San Francisco one. But man alike, Corey Hutchinson objected, how under the sun can I bring her in? We're not exactly brother and sister, seeing that I have not even met her, and it wouldn't be just the proper thing, you know, for us to travel together. Of course, it would be all right, you and I know that, but think of the looks of it, man. Pentfield swore under his breath, consigning the looks of it to a less frigid region than Alaska. Now, if you'll just listen and not get astride that high horse of yours so blamed quick, his partner went on, you'll see that the only fair thing under the circumstances is for me to let you go out this year. Next year is only a year away, and then I can take my fling. Penfield shook his head, though visibly swayed by the temptation. It wouldn't do, Corey, old man. I appreciate your kindness and all that, but it won't do. I'd be ashamed every time I thought of you slaving away, in here, in my place. A thought seemed suddenly to strike him, burrowing into his bunk and disrupting it in his eagerness. He secured a writing pad and pencil and sitting down at the table, began to write with swiftness and certitude. Here, he said, thrusting the scrawled letter into his partner's hand, you just deliver that, and everything will be all right. Hutchinson ran his eye over it, and laid it down. How do you know the brother will be willing to make that beastly trip in here? he demanded. Oh, he'll do it for me, and for his sister. Penfield replied. You'll see. He's a tenderfoot, and I wouldn't trust her with him alone. But with you along, it will be an easy trip, and a safe one. As soon as you get out, you'll go to her and prepare her. Then you can take your run east to your own people, and in the spring, she and her brother will be ready to start with you. You'll like her, I know, right from the jump. And from that, You'll know her as soon as you lay eyes on her. So saying, he opened the back of his watch and exposed a girl's photograph 
pasted on the inside of the case. Corey Hutchinson gazed at it with admiration welling up in his eyes. Mabel is her name, Penfield went on, and it's just as well you should know how to find the house. Soon as you strike Frisco, take a cab and just say, Holmes Place, Murden Avenue. I doubt if the Murden Avenue is necessary. The cabby'll know where Judge Holmes lives. And say, Penfield continued after a pause, it won't be a bad idea for you to get me a few little things which uh, er, a married man should have in his business, Hutchinson blurted out with a grin. Penfield grinned back. Sure, napkins and tablecloths and sheets and pillow slips and such things. And you might get a good set of china. You know, it'll come hard for her to settle down in this sort of thing. You can freight them in by steamer, around by Bering Sea. And, I say, what's the matter with a piano? Hutchinson seconded the idea heartily. His reluctance had vanished, and he was warming up to the mission. By Jove, Lawrence, he said at the conclusion of the council, as they both rose to their feet, I'll bring back that girl of yours in style. I'll do the cooking and take care of the dogs, and all that brother'll have to do will be to see her comfort and do for her whatever I've forgotten, and I'll forget damn little, I can tell you that. The next day Lawrence Penfield shook hands with him for the last time and watched him running with his dogs disappear up the frozen Yukon on his way to salt water and the world. Penfield went back to his bonanza mine, which was many times more dreary than before, and faced resolutely into the long winter. There was work to be done, men to be superintended, and operations to direct in burrowing after the erratic pay strike. But his heart was not in the work, nor was his heart in any work till the tiered logs of the new cabin began to rise on the hill behind the mine. It was a grand cabin, warmly built, and divided into three comfortable rooms. Each log was hand-hewn and squared, an expensive whim when the axeman received a daily wage of fifteen dollars. But to him nothing could be too costly for the home in which Mabel Holmes was to live. So he went about with the building of the cabin, singing, and ho, oh, my fair, would I somewhere might house my heart with thee. Also, he had a calendar pinned on the wall above the table, and his first act each morning was to check off the day and to count the days that were left ere his partner would come booming down the Yukon ice in the spring. Another whim of his was to permit no one to sleep in the cabin on the hill. It must be as fresh for her occupancy as the square-hued wood was fresh, and when it stood complete, he put a padlock on the door. No one entered, save himself, and he was wont to spend long hours there, and to come forth with his face strangely radiant, and in his eyes a glad warm light. In December he received a letter from Corey Hutchinson. He had just seen Mabel Holmes, she was all she ought to be to be Lawrence Penfield's wife, he wrote. He was enthusiastic, and his letter sent the blood tingling through Penfield's veins. Other letters followed, one on the heels of another, and sometimes two or three together when the mail lumped up, and they were all in the same tenor. Corey had just come from Murden Avenue, Corey was just going to Murden Avenue, or Corey was at Murden Avenue and he lingered on and on in San Francisco, nor even mentioned his trip to Detroit. Lawrence Pentfield began to think that his partner was a great deal in the company of Mabel Holmes, for a fellow who was going east to see his people. Even caught himself worrying about it at times, though he would have worried more had he not known Mabel and Corey so well. Mabel's letters, on the other hand, had a great deal to say about Corey. Also, a thread of timidity that was near to disinclination ran through them, concerning the trip in over the ice and the Dawson marriage. 
Penfield wrote back heartily, laughing at her fears, which he took to be the mere physical ones of danger and hardship, rather than those bred of maidenly reserve. But the long winter and tedious wait following upon the two previous long winters were telling upon him. The superintendence of the men and the pursuit of the pay streak could not break the irk of the daily round, and the end of January found him making occasional trips to Dawson where he could forget his identity for a space at the gambling tables. Because he could afford to lose, he won, and Penfield's luck became a stock phrase among the Fargo players. His luck ran with him till the second week in February. How much farther it might have run is conjectural, for after one big game he never played again. It was in the opera house that it occurred, and for an hour it had seemed that he could not place his money on a card without making the card a winner. In the lull at the end of a deal, while the gamekeeper was shuffling the deck, Nick Inwood, the owner of the game, remarked apropos of nothing. I say, Penfield, I see that partner of yours has been cutting up monkey shines on the outside. Trust Corey to have a good time, Penfield had answered, especially when he has earned it. Every man to his taste, Nick Inwood laughed but I should scarcely call getting married a good time. Corey? Married? Penfield cried incredulous and yet surprised out of himself for the moment. Sure, Inwood said. I saw it in the Frisco paper that came in over the ice this morning. Well, who's the girl? Penfield demanded, somewhat with the air of patient fortitude with which one takes the bait of a catch and is aware at the time of the large laugh bound to follow at his expense. Nick Inwood pulled the paper from his pocket and began looking it over, saying, I haven't a remarkable memory for names, but it seems to me it's something like Mabel, Mabel, oh yes, here it is, Mabel Holmes, daughter of Judge Holmes, whoever he is. Lawrence Pentfield never turned a hair though he wondered how any man in the North could know her name. He glanced coolly from face to face to note any vagrant signs of the game that was being played upon him. But beyond a healthy curiosity, the faces betrayed nothing. Then he turned to the gambler and said in cold, even tones, Inwood, I got an even five hundred here that says the print of what you have just said is not in that paper. The gambler looked at him in quizzical surprise. Go away, child. I don't want your money. I thought so, Penfield sneered, returning to the game and laying a couple of bets. Nick Inwood's face flushed, and as though doubting his senses, he ran careful eyes over the print of a quarter of a column. Then he turned on Lawrence Penfield. Look here, Penfield, he said in a quiet, nervous manner. I can't allow that, you know. Allow what? Penfield demanded brutally. You implied that I lied. Nothing of the sort, came the reply. I merely implied that you were trying to be clumsily witty. Make your bets, gentlemen, the dealer protested. But I tell you it's true, Nick Inwood insisted. And I have told you, I've five hundred that says it's not in that paper. Penfield answered at the same time, throwing a heavy sack of dust on the table. I'm sorry to take your money, was the retort, as Inwood thrust the newspaper into Penfield's hand. Penfield saw, though he could not quite bring himself to believe, glancing through the headline, young Lochinvar came out of the north, and skimming the article until the names of Mabel Holmes and Corey Hutchinson, coupled together, leaped squarely before his eyes and turned to the top of the page. It was a San Francisco paper. The money's yours, Inwood, he remarked with a short laugh. 
There's no telling what that partner of mine will do when he gets started. Then he returned to the article and read it, word for word, very slowly and very carefully. He could no longer doubt, beyond dispute, Corey Hutchinson had married Mabel Holmes. One of the Bonanza Kings, it described him, a partner with Lawrence Penfield, whom San Francisco society has not yet forgotten. And interested with that gentleman in other rich Klondike properties. Further, at the end, he read, It is whispered that Mr. and Mrs. Hutchinson will, after a brief trip east to Detroit, make their real honeymoon journey into the fascinating Klondike country. I'll be back again. Keep my place for me, Penfield said, rising to his feet and taking his sack, which meantime had hit the blower and came back lighter by five hundred dollars. He went down the street and bought a Seattle paper. It contained the same facts, though somewhat condensed. Corey and Mabel were indubitably married. Penfield returned to the opera house and resumed his seat in the game. He asked to have the limit removed. Trying to get action? Nick Inwood laughed as he nodded assent to the dealer. I was going down to the A.C. store, but now I guess I'll stay and watch you do your worst. This Lawrence Penfield did at the end of two hours plunging. When the dealer bit the end off a fresh cigar and struck a match as he announced that the bank was broken. Penfield cashed in for 40000 shook hands with Nick Inwood, and stated that it was the last time he would ever play at his game or anybody else's. No one knew nor guessed that he had been hit, much less hit hard. There was no apparent change in his manner. For a week he went about his work, much as he had always done, when he read an account of the marriage in a Portland paper. Then he called in a friend to take charge of his mind and departed upon the Yukon behind his dogs. He held to the saltwater trail till White River was reached, into which he turned. Five days later he came upon a hunting camp of the White River Indians. In the evening there was a feast, and he sat in honor beside the chief, and next morning he headed his dogs back toward the Yukon. But he no longer traveled alone. A young squaw fed his dogs for him that night and helped to pitch camp. She had been mauled by a bear in her childhood and suffered from a slight limp. Her name was Lashka, and she was diffident at first with the strange white man that had come out of the unknown, married her with scarcely a look or word, and now was carrying her back with him into the unknown. But Lashka's was better fortune than falls to most Indian girls that mate with white men in the Northland. No sooner was Dawson reached than the barbaric marriage that had joined them was re-solemnized in the white man's fashion before a priest. From Dawson, which to her was all a marvel and a dream, she was taken directly to the Bonanza claim and installed in the square-hued cabin on the hill. The nine days' wonder that followed arose not so much out of the fact of the squaw whom Lawrence Penfield had taken to bed and board as out of the ceremony that had legalized the tie. The properly sanctioned marriage was the one thing that passed the community's comprehension, but no one bothered Penfield about it. So long as a man's vagarities did no special hurt to the community, the community let the man alone, nor was Penfield barred from the cabins of men who possessed white wives. The marriage ceremony removed him from the status of squaw man and placed him beyond moral reproach, though there were men that challenged his taste where women were concerned. No more letters arrived from the outside. Six sled loads of males had been lost at the Big Salmon. 
Besides, Penfield knew that Corey and his bride must by that time have started out over the trail. They were even then on their honeymoon trip, the honeymoon trip he had dreamed of for himself through two dreary years. His lip curled with bitterness at the thought, but beyond being kinder to Lashka, he gave no sign. March had passed, and April was nearing its end, when one spring morning Lashka asked permission to go down to the creek, several miles to Sishwash Pete's cabin. Pete's wife, a steward river woman, had sent up word that something was wrong with her baby, and Lashka, who was preeminently a mother woman, and who held herself to be truly wise in the matter of infantile troubles, missed no opportunity of nursing the children of other women as yet more fortunate than she. Penfield harnessed his dogs, and with Lashka behind, took the trail down the creek bed of Bonanza. Spring was in the air. The sharpness had gone out of the bite of the frost, and though snow still covered the land, the murmur and trickling of water told that the iron grip of winter was relaxing. The bottom was dropping out of the trail, and here and there a new trail had been broken around open holes. At such a place, where there was no room for two sleds to pass, Penfield heard the jingle of approaching bells and stopped his dogs. A team of tired-looking dogs appeared around the narrow bend, followed by a heavily loaded sled. At the gee pole was a man who steered in a manner familiar to Penfield, and behind the sled walked two women. His glance returned to the man at the gee pole. It was Corey. Penfield got on his feet and waited. He was glad that Lashka was with him. The meeting could not have come out better had he planned it, he thought. And as he waited, he wondered what they would say, what they would be able to say. As for himself, there was no need to say anything. The explaining was all on their side, and he was ready to listen to them. As they drew in abreast, Corey recognized him and halted the dogs. With a hello, old man, he held out his hand. Penfield shook it, but without warmth or speech. By this time, the two women had come up, and he noticed the second one was Dora Holmes. He doffed his fur cap, the flaps of which were flying, shook hands with her, and turned toward Mabel. She swayed forward, splendid and radiant, but faltered before his outstretched hand. He had intended to say, How do you do, Mrs. Hutchinson? But somehow... The Mrs. Hutchinson had choked him, and all he managed to articulate was, How do you do? There was all the constraint and awkwardness in the situation he could have wished. Mabel betrayed the agitation appropriate to her position, while Dora, evidently brought along as some sort of peacemaker, was saying, Why, what is the matter, Lawrence? Before he could answer, Corey plucked him by the sleeve and drew him aside. "'See here, old man, what's this mean?' Corey demanded in a low tone, indicating Lashka with his eyes. "'I can hardly see, Corey, where you can have any concern in the matter,' Penfield answered mockingly. But Corey drove straight to the point. "'What is that squad doing on your sled? "'A nasty job you've given me to explain all this away.' I only hope it can be explained away. Who is she? Whose squaw is she? Then Lawrence Penfield delivered his stroke, and he delivered it with a certain calm elation of spirit that seemed somewhat to compensate for the wrong that had been done him. She is my squaw, he said. Mrs. Penfield, if you please. Corey Hutchinson gasped, and Penfield left him and returned to the two women. Mabel, with a worried expression on her face, seemed holding herself aloof. He turned to Dora and asked quite genially, as though all the world was sunshine, How did you stand the trip, anyway? 
Have any trouble to sleep warm? And how did Mrs. Hutchinson stand it? He asked next, his eyes on Mabel. Oh, you dear ninny, Dora cried, throwing her arms around him and hugging him. Then you saw it, too. I thought something was the matter. You were acting so strangely. I, I hardly understand, he stammered. It was corrected in the next day's paper, Dora chattered on. We did not dream you would see it. All the other papers had it correctly, and of course the one miserable paper was the very one you saw. Wait a moment. What do you mean? Penfield demanded, a sudden fear at his heart, for he felt himself on the verge of a great gulf. But Dora swept volubly on. Why? When it became known that Mabel and I were going to Klondike every other week, said that when we were gone, it would be lovely on Murden Avenue, meaning, of course, lonely. Then... I am Mrs. Hutchinson, Dora answered, and you thought it was Mabel all the time. Precisely the way of it, Penfield replied slowly, but I can see now the reporter got the names mixed. The Seattle and Portland paper copied. He stood silently for a minute. Mabel's face was turned toward him again, and he could see the glow of expectancy in it. Corey was deeply interested in the ragged toe of one of his moccasins, while Dora was stealing sidelong glances at the immobile face of Lashka sitting on the sled. Lawrence Pentfield stared straight out before him, into a dreary future, through the gray vistas of which he saw himself riding on a sled behind running dogs with lame Lashka by his side. Then he spoke, quite simply, looking Mabel in the eyes. I am very sorry. I did not dream of it. I thought you had married Corey. That is Mrs. Pentfield sitting on the sled over there. Mabel Holmes turned weakly toward her sister, as though all the fatigue of her great journey had suddenly descended on her. Dora caught her around the waist. Corey Hutchinson was still occupied with his moccasins. Penfield glanced quickly from face to face, then turned to his sled. "'Can't stop here all day, with Pete's baby waiting,' he said to Lashka. The long whiplash hissed out. The dogs sprang against the breast bands, and the sled lurched and jerked ahead. "'Oh, I say, Corey,' Penfield called back. "'You'd better occupy the old cabin. It's not been used for some time. I've built a new one on the hill.'" End of The Faith of Men by Jack London Recording by Robert Scott June the 26th 2007section 4 of the faith of men this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brian ackerman too much gold by jack london this being a story and a truer one than it may appear of a mining country it is quite to be expected that it will be a hard luck story but that depends on the point of view hard luck is a mild way of terming it so far as king mitchell and hoochinoo bill are concerned and that they have a decided opinion in the subject is a matter of common knowledge in the yukon country it was in the fall of 1896 that the two partners came down to the east bank of the Yukon and drew a Peterborough canoe from a moss-covered cache. They were not particularly pleasant-looking objects. A summer's prospecting, filled to repletion with hardship and rather empty of grub, had left their clothes in tatters and themselves worn and cadaverous. A nimbus of mosquitoes buzzed about each man's head. Their faces were coated with blue clay. Each carried a lump of this damp clay, and whenever it dried and fell from their faces, more was daubed on in its place. There was a querulous plaint in their voices, an irritability of movement and gesture that told of broken sleep and a losing struggle with the little winged pests. 
Them skeeters will be the death of me yet, Kink Mitchell whimpered, as the canoe felt the current on her nose and leapt out from the bank. Cheer up, cheer up, we're about done, Hoochinoo Bill answered, with an attempted heartiness in his funereal tones that was ghastly. We'll be in forty mile in forty minutes, and then, cursed little devil, one hand left his paddle and landed on the back of his neck with a sharp slap. He put a fresh daub of clay on the injured part, swearing sulfurously the while. Kink Mitchell was not the least amused. He merely improved the opportunity by putting a thicker coating of clay on his own neck. They crossed the Yukon to its west bank, shot downstream with easy stroke, and at the end of forty minutes swung in close to the left around the tail of an island. Forty miles spread itself suddenly before them. Both men straightened their backs and gazed at the sight. They gazed long and carefully, drifting with the current, in their faces an expression of mingled surprise and consternation slowly gathering. Not a thread of smoke was rising from the hundreds of log cabins. There was no sound of axes biting sharply into wood, of hammering and sawing. Neither dogs nor men loitered before the big wood store. No steamboats lay at the bank, no canoes, nor scows, nor poling boats. The river was as bare of craft as the town was of life. "'Kind of looks like Gabriel's tooted his little horn, and you and me has turned up missin,' remarked Hoochinoo Bill. His remark was casual, as though there was nothing unusual about the occurrence. Kink Mitchell's reply was just as casual, as though he, too, were unaware of any strange perturbation of spirit. "'Looks as though they were all Baptists, then, and took the boats to go by water,' was his conclusion." My old dad was a Baptist, Hoochinoo Bill supplemented, and he always did hold it was forty thousand miles nearer that way. This was the end of their levity. They ran the canoe in and climbed the high earth bank. A feeling of awe descended upon them as they walked the deserted streets. The sunlight streamed placidly over the town. A gentle wind tapped the halyards against the flagpole before the closed doors of the Caledonia Dance Hall. Mosquitoes buzzed, robins sang, and the moose birds tripped hungrily among the cabins. But there was no human life, nor sign of human life. "'I'm just dying for a drink,' Hoochinoo Bill said, and unconsciously his voice sank to a hoarse whisper. His partner nodded his head, loath to hear his own voice break the stillness. They trudged on in uneasy silence till surprised by an open door. Above this door, and stretching the width of the building, a rude sign announced the same as the Monte Carlo. But beside the door, hat over eyes, chair tilted back, a man sat sunning himself. He was an old man. Beard and hair were long and white and patriarchal. "'If it ain't old Jim Cummins turned up like us, too late for resurrection,' said Kink Mitchell. "'Most like he didn't hear Gabriel Tootin,' was Hoochinoo Bill's suggestion. "'Hello, Jim! Wake up!' he shouted. The old man unlimbered lamely, blinking his eyes and murmuring automatically, "'What do you have, gents?' What do you have? They followed him inside, and ranged up against the long bar where of yore half a dozen nimble barkeepers found little time to loaf. The great room, ordinarily a roar with life, was still and gloomy as a tomb. There was no rattling of chips, no whirring of ivory balls. Roulette and faro tables were like gravestones under their canvas covers. No women's voices drifted merrily from the dance room behind. Old Jim Cummings wiped a glass with palsied hands, and Kink Mitchell scrawled his initials on the dust-covered bar. "'Where's the girls?' Hoochinoo Bill shouted, with affected geniality. "'Gone,' was the ancient barkeeper's reply, in a voice thin and aged as himself, and as unsteady as his hand. "'Where's Bidwell? And Barlow? Gone. And Sweetwater Charlie? Gone. And his sister, too? Gone, too. Your daughter Sally, then, and her little kid? Gone. All gone.' The old man shook his head sadly, rummaging in an absent way among the dusty bottles. "'Great Sardanopolis! Where?' Kink Mitchell exploded, unable longer to restrain himself. "'You don't say you've had the plague?' "'Why, ain't you heard?' The old man chuckled quietly. "'They all's gone to Dawson.' "'What like is that?' Bill demanded. "'A creek? Or a bar? Or a place?' "'Ain't never heard of Dawson, eh?' The old man chuckled exasperatingly. "'Why, Dawson's a town, a city, bigger than forty mile. Yes, sir, bigger than forty mile. "'I've been in this land seven year,' Bill announced emphatically, "'and I make free to say I never heard tell of that burg before. "'Hold on, let's have some more of that whiskey. "'Your information's flabbergasted me, that it has. "'Now just whereabouts is this Dawson place you was a-mentionin'?' 
"'On the big flat just below the mouth of the Klondike,' old Jim answered. "'But where has you all been this summer?' "'Never mind where we all's been,' was Kink Mitchell's testy reply. "'We all's been where the Skeeters is that thick you got to throw a stick into the air so as to see the sun and tell the time of day. Ain't I right, Bill?' "'Right you are,' said Bill. "'But speaking of this Dawson place, how like did it happen to be, Jim?' "'Ounce to the pan on a creek called Bonanza, and they ain't got to bedrock yet. "'Who struck it?' "'Carmack.' "'At mention of the discoverer's name, the partners stared at each other disgustedly.' Then they winked with great solemnity. Siwash George sniffed Hoochinoo Bill. That squaw man sneered Kink Mitchell. I wouldn't put on my moccasins to stampede after anything he'd ever find, said Bill. Same here, announced his partner. A cuss that's too plumb lazy to fish his own salmon. That's why he took up with the Indians. Suppose that black brother-in-law of his, uh, let me see, Skookum Jim, eh? Suppose he's in on it. The old barkeeper nodded. Sure. And what's more, all forty mile, except in me and a few cripples. And drunks, added Kink Mitchell. No siree, the old man shouted emphatically. I bet you the drinks Honkins ain't in on it, Hoochinoo Bill cried with certitude. Old Jim's face lighted up. I takes you, Bill, and you loses. However did that old soak budge out of forty mile, Mitchell demanded. The ties him down and throws him the bottom of a polling boat, old Jim explained. Come right in here, they did, and takes him out of that there chair there in the corner, and three more drunks they find under the piano. I tell you alls, the whole camp hits the Yukon for Dawson just like Sam Scratch was after them. Women, children, babes in arms, the whole shebang. Bidwell comes to me and says, says he, Jim, I wants you to keep tab on the Monte Carlo. I'm going. Where's Barlow? says I. Gone, says he, and I'm a-fallin' with a load of whiskey. And with that, never waiting for me to decline, he makes a run for his boat, and away he goes, pulling up river like mad. So here I be, and these is the first drinks I've passed out in three days. The partners looked at each other. Gosh darn my buttons, said Hoochinoo Bill. Seems like you and me, Kink, is the kind of folks always caught out with forks when it rains soup. Wouldn't it take the saleratus out of your dough now, said Kink, a stampede of tin horns, drunks and loafers. And squaw men, added Bill, not a genuine miner in the whole caboodle. Genuine miners, like you and me, Kink, he went on academically, is all out and sweatin' hard over Birch Creekway. Not a genuine miner in this whole crazy Dawson outfit, and I say right here, not a step do I budge for any Carmack strike. I've got to see the color of the dust first. Same here, Mitchell agreed. Let's have another drink. Having wet this resolution, they beached the canoe, transferred its contents to the cabin, and cooked dinner. But as the afternoon wore along, they grew restive. They were men used to the silence of the great wilderness, but this grave-like silence of a town worried them. They caught themselves listening for familiar sounds, waiting for something to make a noise which ain't going to make a noise, as Bill put it. They strolled through the deserted streets to the Monte Carlo for more drinks, and wandered along the river bank to the steamer landing, where only water gurgled as the eddy filled and emptied, and an occasional salmon leapt flashing into the sun. They sat down in the shade in front of the store and talked with the consumptive storekeeper, whose liability to hemorrhage accounted for his presence. Bill and Kink told him how they intended loafing in their cabin and resting up after the hard summer's work. They told him, with a certain insistence that was half appeal for belief, half challenge for contradiction, how much they were going to enjoy their idleness, but the storekeeper was uninterested. He switched the conversation back to the strike on Klondike, and they could not keep him away from it. He could think of nothing else, talk of nothing else, till Hoochinoo Bill rose up in anger and disgust. "'Gosh darn Dawson, I say. Same here,' said Kink Mitchell, with brightening face. "'One'd think something was doing up there, instead of being a mere stampede of greenhorns and tinhorns.' But a boat came into view from downstream. It was long and slim. It hugged the bank closely, and its three occupants, standing upright, propelled it against the stiff current by means of long poles. "'Circle City outfit,' said the storekeeper. "'I was looking for him along by afternoon.' Forty Mile had the start of them by a hundred and seventy miles. But, gee, they ain't losin' any time. We'll just sit here quiet-like and watch em string by, Bill said complacently. As he spoke, another boat appeared in sight, followed after a brief interval by two others. By this time, the first boat was abreast of the men on the bank. 
Its occupants did not cease polling while greetings were exchanged, and, though its progress was slow, a half hour saw it out of sight up the river. Still they came from below, boat after boat, in endless procession. The uneasiness of Bill and Kink increased. They stole speculative, tentative glances at each other, and when their eyes met, looked away in embarrassment. Finally, however, their eyes met, and neither looked away. Kink opened his mouth to speak, but words failed him, and his mouth remained open while he continued to gaze at his partner. "'Just what I was thinking, Kink,' said Bill. They grinned sheepishly at each other, and by tacit consent started to walk away. Their pace quickened, and by the time they arrived at their cabin they were on the run. "'Can't lose no time with all that multitude a rushing by,' Kink spluttered, as he jabbed the sourdough can into the bean pot with one hand, and with the other gathered in the frying pan and coffee pot." "'Should say not,' gasped Bill, his head and shoulders buried in a clothes sack, wherein were stored winter socks and underwear. "'I say, Kink, don't forget the salad terrace on the corner shelf back of the stove.' Half an hour later they were launching the canoe and loading up, while the storekeeper made jocular remarks about poor weak mortals and the contagiousness of stampedin' fever. But when Bill and Kink thrust their long poles to the bottom and started the canoe against the current, he called after them, well, so long, and good luck, and don't forget to blaze a steak or two for me. They nodded their heads vigorously, and felt sorry for the poor wretch who remained perforce behind. Kink and Bill were sweating hard. According to the revised Northland scripture, the stampede is to the swift, the blazing of steaks to the strong, and the crown and royalties gathers to itself the fullness thereof. Kink and Bill were both swift and strong. They took the soggy trail at a long, swinging gait that broke the hearts of a couple of tenderfeet who tried to keep up with them. Behind, strung out between them and Dawson, where the boats were discarded and land travel began, was the vanguard of the Circle City outfit. In the race from Forty Mile, the partners had passed every boat, winning from the leading boat by a length in the Dawson eddy, and leaving its occupant sadly behind the moment their feet struck the trail. Huh! Couldn't see us for smoke, Hoochinoo Bill chuckled flirting the stinging sweat from his brow and glancing swiftly back along the way they had come, three men emerged from where the trail broke through the trees. Two followed close at their heels, and then a man and woman shot into view. "'Come on, you kink! Hit her up! Hit her up!' Bill quickened his pace. Mitchell glanced back in more leisurely fashion. "'I declare if they ain't lopin'. And here's one that's loped himself out,' said Bill, pointing to the side of the trail." A man was lying on his back, panting, in the culminating stages of violent exhaustion. His face was ghastly, his eyes bloodshot and glazed, for all the world like a dying man. Chichaquo, Kink Mitchell grunted, and it was the grunt of the old sourdough for the greenhorn, for the man who outfitted with self-risen flour and used baking powder in his biscuits. The partners, true to the old-timer custom, had intended to stake downstream from the strike, but when they saw claim 81 below blazed on a tree, which meant fully eight miles below Discovery, they changed their minds. The eight miles were covered in less than two hours. It was a killing pace over so rough trail, and they passed scores of exhausted men that had fallen by the wayside. At Discovery, little was to be learned of the upper creek. Cormac's Indian brother-in-law, Skookum Jim, had a hazy notion that the creek was staked as high as the thirties, but when Kink and Bill looked at the corner stakes of seventy-nine above, they threw their stampeding packs off their backs and sat down to smoke. All their efforts had been in vain. Bonanza was staked from mouth to source. Out of sight and across the next divide, Bill complained that night as they fried their bacon and boiled their coffee over Cormac's fire at Discovery. Try that pup, Carmack suggested next morning. That pup was a broad creek that flowed into Bonanza at seven above. The partners received his advice with the magnificent contempt of the sourdough for a squaw man, and, instead, spent a day on Adams Creek, another and more likely-looking tributary of Bonanza. But it was the old story over again, staked to the skyline. For three days Carmack repeated his advice, and for three days they received it contemptuously. But on the fourth day, there being nowhere else to go, they went up with that pup. They knew that it was practically unstaked, but they had no intention of staking. The trip was made more for the purpose of giving vent to their ill humor than for anything else. They had become quite cynical, skeptical. They jeered and scoffed at everything, and insulted every chachaquo they met along the way. At number twenty-three, the stakes ceased. The remainder of the creek was open for location. 
Moose pasture, sneered Kink Mitchell. But Bill gravely paced off five hundred feet up the creek and blazed the corner stakes. He had picked up the bottom of a candle box, and on the smooth side he wrote the notice for his center stake. This moose pasture is reserved for the Swedes and Chichaquos. Bill Raider. Kink read it over with approval, saying, as them's my sentiments, I reckon I might as well subscribe. So the name of Charles Mitchell was added to the notice, and many an old sourdough's face relaxed that day at the sight of the handiwork of a kindred spirit. "'How's the pup?' Carmack inquired when they strolled back into camp. "'To hell with pups,' was Hoochinoo Bill's reply. "'Me and Kink's goin' a-lookin' for too much gold when we get rested up.' Too much gold was the fabled creek of which all sourdoughs dreamed, whereof it was said the gold was so thick that in order to wash it gravel must first be shoveled into the sluice boxes but the several days rest preliminary to the quest for too much gold brought a slight change in their plan inasmuch as it brought one Ans Handerson a swede Ans Handerson had been working for wages all summer at miller creek over on the sixty mile and the summer done had strayed up bonanza like many another waif helplessly adrift on the gold tides that swept willy-nilly across the land he was tall and lanky his arms were long like prehistoric man's his hands were like soup plates twisted and gnarled and big knuckled from toil he was slow of utterance and movement and his eyes pale blue as his hair was pale yellow seemed filled with an immortal dreaming the stuff of which no man knew and himself least of all perhaps this appearance of immortal dreaming was due to a supreme and vacuous innocence at any rate this was the valuation men of ordinary clay put upon him and there was nothing extraordinary about the composition of hoochnew bill and kink mitchell the partners had spent a day of visiting and gossip and in the evening met in the temporary quarters of the monte carlo a large tent where stampeders rested their weary bones and bad whiskey sold at a dollar a drink since the only money in circulation was dust and since the house took the down weight on the scales a drink cost something more than a dollar bill and kink were not drinking principally for the reason that their one and common sack was not strong enough to stand many excursions to the scales say bill i've got a chechaqua on the string for a sack of flour mitchell announced jubilantly bill looked interested and pleased grub was scarce and they were not over plentifully supplied for the quest after too much gold flour is worth a dollar a pound he answered how like do you calculate to get your finger on it trade him a half interest in that claim of ourn kink answered what claim bill was surprised then he remembered the reservation he had staked off for the swedes and said oh i wouldn't be so close about it though he added give him the whole thing while you're about it and in a right free-handed way bill shook his head if i did he get clean scared and prance off i'm lettin' on as how the ground is believed to be valuable and that we're lettin' go just because we're monstrous short on grub after the dicker we can make him a present to the whole shebang if someone ain't disregarded our notice bill objected though he was plainly pleased at the prospect of exchanging the claim for a sack of flour she ain't jumped kink assured him it's number twenty four and it stands the chechaquos took it serious and they've begun staking where you left off stake clean over the divide too i was gassin with one of them which had just got in with cramps in his legs it was then and for the first time that they heard the slow and groping utterance of Ans handerson i like the looks he was saying to the barkeeper i tank i got a claim the partners winked at each other and a few minutes later a surprised and grateful swede was drinking bad whiskey with two hard-hearted strangers but he was as hard-headed as they were hard-hearted the sack made frequent journeys to the scales followed solicitously each time by kink mitchell's eyes and still Ans handerson did not loosen up in his pale blue eyes as in summer seas immortal dreams swam up and burned but the swimming and the burning were due to the tales of gold and prospect pans he heard rather than to the whiskey he slid so easily down his throat the partners were in despair though they appeared boisterous and jovial of speech and action don't mind me my friend hoochinoo bill hiccuped his hand upon aunt sanderson's shoulder have another drink we're just celebrating kink's birthday here this is my partner kink kink mitchell and what might your name be this learned his hand descended resoundingly on kink's back and kink simulated clumsy self-consciousness in that he was for the time being the centre of the rejoicing while aunt sanderson looked pleased and asked them to have a drink with him
It was the first and last time he treated, until the play changed and his canny soul was roused to unwanted prodigality. But he paid for the liquor from a fairly healthy-looking sack, not less than eight hundred in it, calculated the lynx-eyed kink, and on the strength of it he took the first opportunity of a privy conversation with Bidwell, the proprietor of the bad whiskey and the tent. "'Here's my sack, Bidwell,' Kink said, with the intimacy and surety of one old-timer to another. "'Just weigh fifty dollars into it for a day or so, more or less, and will be yours truly, Bill and me.' Thereafter, the journeys of the sack to the scales were more frequent, and the celebration of Kink's natal day waxed hilarious. He even essayed to sing the old-timer's classic, The Juice of the Forbidden Fruit, but broke down and drowned his embarrassment in another round of drinks.' Even Bidwell honored him with a round or two on the house, and he and Bill were decently drunk by the time Ans Henderson's eyelids began to droop and his tongue gave promise of loosening. Bill grew affectionate, then confidential. He told his troubles and hard luck to the barkeeper and the world in general, and to Ans Henderson in particular. He required no histrionic powers to act the part. The bad whiskey attended to that. He worked himself into great sorrow for himself and Bill, and his tears were sincere when he told how he and his partner were thinking of selling a half-interest in good ground just because they were short of grub. Even Kink listened and believed. Aunt Henderson's eyes were shining unholily as he asked, "'How much you tank you take?' Bill and Kink did not hear him, and he was compelled to repeat his query. They appeared reluctant. He grew keener and he swayed back and forward, holding on to the bar, and listened with all his ears while they conferred together on one side, and wrangled as to whether they should or not, and disagreed in stage whispers over the price they should set. Two hundred and fifty, Bill finally announced, but we reckon as we won't sell, which is monstrous wise if I might chip in my little say, seconded Bidwell. Yes, indeed, he added Kink. We ain't in no charity business, and a disgorgin free and generous to Swedes and white men. I tank we half another drink, hiccuped Aunt Henderson, craftily changing the subject against a more propitious time. And thereafter, to bring about that propitious time, his own sack began to seesaw between his hip pocket and the scales. Bill and Kink were coy, but they finally yielded to his blandishments, whereupon he grew shy and drew Bidwell to one side. He staggered exceedingly and held on to Bidwell for support as he asked, "'They ban—' "'All right, them men, you tank so?' "'Sure,' Bidwell answered heartily. "'Known em for years, old sourdoughs. When they sell a claim, they sell a claim. They ain't no air dealers. "'I tank I buy,' Aunt Sanderson announced, tottering back to the two men. But by now he was dreaming deeply, and he proclaimed that he would have the whole claim or nothing. This was the cause of great pain to Hooch knew Bill. He orated grandly against the hoggishness of Chichaquos and Swedes, albeit he dozed between periods, his great voice dying away to a gurgle, and his head sinking forward on his breast. But whenever roused by a nudge from Kink or Bidwell, he never failed to explode another volley of abuse and insult. Aunt Henderson was calm under it all. Each insult added to the value of the claim. Such unamiable reluctance to sell advertised but one thing to him, and he was aware of the great relief when Hoochanoo Bill sank snoring to the floor, and he was free to turn his attention to the less intractable partner. Kink Mitchell was persuadable, though a poor mathematician. He wept dolefully, but was willing to sell a half-interest for two hundred and fifty dollars, or the whole claim for seven hundred and fifty. Ans Henderson and Bidwell labored to clear away his erroneous ideas concerning fractions, but their labor was vain. He spilled tears and regrets all over the bar and on their shoulders, which tears, however, did not wash away his opinion that if one half was worth two hundred and fifty, two halves were worth three times as much. In the end, and even Bidwell retained no more than hazy recollections of how the night terminated, a bill of sale was drawn up, wherein Bill Rader and Charles Mitchell yielded up all right and title to the claim known as 24 El Dorado, the same being the name the creek had received from some optimistic Chichaqua. When Kink had signed, it took the united efforts of the three to arouse Bill. Pen in hand, he swayed long over the document, and each time he rocked back and forth, in Aunt Henderson's eyes flashed and faded a wondrous golden vision. When the precious signature was at last appended, and the dust paid over, he breathed a great sigh, and sank to sleep under a table, where he dreamed immortally until morning. 
but the day was chill and gray. He felt bad. His first act, unconscious and automatic, was to feel for his sack. Its lightness startled him. Then, slowly, memories of the night thronged into his brain. Rough voices disturbed him. He opened his eyes and peered out from under the table. A couple of early risers, or rather, men who had been out on trail all night, were vociferating their opinions concerning the utter and loathsome worthlessness of El Dorado Creek. He grew frightened, felt in his pocket, and found the deed to 24 El Dorado. Ten minutes later, Hoochnoo Bill and Kink Mitchell were roused from their blankets by a wild-eyed Swede that strove to force upon them an ink-scrawled and very blotty piece of paper. I tank I take my money back, he gibbered. I tank I take my money back. Tears were in his eyes and throat. They ran down his cheeks as he knelt before them and pleaded and implored. But Bill and Kink did not laugh. They might have been harder-hearted. First time I ever met a man squeal over a mining deal, Bill said, and I make free to say tis too unusual for me to savvy. Same here, Kink Mitchell remarked. Mining deals is like horse trading. They were honest in their wonderment. They could not conceive of themselves raising a whale over a business transaction, so they could not understand it in another man. The poor ornery Chichaquo, murmured Hoochinoo Bill, as they watched the sorrowing Swede disappear up the trail. But this ain't too much gold, Kink Mitchell said cheerfully. And ere the day was out, they purchased flour and bacon at exorbitant prices with Aunt Henderson's dust, and crossed over the divide in the direction of the creeks that lie between the Klondike and Indian River. Three months later, they came back to the divide in the midst of a snowstorm and dropped down the trail to 24 El Dorado. It merely chanced that the trail led them that way. They were not looking for the claim, nor could they see much through the driving white till they set foot upon the claim itself. And then the air lightened, and they beheld a dump, capped by a windlass that a man was turning. They saw him draw a bucket of gravel from the hole and tilt it on the edge of the dump. Likewise they saw another man, strangely familiar, filling a pan with the fresh gravel. His hands were large, his hair wets pale yellow. But before they reached him, he turned with the pan and fled toward a cabin. He wore no hat, and the snow falling down his neck accounted for his haste. Bill and Kink ran after him, and came upon him in the cabin, kneeling by the stove and washing the pan of gravel in a tub of water. He was too deeply engaged to notice more than that somebody had entered the cabin. They stood at his shoulder and looked on. He imparted to the pan a deft circular motion, pausing once or twice to rake out the larger particles of gravel with his fingers. The water was muddy, and with the pan buried in it they could see nothing of its contents. Suddenly he lifted the pan clear and sent the water out of it with a flirt. A mass of yellow, like butter and churn, showed across the bottom. Hoochinoo Bill swallowed. Never in his life had he dreamed of so rich a test pan. "'Kind of thick, my friend,' he said huskily. "'How much might you reckon that all to be?' Hans Henderson did not look up as he replied. "'I tank fifty ounces.' "'You must be scrumptious rich, then, eh?' Still, Aunt Henderson kept his head down, absorbed in putting in the fine touches which wash out the last particles of dross, though he answered, "'I tank I been worth five hundred thousand dollar.' "'Gosh!' said Hoochinoo Bill, and he said it reverently. "'Yes, Bill, gosh!' said Kink Mitchell, and they went out softly and closed the door. End of Too Much Gold Recording by Brian Ackerman Section 5. The One Thousand Dozen of the Faith of Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. The One Thousand Dozen by Jack London. David Rasmussen was a hustler and like many a greater man, a man of the one idea. Wherefore, when the clarion call of the north rang on his ear, he conceived an adventure in eggs, and bent all his energy to its achievement. He figured briefly and to the point, and the adventure became iridescent-hued, splendid. 
that eggs would sell at Dawson for five dollars a dozen was a safe working premise. Whence it was incontrovertible that one thousand dozen would bring in, in the golden metropolis, five thousand dollars. On the other hand, expense was to be considered, and he considered it well, for he was a careful man, keenly practical, with a hard head, and a heart that imagination never warmed. At fifteen cents a dozen, the initial cost of his thousand dozen would be one hundred and fifty dollars, a mere bagatelle in face of the enormous profit. And suppose, just suppose, to be wildly extravagant for once, that transportation for himself and eggs should run up eight hundred and fifty more. He would still have four thousand clear cash and clean when the last egg was disposed of and the last dust had rippled into his sack. You see, Alma, he figured it over with his wife, the cozy dining room submerged in a sea of maps, government surveys, guidebooks, and Alaskan itineraries. You see, expenses don't really begin till you make Daia. Fifty dollars will cover it with a first-class passage thrown in. Now from Daia to Lake Linderman, Indian packers take your goods over for twelve cents a pound, twelve dollars a hundred, or one hundred and twenty dollars a thousand. Say I have fifteen hundred pounds, it'll cost one hundred and eighty dollars. Call it two hundred and be safe. I am credibly informed by a Klondiker, just come out, that I can buy a boat for three hundred. But the same man says I am sure to get a couple of passengers for one hundred and fifty each, which will give me the boat for nothing. And further, they can help me manage it. And that's all. I put my eggs ashore from the boat at Dawson. Now let me see, how much is that? Fifty dollars from San Francisco to Daia, two hundred from Daia to Linderman. Passengers pay for the boat, two hundred and fifty, all told, she summed up swiftly. And a hundred for my clothes and personal outfit, he went on happily. That leaves a margin of five hundred for emergencies. And what possible emergencies can arise? Alma shrugged her shoulders and elevated her brows. If that vast Northland was capable of swallowing up a man and a thousand dozen eggs, surely there was room and to spare for whatever else he might happen to possess. So she thought, but she said nothing. She knew David Rasmussen too well to say anything. Doubling the time because of chance delays, I should make the trip in two months. Think of it, Alma, four thousand in two months. Beats the paltry hundred a month I'm getting now. Why, we'll build further out, where we'll have more space, gas in every room, and a view. And the rent of the cottage will pay taxes, insurance, and water, and leave something over. And then there's always the chance of my striking it and coming out a millionaire. Now tell me, Alma, don't you think I'm very moderate? And Alma could hardly think otherwise. Besides, had not her own cousin, though a remote and distant one to be sure, the black sheep, the harem scarum, the ne'er-do-well, had not he come down out of that weird north country with a hundred thousand in yellow dust, to say nothing of a half-ownership in the hole from which it came? David Rasmussen's grocer was surprised when he found him weighing eggs in the scales at the end of the counter and Rasmussen himself was more surprised when he found that a dozen eggs weighed a pound and a half, fifteen hundred pounds for his thousand dozen. There would be no weight left for his clothes, blankets, and cooking utensils, to say nothing of the grub he must necessarily consume, by the way. His calculations were all thrown out, and he was just proceeding to recast them, when he hit upon the idea of weighing small eggs, for whether they be large or small, a dozen eggs is a dozen eggs, he observed sagely to himself, and a dozen small ones he found to weigh but a pound and a quarter. Thereat the city of San Francisco was overrun by anxious-eyed emissaries 
and commission houses and dairy associations were startled by a sudden demand for eggs running not more than twenty ounces to the dozen. Rasmussen mortgaged the little cottage for a thousand dollars, arranged for his wife to make a prolonged stay among her own people, threw up his job, and started north. To keep within his schedule, he compromised on a second-class passage, which, because of the rush, was worse than steerage. And in the late summer, a pale and wobbly man, he disembarked with his eggs on the Daia beach. But it did not take him long to recover his land legs and appetite. His first interview with the Chillicoot packers straightened him up and stiffened his backbone. Forty cents a pound they demanded for the twenty-eight mile portage, and while he caught his breath and swallowed, the price went up to forty-three. Fifteen husky Indians put the straps on his packs at forty-five, but took them off at an offer of forty-seven from a Skagway Croesus, in dirty shirt and ragged overalls, who had lost his horses on the White Pass Trail, and was now making a last desperate drive at the country by way of Chilkoot. But Rasmussen was clean grit, and at fifty cents found takers, who two days later set his eggs down intact at Linderman. But fifty cents a pound is a thousand dollars a ton, and his fifteen hundred pounds had exhausted his emergency fund and left him stranded at the Tantalus Point, where each day he saw the fresh whipsawed boats departing for Dawson. Further, a great anxiety brooded over the camp where the boats were built. Men worked frantically early and late, at the height of their endurance, caulking, nailing, and pitching, in a frenzy of haste, for which adequate explanation was not far to seek. Each day the snow line crept farther down the bleak, rock-shouldered peaks, and gale followed gale with sleet and slush and snow and in the eddies and quiet places young ice formed and thickened through the fleeting hours. And each morn toil-stiffened men turned wan faces across the lake to see if the freeze-up had come, for the freeze-up heralded the death of their hope, the hope that they would be floating down the swift river ere navigation closed on the chain of lakes. To harrow Rasmussen's soul further, he discovered three competitors in the egg business. It was true that one, a little German, had gone broke, and was himself forlornly back-tripping the last pack of the portage. But the other two had boats nearly completed, and were daily supplicating the god of merchants and traders to stay the iron hand of winter for just another day. But the iron hand closed down over the land, Men were being frozen in the blizzard which swept Chilkoot, and Rasmussen frosted his toes ere he was aware. He found a chance to go passenger with his freight in a boat just shoving off through the rubble, but two hundred hard cash was required, and he had no money. "'I tank you used wait eed little while,' said the Swedish boat builder, who had struck his Klondike right there and was wise enough to know it. One little while, and I make you a tom fine skiff boat, sure Pete. With this unpledged word to go on, Rasmussen hit the back trail to Crater Lake, where he fell in with two press correspondents, whose tangled baggage was strewn from Stone House over across the pass and as far as Happy Camp. Yes, he said with consequence, I've a thousand dozen eggs at Linderman, and my boat's just about got the last seam called. "'Consider myself in luck to get it. "'Boats are at a premium, you know, and none to be had.' "'Whereupon, and almost with bodily violence, "'the correspondents clamored to go with him, "'fluttered greenbacks before his eyes, "'and spilled yellow twenties from hand to hand. "'He could not hear of it, but they over-persuaded him, "'and he reluctantly consented to take them at three hundred apiece.' Also they pressed upon him the passage money in advance, and while they wrote to their respective journals concerning the Good Samaritan with the thousand dozen eggs, the Good Samaritan was hurrying back to the Swede at Linderman. "'Here, you, give me that boat,' was his salutation. 
his hand jingling the correspondent's gold pieces, and his eyes hungrily bent upon the finished craft. The Swede regarded him stolidly and shook his head. How much is the other fellow paying? Three hundred? Well, here's four. Take it. He tried to press it upon him, but the man backed away. I tank not. I say him, give der skiff boat. You just wait. Here's six hundred. Last call. Take it or leave it. Tell him it's a mistake. The Swede wavered. I tank, yes, he finally said. And the last Rasmussen saw of him, his vocabulary was going to wreck in a vain effort to explain the mistake to the other fellows. The German slipped and broke his ankle on the steep hogback above Deep Lake, sold out his stock for a dollar a dozen, and with the proceeds hired Indian packers to carry him back to Daia. But on the morning Rasmussen shoved off with his correspondence, his two rivals followed suit. "'How many you got?' one of them, a lean little New Englander, called out. One thousand dozen, Rasmussen answered proudly. Huh, I'll go you even stakes. I beat you in with my eight hundred. The correspondents offered to lend him the money, but Rasmussen declined, and the Yankee closed with the remaining rival, a brawny son of the sea and sailor of ships and things, who promised to show them all a wrinkle or two when it came to cracking on. And crack on he did. With a large tarpaulin, square sail, which pressed the bow half under at every jump, he was the first to run out of Linderman, but disdaining the portage, piled his loaded boat on the rocks in the boiling rapids. Rasmussen and the Yankee, who likewise had two passengers, portage across on their backs, and then lined their empty boats down through the bad water to Bennett. Bennett was a twenty-five-mile lake, narrow and deep, a funnel between the mountains through which storms ever romped. Rasmussen camped on the sand pit at its head, where were many men and boats bound north in the teeth of the Arctic winter. He awoke in the morning to find a piping gale from the south, which caught the chill from the whited peaks and glacial valleys, and blew as cold as north wind ever blew. But it was fair, and he also found the Yankee staggering past the first bold headland with all sails set. Boat after boat was getting under way, and the correspondence fell to with enthusiasm. We'll catch him before Caribou Crossing, they assured Rasmussen, as they ran up the sail, and the Alma took the first icy spray over her bow. Now Rasmussen, all his life, had been prone to cowardice on water, but he clung to the kicking steering oar with set face and determined jaw. His thousand dozen were there in the boat before his eyes, safely secured beneath the correspondent's baggage, and somehow before his eyes were the little cottage and the mortgage for a thousand dollars. It was bitter cold. Now and again he hauled in the steering sweep and put out a fresh one, while his passengers chopped the ice from the blade. Wherever the spray struck, it turned instantly to a frost, and the dipping boom of the spirit sail was quickly fringed with icicles. The Alma strained and hammered through the big seas till the seams and butts began to spread. But in lieu of bailing, the correspondents chopped ice and flung it overboard. There was no let-up. The mad race with winter was on, and the boats tore along in a desperate string. We, 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 we can't stop to save our souls, one of the correspondents chattered from cold, not fright. That's right, keep her down the middle, old man, the other encouraged. Rasmussen replied with an idiotic grin. The iron-bound shores were in a lather of foam, and even down the middle the only hope was to keep running away from the big seas. To lower sail was to be overtaken and swamped. Time and again they passed boats, pounding among the rocks, and once they saw one on the edge of the breakers about to strike. A little craft behind them, with two men, jibbed over and turned bottom up. 
W "'Watch out, old man!' cried he of the chattering teeth. Rasmunsen grinned and tightened his aching grip on the sweep. Scores of times had the send of the sea caught the big square stern of the Alma and thrown her off from dead before it till the afterleach of the spirit sail fluttered hollowly. And each time, and only with all his strength, had he forced her back. His grin by then had become fixed, and it disturbed the correspondents to look at him. They roared down past an isolated rock a hundred yards from shore. From its wave-drenched top a man shrieked wildly, for the instant cutting the storm with his voice. But the next instant the Alma was by, and the rock growing a black speck in the troubled froth. "'That settles the Yankee! Where's the sailor?' shouted one of his passengers. Rasmunsen shot a glance over his shoulder at a black square sail. He had seen it leap up out of the gray to windward, and for an hour off and on had been watching it grow. The sailor had evidently repaired damages and was making up for lost time. Look at him come! Both passengers stopped chopping ice to watch. Twenty miles of Bennett were behind them, room and despair for the sea to toss up its mountains toward the sky. Sinking and soaring like a storm god, the sailor drove by them. The huge sail seemed to grip the boat from the crest of the waves, to tear it bodily out of the water, and fling it crashing and smothering down into the yawning troughs. The sea'll never catch him, but he'll r r run her nose under. Even as they spoke, the black tarpaulin swooped from sight behind a big comber. The next wave rolled over the spot, and the next, but the boat did not reappear. The Alma rushed by the place. A little riffraff of oats and boxes was seen. An arm thrust up and a shaggy head broke surface a score of yards away. For a time there was silence. As the end of the lake came in sight, the waves began to leap aboard with such steady recurrence that the correspondents no longer chopped ice but flung the water out with buckets. Even this would not do, and after a shouted conference with Rasmunsen, they attacked the baggage. Flour, bacon, beans, blankets, cooking stove, ropes, odds and ends, everything they could get hands on flew overboard. The boat acknowledged it at once, taking less water and rising more buoyantly. That'll do, Rasmunsen called sternly, as they applied themselves to the top layer of eggs. The hell it will, answered the shivering one savagely. With the exception of their notes, films, and cameras, they had sacrificed their outfit. He bent over, laid hold of an egg box, and began to worry it out from under the lashing. Drop it! Drop it, I say! Rasmunsen had managed to draw his revolver, and with the crook of his arm over the sweep head, was taking aim. The correspondent stood up on the thwart, balancing back and forth, his face twisted with menace and speechless anger. "'My God!' so cried his brother correspondent, hurling himself face downward into the bottom of the boat. The Alma, under the divided attention of Rasmunsen, had been caught by a great mass of water and whirled around. The afterleach hollowed, the sail emptied and jibbed and the boom, sweeping with terrific force across the boat, carried the angry correspondent overboard with a broken back. Mast and sail had gone over the side as well. A drenching sea followed as the boat lost headway, and Rasmussen sprang to the bailing bucket. Several boats hurtled past them in the next half hour, small boats, boats of their own size, boats afraid, unable to do out, but run madly on. Then a ten-ton barge, at imminent risk of destruction, lowered sail to windward and lumbered down upon them. "'Keep off! Keep off!' Rasmussen screamed. But his low gunwale ground against the heavy craft, and the remaining correspondent clambered aboard. Rasmussen was over the eggs like a cat, and in the bow of the Alma, "'striving with numb fingers to bend the hauling lines together. "'Come on!' a red-whiskered man yelled at him. 
"'If a thousand dozen eggs here,' he shouted back, "'give me a tow. I'll pay you.' "'Come on!' they howled in chorus. A big white cat broke just beyond, washing over the barge and leaving the Alma half-swamped. The men cast off, cursing him as they ran up their sail. Rasmussen cursed back and fell to bailing, the mast and sail like a sea anchor still fast by the halyards, held the boat head on to wind and sea, and gave him a chance to fight the water out. Three hours later, numbed, exhausted, blathering like a lunatic, but still bailing, he went ashore on an ice-strewn beach near Caribou Crossing. Two men, a government courier and a half-breed voyager, dragged him out of the surf, saved his cargo, and beached the Alma. They were paddling out of the country in a Peterborough, and gave him shelter for the night in their storm-bound camp. Next morning they departed, but he elected to stay by his eggs, and thereafter the name and fame of the man with a thousand dozen eggs began to spread through the land. Gold-seekers who made in before the freeze-up carried the news of his coming. Grizzled old-timers of Forty Mile and Circle City Sourdoughs with leather jaws and bean-calloused stomachs called up dream memories of chickens and green things at the mention of his name. Daia and Skagway took an interest in his being and questioned his progress from every man who came over the passes, while Dawson, golden omeletless Dawson, fretted and worried and waylaid every chance arrival for word of him. But of this Rasmussen knew nothing. The day after the wreck he patched up the Alma and pulled out. A cruel east wind blew in his teeth from Tagish, but he got the oars over the side and bucked manfully into it, though half the time he was drifting backward and chopping ice from the blades. According to the custom of the country he was driven ashore at Windy Arm. Three times on Tagish saw him swamped and beached, and Lake Marsh held him at the freeze-up. The Alma was crushed in the jamming of the floes, but the eggs were intact. These he back-tripped two miles across the ice to the shore, where he built a cache which stood for years after and was pointed out by men who knew. Half a thousand frozen miles stretched between him and Dawson, and the waterway was closed. But Rasmussen, with a peculiar tense look in his face, struck back up the lakes on foot. What he suffered on that lone trip, with naught but a single blanket, an axe, and a handful of beans, is not given to ordinary mortals to know. Only the Arctic adventurer may understand. Suffice that he was caught in a blizzard on Chilkoot, and left two of his toes with the surgeon at sheep camp. Yet he stood on his feet and washed dishes in the scullery of the Pawona to the Puget Sound, and from there passed coal on a P.S. boat to San Francisco. It was a haggard, unkempt man who limped across the shining office floor to raise a second mortgage from the bank people. His hollow cheeks betrayed themselves through the scraggy beard, and his eyes seemed to have retired into deep caverns where they burned with cold fires. His hands were grained from exposure and hard work, and the nails were rimmed with tight-packed dirt and coal dust. He spoke vaguely of eggs and ice packs, winds and tides, but when they declined to let him have more than a second thousand, his talk became incoherent, concerning itself chiefly with the price of dogs and dog food, and such things as snowshoes and moccasins and winter trails. They let him have fifteen hundred, which was more than the cottage warranted, and breathed easier when he scrawled his signature and passed out the door. Two weeks later he went over Chilkoot with three dog sleds of five dogs each. One team he drove, the two Indians with him driving the others. At Lake Marsh they broke out the cache and loaded up, but there was no trail. He was the first in over the ice, and to him fell the task of packing the snow and hammering away through the rough river jams. Behind him he often observed a campfire smoke trickling thinly up through the quiet air, 
and he wondered why the people did not overtake him, for he was a stranger to the land and did not understand. Nor could he understand his Indians when they tried to explain. This they conceived to be a hardship, but when they balked and refused to break camp of mornings, he drove them to their work at Pistol Point. When he slipped through an ice bridge near the white horse and froze his foot, tender yet and oversensitive from the previous freezing, the Indians looked for him to lie up. But he sacrificed a blanket, and with his foot encased in an enormous moccasin, big as a water bucket, continued to take his regular turn with the front sled. Here was the cruelest work, and they respected him. Though on the side they wrapped their foreheads with their knuckles, and significantly shook their heads. One night they tried to run away, but the zip-zip of his bullets in the snow brought them back, snarling but convinced. Whereupon, being only savage Chilkut men, they put their heads together to kill him, but he slept like a cat, and waking or sleeping the chance never came. Often they tried to tell him the import of the smoke wreath in the rear, but he could not comprehend and grew suspicious of them, and when they sulked or shirked, he was quick to let drive at them between the eyes, and quick to cool their heated souls with the sight of his ready revolver. And so it went, with mutinous men, wild dogs, and a trail that broke the heart. He fought the men to stay with him, fought the dogs to keep them away from the eggs, fought the ice, the cold, and the pain of his foot which would not heal. As fast as the young tissue renewed, it was bitten and scarred by the frost, so that a running sore developed into which he could almost shove his fist. In the mornings, when he first put his weight upon it, his head went dizzy, and he was near to fainting from the pain but later on in the day it usually grew numb, to recommence when he crawled into his blankets and tried to sleep. Yet he, who had been a clerk and sat at a desk all his days, toiled till the Indians were exhausted, and even outworked the dogs. How hard he worked, how much he suffered, he did not know. Being a man of the one idea, now that the idea had come, it mastered him. In the foreground of his consciousness was Dawson, in the background his thousand dozen eggs, and midway between the two his ego fluttered, striving always to draw them together to a glittering golden point. This golden point was the five thousand dollars, the consummation of the idea, and the point of departure for whatever new idea might present itself. For the rest he was a mere automaton, he was unaware of other things, seeing them as through a glass darkly, and giving them no thought. The work of his hands he did with machine-like wisdom, likewise the work of his head. So the look on his face grew very tense, till even the Indians were afraid of it, and marveled at the strange white man who had made them slaves and forced them to toil with such foolishness. Then came a snap on Lake Labarge, when the cold of the outer space smote the tip of the planet, and the force ranged sixty and odd degrees below zero. Here, laboring with open mouth that he might breathe more freely, he chilled his lungs, and for the rest of the trip he was troubled with a dry, hacking cough, especially irritable in smoke of camp or under stress of undue exertion. On the thirty-mile river he found much open water, spanned by precarious ice bridges, and fringed with narrow rim ice, tricky and uncertain. The rim ice was impossible to reckon on, and he dared it without reckoning, falling back in his revolver when his drivers demurred. But on the ice bridges, covered with snow though they were, precautions could be taken. These they crossed on their snowshoes, with long poles, held crosswise in their hands, to which to cling in case of accident. Once over the dogs were called to follow, and on such a bridge, where the absence of the center ice was masked by the snow, 
one of the Indians met his end. He went through as quickly and neatly as a knife through thin cream, and the current swept him from view down into the stream ice. That night his mate fled away through the pale moonlight. Rasmunsen futilely punctuated the silence with his revolver, a thing that he handled with more celerity than cleverness. Thirty-six hours later the Indian made a police camp on the big salmon. Um, 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 funny mans, what you call? Top em head all loose, the interpreter explained to the puzzled captain. Eh? Yep, clazy, much clazy mans. Eggs, eggs, all the time eggs, savvy? Come bimaby. It was several days before Rasmussen arrived. The three sleds lashed together, and all the dogs in a single team. It was awkward, and where the going was bad, he was compelled to back-trip it sled by sled, though he managed most of the time, through Herculean efforts to bring all along on the one hall. He did not seem moved when the captain of the police told him his man was hitting the high places for Dawson, and was by that time probably halfway between Selkirk and Stuart nor did he appear interested when informed that the police had broken the trail as far as Pelly, for he had attained to a fatalistic acceptance of all natural dispensations, good or ill. But when they told him that Dawson was in the bitter clutch of famine, he smiled, threw the harness on his dogs, and pulled out. But it was at his next halt that the mystery of the smoke was explained. With the word at Big Salmon that the trail was broken to Pelly, there was no longer any need for the smoke wreath to linger in his wake. And Rasmunsen, crouching over lonely fire, saw a motley string of sleds go by. First came the courier and the half-breed who had hauled him out from Bennett, then mail carriers for Circle City, two sleds of them, and a mixed following of ingoing Klondikers. Dogs and men were fresh and fat, while Rasmunsen and his brutes were jaded and worn down to the skin and bone. They of the smoke wreath had traveled one day in three, resting and reserving their strength for the dash to come when broken trail was met with. While each day he had plunged and floundered forward, breaking the spirit of his dogs and robbing them of their metal. As for himself, he was unbreakable. They thanked him kindly for his efforts on their behalf, those fat, fresh men, thanked him kindly with broad grims and ribald laughter. And now, when he understood, he made no answer. Nor did he cherish silent bitterness. It was immaterial. The idea, the fact behind the idea, was not changed. Here he was, and his thousand dozen. There was Dawson. The problem was unaltered. At the little salmon, being short of dog food, the dogs got into his grub, and from there to Selkirk he lived on beans, coarse brown beans, big beans, grossly nutritive, which gripped his stomach and doubled him up at two-hour intervals. But the factor at Selkirk had a notice on the door of the post to the effect that no steamer had been up the Yukon for two years, and in consequence grub was beyond price. He offered to swap flour, however, at the rate of a cupful of each egg. But Rasmunsen shook his head and hit the trail. Below the post he managed to buy frozen horse hide for the dogs, the horses having been slain by the Chilkat cattlemen, and the scraps and offal preserved by the Indians. He tackled the hide himself, but the hair worked into the bean sores of his mouth and was beyond endurance. Here at Selkirk he met the forerunners of the hungry exodus of Dawson, and from there on they crept over the trail, a dismal throng. No grub was the song they sang, no grub and had to go. Everybody holding candles for a rise in the spring. Flour, dollar and a half a pound, and no cellars. Eggs, one of them answered. Dollar apiece, but there ain't none. Rasmunsen made a rapid calculation. Twelve thousand dollars, he said aloud. Hey? the man asked. Nothing, he answered. 
and mushed the dogs along. When he arrived at Stuart River, seventy from Dawson, five of his dogs were gone, and the remainder were falling in the traces. He also was in the traces, hauling with what little strength was left in him. Even then he was barely crawling along ten miles a day. His cheekbones and nose, frostbitten again and again, were turning bloody black and hideous. The thumb, which was separated from the fingers by the G-pole, had likewise been nipped, and gave him great pain. The monstrous moccasin still encased his foot, and strange pains were beginning to rack the leg. At sixty mile, the last beans, which he had been rationing for some time, were finished, yet he steadfastly refused to touch the eggs. He could not reconcile his mind to the legitimacy of it, and staggered and fell along the way to Indian River. Here a fresh-killed moose and an open-handed old-timer gave him and his dogs new strength, and at Ainsley's he felt repaid for it when a stampede, ripe from Dawson in five hours, was sure he'd get a dollar and a quarter for every egg he possessed. He came up the steep bank by the Dawson barracks with fluttering heart and shaking knees. The dogs were so weak that he was forced to rest them, and waiting he leaned limply against the gee-pole. A man, an eminently decorous-looking man, came sauntering by in a great bearskin coat. He glanced at Rasmussen curiously, then stopped and ran a speculative eye over the dogs and the three lashed sleds. "'What you got?' he asked. "'Eggs,' Rasmussen answered huskily, hardly able to pitch his voice above a whisper. "'Eggs? Whoopee! Whoopee!' He sprang up into the air, gyrated madly, and finished with a half a dozen war steps. "'You don't say all of em? "'All of em. "'So you must be the egg man.' He walked around and viewed Rasmussen from the other side. "'Come now, ain't you the egg man?' Rasmussen didn't know, but supposed he was, and the man sobered down a bit. "'What do you expect to get for him?' he asked cautiously. Rasmussen became audacious. "'Dollar and a half,' he said. "'Done!' the man came back promptly. "'Give me a dozen.' "'I—I I mean a dollar and a half apiece,' Rasmussen hesitatingly explained. "'Sure, I heard you. Make it two dozen. Here's the dust.' The man pulled out a healthy gold sack, the size of a small sausage, and knocked it negligently against the gee-pole. Rasmussen felt a strange trembling in the pit of his stomach, a tickling of the nostrils, and an almost overwhelming desire to sit down and cry. But a curious, wide-eyed crowd was beginning to collect, and man after man was calling out for eggs. He was without scales, but the man with the bearskin coat fetched a pair, and obligingly weighed in the dust while Rasmussen passed out the goods. Soon there was a pushing and shoving and shouldering, and a great clamor. Everybody wanted to buy and to be served first, and as the excitement grew, Rasmussen cooled down. This would never do. There must be something behind the fact of their buying so eagerly. It would be wiser if he rested first and sized up the market. Perhaps eggs were worth two dollars apiece. Anyway, whenever he wished to sell, he was sure of a dollar and a half. Stop, he cried, when a couple of hundred had been sold. No more now. I'm played out. I've got to get a cabin, and then you can come and see me. A groan went up at this, but the man with the bearskin coat approved. Twenty-four of the frozen eggs went rattling in his capacious pockets, and he didn't care whether the rest of the town ate or not. Besides, he could see Rasmussen was on his last legs. There's a cabin right around the second corner from the Monte Carlo, he told him. The one with the soda bottle window? It ain't mine, but I've got charge of it. Rents for ten a day and cheap for the money. You move right in and I'll see you later. Don't forget the soda bottle window. Tralaloo, he called back a moment later. I'm going up the hill to eat eggs and dream of home. On his way to the cabin, Rasmussen recollected he was hungry and bought a small supply of provisions at the N.A.T. and T. store. 
also a beefsteak at the butcher shop and dried salmon for the dogs. He found the cabin without difficulty and left the dogs in the harness while he started the fire and got the coffee under way. A dollar and a half apiece, one thousand dozen, eighteen thousand dollars, he kept muttering it to himself over and over as he went about his work. As he flopped the steak into the frying pan, the door opened. He turned. It was the man with the bearskin coat. He seemed to come in with determination, as though bound on some explicit errand. But as he looked at Rasmunson, an expression of perplexity came into his face. "'I say—' "'Now, I say,' he began, then halted. Rasmunson wondered if he wanted the rent. "'I say, damn it, you know them eggs is bad.' Rasmunson staggered. He felt as though someone had struck him and an astounding blow between the eyes. The walls of the cabin reeled and tilted up. He put his hand to steady himself and rested it on the stove. The sharp pain and the smell of the burning flesh brought him back to himself. I, I see, he said slowly, fumbling in his pocket for the sack. You want your money back? It ain't the money, the man said. But hain't you got any eggs good? Grassmanson shook his head. You'd better take the money. But the man refused and backed away. I'll come back, he said, when you've taken stock and get what's coming. Rasmunson rolled the chopping block into the cabin and carried in the eggs. He went about it quite calmly. He took up the hand axe and one by one chopped the eggs in half. These halves he examined carefully and let fall to the floor. At first he sampled from the different cases, then deliberately emptied one case at a time. The heap on the floor grew larger. The coffee boiled over, and the smoke of the burning beefsteak filled the cabin. He chopped steadfastly and monotonously till the last case was finished. Somebody knocked at the door, knocked again, and let himself in. What a mess, he remarked, as he paused and surveyed the scene. The severed eggs were beginning to thaw in the heat of the stove, and a miserable odor was growing stronger. Must have happened on the steamer, he suggested. Rasmunson looked at him long and blankly. I'm Murray, Big Jim Murray. Everybody knows me, the man volunteered. I'm just hearing your eggs is rotten, and I'm offering you two hundred for the batch. They ain't good as salmon, but still they're fair scoffins for dogs. Rasmunson seemed turned to stone. He did not move. You go to hell, he said passionlessly. Now just consider. I pride myself it's a decent price for a mess like that, and it's better or nothing. Two hundred, what do you say? You go to hell, Rasmunson repeated softly, and get out of here. Murray gaped with a great awe, then went out carefully backward with his eyes fixed on the other's face. Rasmunson followed him out and turned the dogs loose. He threw them all the salmon he had bought, and coiled a sled lashing up in his hand. Then he re-entered the cabin and drew the latch in after him. The smoke from the cindered stake made his eyes smart. He stood on the bunk, passed the lashing over the ridge pole, and measured the swing off with his eye. It did not seem to satisfy, for he put the stool on the bunk and climbed upon the stool. He drove a noose in the end of the lashing and slipped his head through. The other end he made fast. Then he kicked the stool out from under. End of the One Thousand Dozen Section 6, The Marriage of Litlit, -Lit, of the Faith of Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis. The Marriage of Litlit, -Lit, by Jack London. 
When John Fox came into a country where whiskey freezes solid and may be used as a paperweight for a large part of the year, he came without the ideals and illusions that usually hamper the progress of more delicately nurtured adventurers. Born and reared on the frontier fringe of the United States, he took with him into Canada a primitive cast of mind, an elemental simplicity and grip on things, as it were, that ensured him immediate success in his new career. From a mere servant of the Hudson Bay Company, driving a paddle with the voyagers and carrying goods on his back across the portages, he swiftly rose to a factor ship and took charge of a trading post at Fort Angeles. Here, because of his elemental simplicity, he took to himself a native wife, and, by reason of the connubial bliss that followed, he escaped the unrest and vain longings that cursed the days of more fastidious men, spoil their work, and conquer them in the end. He lived contentedly, was at single purposes with the business he was set there to do, and achieved a brilliant record in the service of the company. About this time his wife died, was claimed by her people, and buried with savage circumstance in a tin trunk in the top of a tree. Two sons she had borne him, and when the company promoted him, he journeyed with them still deeper into the vastness of the Northwest Territory to a place called Sin Rock, where he took charge of a new post in a more important fur field. Here he spent several lonely and depressing months, eminently disgusted with the unprepossessing appearance of the Indian maidens, and greatly worried by his growing sons who stood in need of a mother's care. Then his eyes chanced upon Lit-Lit. Lit-Lit, well, she is Lit-Lit, was the fashion in which he despairingly described her to his chief clerk, Alexander McLean. McLean was too fresh from his Scottish upbringing, not dry behind the ears yet, John Fox put it, to take to the marriage customs of the country. Nevertheless, he was not averse to the factors imperiling his own immortal soul, and, especially feeling an ominous attraction himself for Litlit, he was somberly content to clinch his own soul's safety by seeing her married to the factor. Nor is it to be wondered that McLean's austere Scotch soul stood in danger of being thawed in the sunshine of Litlit's eyes. She was pretty and slender and willowy, without the massive face and temperamental stolidity of the average squaw. Litlit, so called from her fashion, even as a child, of being fluttery, of darting about from place to place like a butterfly, of being inconsequent and merry, and of laughing as lightly as she darted and danced about. Litlit was the daughter of Snetishane, a prominent chief in the tribe, by a half-breed mother, and to him the factor fared casually one summer day to open negotiations of marriage. He sat with the chief in the smoke of a mosquito smudge before his lodge, and together they talked about everything under the sun, or at least everything that in the Northland is under the sun, with the sole exception of marriage. John Fox had come particularly to talk of marriage. Snetishane knew it, and John Fox knew he knew it, wherefore the subject was religiously avoided. This is alleged to be Indian subtlety. In reality it is transparent simplicity. The hours slipped by, and Fox and Snetishane smoked interminable pipes, looking each other in the eyes with a guilelessness superbly histrionic. In the mid-afternoon McLean and his brother Clerk McTavish strolled past, innocently uninterested, on their way to the river. When they strolled back again an hour later, Fox and Snetishane had attained to a ceremonious discussion of the condition and quality of the gunpowder and bacon which the company was offering in trade. Meanwhile Litlit, divining the factor's errand, had crept in under the rear wall of the lodge, and through the front flap was peeping out at the two logomachists by the mosquito smudge. She was flushed and happy-eyed, proud that no less a man than the factor, who stood next to God in the Northland hierarchy, had singled her out, femininely curious to see at close range what manner of man he was. Sunglare on the ice, camp smoke and weather beat had burned his face to a copper brown, so that her father was as fair as he, while she was fairer. She was remotely glad of this, and more immediately glad that he was large and strong, though his great black beard half frightened her it was so strange. Being very young, she was unversed in the ways of men. Seventeen times she had seen the sun travel south and lose itself beyond the skyline, and seventeen times she had seen it travel back again and ride the sky day and night till there was no night at all and through these years she had been cherished jealously by Snetishane, who stood between her and all suitors, listening disdainfully to the young hunters as they bid for her hand, 
and turning them away as though she were beyond price. Snettishane was mercenary. Litlit was to him an investment. She represented so much capital from which he expected to receive not a certain definite interest, but an incalculable interest. And having thus been reared in a manner as near to that of the nunnery as tribal conditions would permit, it was with a great and maidenly anxiety that she peeped out at the man who had surely come for her, at the husband who was to teach her all that was yet unlearned of life, at the masterful being whose word was to be her law, and who was to meet and bound her actions and comportment for the rest of her days. But, peeping through the front flap of the lodge, flushed and thrilling at the strange destiny reaching out for her, she grew disappointed as the day wore along, and the factor and her father still talked pompously of matters concerning other things and not pertaining to marriage things at all. As the sun sank lower and lower towards the north and midnight approached, the factor began making unmistakable preparations for departure. As he turned to stride away, Litlit's heart sank, but it rose again as he halted, half turning on one heel. "'Oh, by the way, Snettishane,' he said, "'I want a squaw to wash for me and mend my clothes.' Snettishane grunted and suggested Wanadani, who was an old woman and toothless. "'No, no,' interposed the factor. "'What I want is a wife. I've been kind of thinking about it, and the thought just struck me that you might know of someone that would suit.' Snettishane looked interested, whereupon the factor retraced his steps, casually and carelessly, to linger and discuss this new and incidental topic. Ketu suggested Snettishane. "'She has but one eye,' objected the factor. Laska, Her knees can be wide apart when she stands upright. Kips, your biggest dog, can leap between her knees when she stands upright. Sanity, went on the imperturbable Snettishane. But John Fox feigned anger, crying, What foolishness is this? Am I old that thou shouldst make me with old women? Am I toothless, lame of leg, blind of eye? Or am I poor that no bright-eyed maiden may look with favor upon me? Behold, I am the factor, both rich and great, a power in the land whose speech makes men tremble and is obeyed. Snettishane was inwardly pleased, though his sphinx-like visage never relaxed. He was drawing the factor and making him break ground. Being a creature so elemental as to have room for but one idea at a time, Snettishane could pursue that one idea a greater distance than could John Fox. For John Fox, elemental as he was, was still complex enough to entertain several glimmering ideas at a time, which debarred him from pursuing the one as single-heartedly or as far as did the chief. Snettishane calmly continued calling the roster of eligible maidens which, name by name as fast as uttered, were stamped ineligible by John Fox, with specified objections appended. Again he gave it up and started to return to the fort. Snettishane watched him go, making no effort to stop him, but seeing him, in the end, stop himself. "'Come to think of it,' the factor remarked, "'we both of us forgot Litlit. Now I wonder if she'll suit me.' Snettishane met the suggestion with a mirthless face behind the mask of which his soul grinned wide. It was a distinct victory. Had the factor gone but one step farther, perforce Snettishane would himself have mentioned the name of Litlit, but— the factor had not gone that one step farther. The chief was non-committal concerning Litlit's -lit suitability till he drove the white man into taking the next step in order of procedure. Well, the factor meditated aloud, the only way to find out is to make a try of it. He raised his voice. So I will give for Litlit -lit ten blankets and three pounds of tobacco, which is good tobacco. Snettishane replied with a gesture which seemed to say that all the blankets and tobacco in all the world could not compensate him for the loss of Litlit and her manifold virtues. When pressed by the factor to set a price, he coolly placed it at five hundred blankets, ten guns, fifty pounds of tobacco, twenty scarlet cloths, ten bottles of rum, a music box, and lastly the good will and best offices of the factor, with a place by his fire. The factor apparently suffered a stroke of apoplexy, which stroke was successful in reducing the blankets to two hundred and in cutting out the place by the fire, an unheard-of condition in the marriages of white men with the daughters of the soil. In the end, after three hours more of chaffering, 
they came to an agreement. For Lit Lit Snettishane was to receive one hundred blankets, five pounds of tobacco, three guns, and a bottle of rum, goodwill and best offices included, which, according to John Fox, was ten blankets and a gun more than she was worth. And as he went home through the wee small hours, the three o'clock sun blazing in the due northeast, he was unpleasantly aware that Snettishane had bested him over the bargain. Snettishane, tired and victorious, sought his bed and discovered Lit Lit before she could escape from the lodge. He grunted knowingly, "'Thou hast seen, thou hast heard, wherefore it be plain to thee thy father's very great wisdom and understanding. I have made for thee a great match. Heed my words, and walk in the way of my words. Go when I say go, come when I bid thee come, and we shall grow fat with the wealth of this big white man who is a fool according to his bigness.' The next day no trading was done at the store. The factor opened whiskey before breakfast, to the delight of McLean and McTavish, gave his dogs double rations, and wore his best moccasins. Outside the fort preparations were underway for a potlatch. Potlatch means a giving, and John Fox's intention was to signalize his marriage with Litlit by a potlatch as generous as she was good-looking. In the afternoon the whole tribe gathered to the feast. Men, women, children, and dogs gorged to repletion, nor was there one person, even among the chance visitors and stray hunters from other tribes, who failed to receive some token of the bridegroom's largesse. Lit Lit, tearfully shy and frightened, was bedecked by her bearded husband with a new calico dress, splendidly beaded moccasins, a gorgeous silk handkerchief over her raven hair, a purple scarf about her throat, brass earrings and finger rings, and a whole pint of pinchbeck jewelry, including a Waterbury watch. Snetishane could scarce contain himself at the spectacle, but watching his chance drew her aside from the feast. "'Not this night, nor the next night,' he began ponderously, "'but in the nights to come, when I shall call like a raven by the river bank, it is for thee to rise up from thy big husband, who is a fool, and come to me.' "'Nay, nay,' he went on hastily, at sight of the dismay in her face at turning her back upon her wonderful new life. "'For no sooner shall this happen than thy big husband, who is a fool, will come wailing to my lodge. Then it is for thee to wail likewise, claiming that this thing is not well, and that the other thing thou dost not like, and that to be the wife of the factor is more than thou didst bargain for, only wilt thou be content with more blankets and more tobacco and more wealth of various sorts for thy poor old father Snettishane. Remember well when I call in the night like a raven from the river bank. Lit Lit nodded, for to disobey her father was a peril she knew well, and furthermore it was a little thing he asked, a short separation from the factor, who would know only greater gladness at having her back. She returned to the feast, and, midnight being well at hand, the factor sought her out, and led her away to the fort amid joking and outcry, in which the squaws were especially conspicuous. Lit Lit quickly found that married life with the headman of a fort was even better than she had dreamed. No longer did she have to fetch wood and water and wait hand and foot upon cantankerous menfolk. For the first time in her life she could lie abed till breakfast was on the table. And what a bed! Clean and soft, and comfortable as no bed she had ever known. And such food! flour cooked into biscuits, hot cakes and bread, three times a day and every day, and all one wanted. Such prodigality was hardly believable. To add to her contentment, the factor was cunningly kind. He had buried one wife, and he knew how to drive with a slack rein that went firm only on occasion, and then went very firm. Lit Lit is boss of this place, he announced significantly at the table the morning after the wedding. What she says goes, understand? and McLean and McTavish understood. Also, they knew that the factor had a heavy hand. But Lit Lit did not take advantage. Taking a leaf from the book of her husband, she at once assumed charge of his own growing sons, giving them added comforts and a measure of freedom like to that which he gave her. The two sons were loud in the praise of their new mother. McLean and McTavish lifted their voices, and the factor bragged of the joys of matrimony till the story of her good behavior and her husband's satisfaction became the property of all the dwellers in the Sinrock district. Whereupon Snettishane, with visions of his incalculable interest keeping him awake of nights, thought it time to bestir himself. 
On the tenth night of her wedded life Lit Lit was awakened by the croaking of a raven, and she knew that Snettishane was waiting for her by the river bank. In her great happiness she had forgotten her pact, and now it came back to her with behind it all the childish terror of her father. For a time she lay in fear and trembling, loath to go, afraid to stay. But in the end the factor won the silent victory, and his kindness, plus his great muscles and square jaw, nerved her to disregard Snettishane's call. But in the morning she arose very much afraid, and went about her duties in momentary fear of her father's coming. As the day wore along, however, she began to recover her spirits. John Fox, soundly berating McLean and McTavish for some petty dereliction of duty, helped her to pluck up courage. She tried not to let him go out of her sight, and when she followed him into the huge cache and saw him twirling and tossing great bales around as though they were feather pillows, she felt strengthened in her disobedience to her father. Also, it was her first visit to the warehouse, and Sin Rock was the chief distributing point to several chains of lesser posts. She was astounded at the endlessness of the wealth there stored away. This sight and the picture in her mind's eye of the bare lodge of Snettishane put all doubts at rest. Yet she capped her conviction by a brief word with one of her stepsons. "'White Daddy good?' was what she asked and the boy answered that his father was the best man he had ever known. That night the raven croaked again. On the night following the croaking was more persistent. It awoke the factor, who tossed restlessly for a while. Then he said aloud, "'Damn that raven!' and Lit Lit laughed quietly under the blankets. In the morning, bright and early, Snettishane put in an ominous appearance, and was set to breakfast in the kitchen with Wanadani. He refused squaw food, and a little later bearded his son-in-law in the store where the trading was done. Having learned, he said, that his daughter was such a jewel, he had come for more blankets, more tobacco, and more guns, especially more guns. He had certainly been cheated in her price, he held, and he had come for justice. But the factor had neither blankets nor justice to spare. Whereupon he was informed that Snettishane had seen the missionary at Three Forks, who had notified him that such marriages were not made in heaven, and that it was his father's duty to demand his daughter back. "'I am good Christian man now,' Snettishane concluded. "'I want my lit-lit to go to heaven.' The factor's reply was short and to the point, for he directed his father-in-law to go to the heavenly antipodes, and by the scruff of the neck and the slack of the blanket propelled him on that trail as far as the door. But Snettishane sneaked around and in by the kitchen, cornering Lit-Lit in the great living-room of the fort. "'Mayhap thou didst sleep over sound last night when I called by the river-bank,' he began, glowering darkly. "'Nay, I was awake and heard.' Her heart was beating, as though it would choke her, but she went on steadily. "'And the night before I was awake and heard, and yet again the night before.' And thereat, out of her great happiness, and out of the fear that it might be taken from her, she launched into an original and glowing address upon the status and rights of woman, the first new woman lecture delivered north of fifty-three. But it fell on unheeding ears. Snettishane was still in the dark ages. As she paused for breath, he said threateningly, "'Tonight I shall call again like the raven.' At this moment the factor entered the room and again helped Snettishane on his way to the heavenly antipodes. That night the raven croaked more persistently than ever. Lit-Lit, who was a light sleeper, heard and smiled. John Fox tossed restlessly. Then he awoke and tossed about with greater restlessness. He grumbled and snorted, swore under his breath and over his breath, and finally flung out of bed. He groped his way to the great living room and from the rack took down a loaded shotgun, loaded with birdshot, left therein by the careless McTavish. The factor crept carefully out of the fort and down to the river. The croaking had ceased, but he stretched out in the long grass and waited. The air seemed a chilly balm, and the earth, after the heat of the day, now and again breathed soothingly against him. The factor, gathered into the rhythm of it all, dozed off, with his head upon his arm, and slept. Fifty yards away, head resting on knees, and with his back to John Fox, Snettishane likewise slept, gently conquered by the quietude of the night. An hour slipped by, and then he awoke, 
and, without lifting his head, set the night vibrating with the hoarse gutturals of the raven call. The factor roused, not with the abrupt start of civilized man, but with the swift and comprehensive glide from sleep to waking of the savage. In the nightlight he made out a dark object in the midst of the grass and brought his gun to bear upon it. A second croak began to rise, and he pulled the trigger. The crickets ceased from their sing-song chant, the wild fowl from their squabbling, and the raven croak broke midmost and died away in gasping silence. John Fox ran to the spot and reached for the thing he had killed, but his fingers closed on a coarse mop of hair, and he turned Snettishane's face upward to the starlight. He knew how a shotgun scattered at fifty yards, and he knew that he had peppered Snettishane across the shoulders and in the small of the back, and Snettishane knew that he knew, but neither referred to it. "'What dost thou here?' the factor demanded. "'It were time old Bones should be in bed!' But Snettishane was stately in spite of the bird-shot burning under his skin. "'Old Bones will not sleep,' he said solemnly. "'I weep for my daughter, for my daughter Litlit, who liveth and who yet is dead, and who goeth without doubt to the white man's hell.' "'Weep henceforth on the far bank beyond earshot of the fort,' said John Fox, turning on his heel. "'For the noise of thy weeping is exceeding great, and will not let one sleep of nights.' "'My heart is sore,' Snettishane answered, "'and my days and nights be black with sorrow.' "'As the raven is black,' said John Fox. "'As the raven is black,' Snettishane said. Never again was the voice of the raven heard by the riverbank. Lit-Lit grows matronly day by day and is very happy. Also, there are sisters to the sons of John Fox's first wife who lies buried in a tree. Old Snettishane is no longer a visitor at the fort, and spends long hours raising a thin, aged voice against the filial ingratitude of children in general, and of his daughter Lit-Lit in particular. His declining years are embittered by the knowledge that he was cheated— and even John Fox has withdrawn the assertion that the price for Litlit was too much by ten blankets and a gun. End of The Marriage of Litlit. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, July 2007. Section number seven. Battered of the Faith of Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott Battered by Jack London Battered was a devil. This was recognized throughout the Northland. Hell's Spawn, he was called by many men. But his master... Black Leclerc, chose for him the shameful name Battered. Now Black Leclerc was also a devil, and the twain were well matched. There is a saying that when two devils come together, hell is to pay. This is to be expected, and this certainly was to be expected when Battered and Black Leclerc came together. The first time they met, Battered was a part-grown puppy, lean and hungry, with bitter eyes, and they met with snap and snarl, and wicked looks. For Leclerc's upper lip had a wolfish way of lifting and showing the white, cruel teeth. And it lifted then, and his eyes gleamed viciously as he reached for Battered and dragged him out from the squirming litter. It was certain that they divined each other, for on the instant Battered had buried his puppy fangs in Leclerc's hand, and Leclerc, thumb and finger, was coolly choking his young life out of him. Sacre dame, the Frenchman said softly, flirting the quick blood from his bitten hand and gazing down on the little puppy, choking and gasping in the snow. Leclerc turned to John Hamlin, storekeeper of the Sixty Mile Post. Dat foe, what a I like em, I'll mock, I'll buy em, 
now, abayim queek. And because he hated him, with an exceeding bitter hate, Leclerc bought Battered, and gave him his shameful name. And for five years the twain adventured across the Northland, from St. Michael's and the Yukon Delta to the head reaches of the Pelly, and even so far as the Peace River, Athabasca and Great Slave. And they acquired a reputation for uncompromising wickedness, the like of which never before attached itself to man and dog. Battered did not know his father, hence his name, but, as John Hamlin knew, his father was a great gray timber wolf. But the mother of Battered, as he dimly remembered her, was snarling, bickering, obscene, husky, full-fronted, and heavy-chested, with a malign eye, a cat-like grip on life, and a genius for trickery and evil. There was neither faith nor trust in her. Her treachery alone could be relied upon, and her wild wood amours attested her general depravity. Much of evil and much of strength were there in these, battered's progenitors, and, bone and flesh, of their bone and flesh, he had inherited it all. And then came Black Leclerc, to lay his heavy hand on the bit of pulsating puppy life, to press and prod and mold till it became a big, bristling beast acute in knavery, overspilling with hate, sinister, malignant, diabolical. With a proper master, Batard may have made an ordinary, fairly efficient sled dog. He never got the chance. Leclerc but confirmed him in his congenital iniquity. The history of Batard and Leclerc is a history of war of five cruel, relentless years, of which their first meeting is fit summary. To begin with, it was Leclerc's fault, for he hated with understanding and intelligence, while the long-legged, ungainly puppy hated only blindly, instinctively, without reason or method. At first, there were no refinements of cruelty. These were to come later. But simple beatings and crude brutalities in one of these, Batard had an ear injured. He never regained control of the riven muscles, and ever after the ear drooped limply down to keep keen the memory of his tormentor, and he never forgot. His puppyhood was a period of foolish rebellion. He was always worsted, but he fought back because it was his nature to fight back and he was unconquerable, yelping shrilly from the pain of lash and club. He none the less contrived, always, to throw in the defiant snarl, the bitter vindictive menace of his soul, which fetched without fail more blows and beatings. But his was his mother's tenacious grip on life. Nothing could kill him. He flourished under misfortune grew fat with famine, and out of his terrible struggle for life developed a preternatural intelligence. His were the stealth and cunning of the husky, his mother, and the fierceness and valor of the wolf, his father. Possibly it was because of his father that he never wailed. His puppy yelps passed with his lanky legs, so that he became grim and taciturn, quick to strike, slow to warn. He answered curse with snarl, and blow with snap, grinning the while his implacable hatred, but never again, under the extremest agony, did Leclerc bring from him the cry of fear nor of pain. This unconquerableness but fanned Leclerc's wrath, and stirred him to great deviltries. Did Leclerc give Batard half a fish, and to his mates whole ones? Batard went forth to rob other dogs of their fish. Also, he robbed caches, and expressed himself in a thousand rogueries. 
till he became a terror to all dogs and masters of dogs. Did Leclerc beat Petard and fondle Babette? Babette, who was not half the worker he was? Why? Petard threw her down in the snow and broke her hind leg with his heavy jaws, so that Leclerc was forced to shoot her. Likewise, in bloody battles, Batard mastered all his teammates, set them the law of the trail and forage, and made them live to the law he set. In five years he heard but one kind word, received but one soft stroke of a hand, and then he did not know what matter of things they were. He leaped like the untamed thing he was, and his jaws were together in a flash. It was the missionary at sunrise, a newcomer in the country, who spoke the kind word and gave the soft stroke of the hand, and for six months after he wrote no letters home to the States, and the surgeon at McQuestion traveled two hundred miles on the ice to save him from blood poisoning. Men and dogs looked askance at Petard when he drifted into their camps and posts. The men greeted him with feet threateningly lifted for the kick, the dogs with bristling manes and bared fangs. Once a man did kick Petard, and Petard, with quick wolf snap, closed his jaws like a steel trap on the man's calf and crunched down to the bone, whereat the man was determined to have his life. Only Black Leclerc, with ominous eyes and naked hunting knife, stepped in between. The killing of Bittard, ah, sacred Dan, that was a pleasure Leclerc reserved for himself. Some day it would happen, or else, bah, who was to know? Anyway, the problem would be solved. For they had become problems to each other, the very breath each drew was a challenge and a menace to the other. Their hate bound them together as love could never bind. Leclerc was bent on coming of the day when Batard should wilt in spirit and cringe and whimper at his feet. And Batard, Leclerc knew what was in Batard's mind, and more than once had read it in Batard's eyes. And so clearly he had read that when Batard was at his back, he made it a point to glance often over his shoulder. Men marveled when Leclerc refused large money for the dog. Some day you'll kill him and be out his price, said John Hamilton once, when Batard lay panting in the snow where Leclerc had kicked him, and no one knew whether his ribs were broken, and no one dared look to see. That said Leclerc, dryly, that is my business, monsieur. And the men marveled that Batard did not run away. They did not understand, but Leclerc understood. He was a man who lived much in the open, beyond the sound of human tongue, and he had learned the voices of wind and storm, the sight of night, the whisper of dawn, the clash of day. In a dim way he could hear the green things growing, the running of the sap, the bursting of the bud, and he knew the subtle speech of things that moved, of the rabbit in the snare, the moody raven beating the air with hollow wing, the bald face shuffling under the moon, the wolf like a gray shadow gliding betwixt the twilight and the dark, and to him Batard spoke clear and direct. Full well he understood why Batard did not run away, and he looked more often over his shoulder. When in anger, Batard was not nice to look upon, and more than once had he leapt for Leclerc's throat, to be stretched quivering and senseless in the snow by the butt of the ever-ready dog whip and so Batard learned to bide his time. When he reached his full strength and prime of youth, he thought the time had come. He was broad-chested, powerfully muscled, of far more than ordinary size, and his neck, from head to shoulders, 
was a mass of bristling hair, to all appearances a full-blooded wolf. Leclerc was lying deep in his furs when Batard deemed the time to be ripe. He crept upon him stealthily, head low to earth, and lone ear laid back, with a feline softness of tread. Batard breathed gently, very gently, and not till he was close at hand did he raise his head. He paused for a moment, and looked at the bronzed bull-throat, naked and knotty, and swelling to a deep steady pulse. The slaver dripped down his fangs and slid off his tongue at the sight, and in that moment he remembered his drooping ear, his uncounted blows and prodigious wrongs, and without a sound sprang on the sleeping man. Leclerc awoke to the pang of the fangs in his throat, and, perfect animal that he was, he awoke clear-headed and with full comprehension. He closed on Petard's windpipe with both his hands and rolled out of his furs to get his weight uppermost. But the thousands of Petard's ancestors had clung at the throats of unnumbered moose and caribou and dragged them down. And the wisdom of those ancestors was his. When Leclerc's weight came on top of him, he drove his hind legs upwards and in, and clawed down chest and abdomen, ripping and tearing through skin and muscle, and when he felt the man's bloody wince above him and lift, he worried and shook at the man's throat. His teammates closed around in a snarling circle, and Batard, with failing breath and fading sense, knew that their jaws were hungry for him. But that did not matter. It was the man, the man above him, and he ripped and clawed and shook and worried to the last ounce of his strength. But Leclerc choked him with both his hands till Batard's chest heaved and writhed for the air denied, and his eyes glazed and set, and his jaws slowly loosened, and his tongue protruded black and swollen. "'Eh, Bon, you devil!' Leclerc gurgled, mouth and throat clogged with his own blood, and he shoved the dizzy dog from him, and then Leclerc cursed the other dogs off as they fell upon Batard. They drew back into a wider circle, squatting alertly on their haunches and licking their chops, the hair on every neck bristling and erect. Batard recovered quickly, and at the sound of Leclerc's voice, tottered to his feet and swayed weakly back and forth. Ah, you big devil, Leclerc sputtered. I fix you, I fix you plenty, by gar. Batard, the air biting into his exhausting lungs, like wine, flushed full into the man's face, his jaws missing and coming together with a metallic clip. They rolled over and over on the snow, Leclerc striking madly with his fists. Then they separated, face to face, and circled back and forth before each other. Leclerc could have drawn his knife, his rifle was at his feet, but the beast in him was up and raging. He would do the thing with his hands and his teeth. Batard sprang in, but Leclerc knocked him over with a blow of his fist, fell upon him, and buried his teeth to the bone in the dog's shoulder. It was a primordial setting and a primordial scene, such as might have been in the savage youth of the world, an open space in a dark forest, a ring of grinning wolf-dogs, and in the center two beasts, locked in combat, snapping and snarling, raging madly about, panting, sobbing, cursing, straining, wild with passion, in a fury of murder, ripping and tearing and clawing in elemental brutishness. But Leclerc caught Batard behind the ear with a blow from his fist, knocking him over, and, for the instant, stunning him. Then Leclerc leaped upon him with his feet. 
and sprang up and down, striving to grind him into the earth. Both Batard's hind legs were broken, ere Leclerc ceased that he might catch a breath. Ah, ah, he screamed, incapable of speaking, shaking his fist through sheer impotence of throat and larynx. But Batard was indomitable. He lay there in a helpless welter, his lip feebly lifting and ringing to the snarl he had not the strength to utter. Leclerc kicked him, and the tired jaws closed on the ankle, but could not break the skin. Leclerc picked up the whip and proceeded almost to cut him to pieces, and each stroke of the lash crying, Distame, I break you, eh, by gar, I break you. In the end, exhausted, fainting from loss of blood, he crumpled up and fell by his victim, and when the wolf dogs closed in to take their vengeance, with his last consciousness, dragged his body on top of Batard to shield him from their fangs. This occurred not far from sunrise, and the missionary, opening the door to Leclerc a few hours later, was surprised to note the absence of Batard from the team, nor did his surprise lessen when Leclerc threw back the robes from the sled, gathered Batard into his arms, and staggered across the threshold. It happened that the surgeon of McQuestion, who was something of a gadabout, was up on gossip, and between them they proceeded to repair Leclerc. Merci non, he said. Do you fix fares, de dog, to die? Non, it is not good, because he ma must yet break. That foe, what he must not die. The surgeon called it a marvel, the missionary a miracle, that Leclerc pulled through it all, and so weakened was he, that in the spring the fever got him, and he went on his back again. Batard had been in even worse plight, but his grip on life prevailed, and the bones of his hind legs knit, and his organs righted themselves. During the several weeks he lay strapped to the floor, and by the time Leclerc, finally convalescent, shallow and shaky, took to the sun by the cabin door, Batard had reasserted his supremacy among his kind, and brought not only his own teammates, but the missionary's dogs into subjection. He moved never a muscle, nor twitched a hair, when, for the first time, Leclerc tottered out on the missionary's arm and sank down slowly, with infinite caution, on the three-legged stool. Bon, he said, bon, de good son, and he stretched out his wasted hands and washed them in the warmth. Then his gaze fell on the dog, and the old light blazed back in his eyes. He touched the missionary lightly on the arm. Mon Perry, that is one big devil, that petard. You will bring me one pistol, so that I drink de sun in peace. And thenceforth, for many days, he sat in the sun before the cabin door. He never dozed, and the pistol lay always across his knees. Batard had a way, the first thing, each day, of looking for the weapon in its wonted place. At sight of it, he would lift his lip faintly, in token, that he understood, and Leclerc would lift his own lip in an answering grin. One day, the missionary took note of the trick. "'Bless me,' he said. "'I really believe the brute comprehends.' Leclerc laughed softly. Look you, mon pere, dat what I now spike, to dat does he listen. As if in confirmation, Batard, just perceptibly, wriggled his lone ear up to catch the sound. I say keel. Batard growled deep in his throat. The hair bristled along his neck, and every muscle went tense and expectant. I lift a gun, so like that, and suiting action to word, he sighted the pistol at Batard. 
Batard, with a single leap sideways, landed around the corner of the cabin, out of sight. Bless me, he repeated at intervals. Leclerc grinned proudly. But why does he not run away? The Frenchman's shoulders went up in the racial shrug that means all things from total ignorance to infinite understanding. Then why do you not kill him? And the shoulders went up. Mon Perry, he said after a pause, detain is not yet. He is one big devil. Some tame I break him, so an, so all, to little bits. Hey, some tame, bon? A day came when Leclerc gathered his dogs together and floated down in a bateau to Forty Mile, and on to the Porcupine, where he took a commission from the P.C. Company, and went exploring for the better part of a year. After that, he pulled up the Koya Cuck to deserted Arctic City, and later came drifting back from camp to camp along the Yukon, and during the long months, Batard was well lessened. He learned many tortures, and notably the torture of hunger, the torture of thirst, the torture of fire, and worst of all, the torture of music. Like the rest of his kind, he did not enjoy music. It gave him exquisite anguish, racking him nerve by nerve, and ripping apart every fiber of his being. It made him howl, long and wolf-like, as when the wolves bay the stars on frosty nights. He could not help howling. It was his one weakness in the contest with Leclerc, and it was his shame. Leclerc, on the other hand, passionately loved music, as passionately as he loved strong drink, and when his soul clamored for expression, it usually uttered itself in one or the other of the two ways, and more usually in both ways. And when he drank his brain a lilt with unsung song, the devil in him arose and rampant. His soul found its supreme utterance in torturing Batard. Now we will have a little music, he would say. Eh, what you think, Batard? It was only an old and battered harmonica, tenderly treasured and patiently repaired, but it was the best that money could buy, and out of its silver reeds he drew weird, vagrant airs that men had never heard before. Then Batard, dumb of throat, with teeth tight clenched, would back away, inch by inch, to the farthest cabin corner, and Leclerc, playing, playing, a stout club, tucked under his arm, followed the animal up, inch by inch, step by step, till there was no further retreat. At first, Batard would crowd himself in the smallest possible space, groveling close to the floor, but as the music came nearer and nearer, he was forced to uprear, his back jammed into the logs, his forelegs fanning the air, as though to beat off the rippling waves of sound. He still kept his teeth together, but severe muscular contractions attacked his body, strange twitchings and jerkings, till he was all a quiver, and writhing in silent torment. As he lost control, his jaws spasmodically wrenched apart, and deep, throaty vibrations issued forth, too low in the register of sound for human ear to catch, and then nostrils distended, eyes dilated, hair bristling, in helpless rage, arose the long wolf howl. It came with a slurring rush upwards, swelling to a great heart-breaking burst of sound, and dying away in sadly cadenced woe. Then the next rush upward, octave upon octave, the bursting heart, and the infinite sorrow, and misery, fainting, fading, falling, and dying slowly away. It was fit for hell, and Leclerc, with fiendish keen, seemed to divine each particular note and heartstring, and with long wails and tremblings, and sobbing minors, 
to make it yield up its last shred of grief. It was frightful, and for twenty-four hours after, Batard was nervous and unstrung, starting at common sounds, tripping over his own shadow, but withal vicious and masterful with his teammates. Nor did he show signs of breaking spirit. Rather did he grow more grim and taciturn, biding his time with an inscrutable patience that began to puzzle and weigh upon Leclerc. The dog would lie in the firelight, motionless for hours, gazing straight before him at Leclerc, and hating him with his bitter eyes. Often the man felt that he had bucked against the very essence of life, the unconquerable essence that swept the hawk down out of the sky like a feathered thunderbolt that drove the great gray goose across the zones that hurled the spawning salmon through two thousand miles of boiling Yukon flood. At such times he felt impelled to express his own unconquerable essence, and with strong drink, wild music, and batard, he indulged in vast orgies, wherein he pitted his puny strength in the face of things, and challenged all that was, and had been, and was yet to be. There is something there, he affirmed, when the rhythmed vagarities of his mind touched the secret chords of Batard's being, and brought forth the long, lugubrious howl. A poulet, a poulet, out with bot, my hands, so and so, ha ha, at his phone, at his ver phone, de priest chant, de woman's pray, de man swear, de little bird go peep peep, Batard, him go yow yow, and at his all, de ver same thing, ha ha. Father Gautier, a worthy priest, once reproved him with instances of concrete perdition. He never reproved him again. It may be so, Mon Pierre, he made answer, and I think I go true hella snapping, like the hemlock tro de fire. Eh, Mon Pierre? But all bad things come to an end as well as good, and so, with Black Leclerc, on the summer low water, in a poiling boat, he left MacDougall for sunrise. He left MacDougall in company with Timothy Brown and arrived at sunrise by himself. Further, it was known that they had quarreled just previous to pulling out, for the Lizzie, a wheezy ten-ton steer-wheeler, twenty-four hours behind him, beat Leclerc in by three days. And when he did get in, it was with a clean-drilled bullet hole through his shoulder muscle and a tale of ambush and murder. A strike had been made at sunrise, and things had changed considerably. With the infusion of several hundred gold-seekers, a deal of whiskey, and a half-dozen equipped gamblers, the missionary had seen the page of his years of labor with the Indians wiped clean. When the squaws became preoccupied with cooking beans and keeping the fire going for the wifeless miners, and the bucks with swapping their warm furs for the black bottles and broken timepieces, he took to his bed, said, Bless me, several times, and departed to his final accounting in a rough-hewn oblong box. Whereupon the gamblers moved their roulette and fargo tables into the mission house, and the click of chips and clink of glasses went up from dawn till dark and to dawn again. Now Timothy Brown was well beloved among these adventurers of the North. The one thing against him was his quick temper and ready fist, a little thing, for which his kind heart and forgiving hand more than atoned. On the other hand, there was nothing to atone for Black Leclerc. He was black. As more than one remembered, deed bore witness. He was as well hated as the other was beloved. So the men of Sunrise put
put an antiseptic dressing on his shoulder and hauled him before Judge Lynch. It was a simple affair. He had quarreled with Timothy Brown at MacDougall. With Timothy Brown, he had left MacDougall. Without Timothy Brown, he had arrived at sunrise. Considered in the light of his evilness, the unanimous conclusion was that he had killed Timothy Brown. On the other hand, Leclerc acknowledged their facts, but challenged their conclusion, and gave his own explanation. Twenty miles out of sunrise, he and Timothy Brown were poling the boat along the rocky shore. From that shore, two rifle shots rang out. Timothy Brown pitched out of the boat and went down bubbling red, and that was the last of Timothy Brown. He, Leclerc, pitched into the bottom of the boat with a stinging shoulder. He lay very quiet, peeping at the shore. After a time, two Indians stuck up their heads and came out to the water's edge, carrying between them a birch bark canoe. As they launched it, Leclerc let fly. He potted one who went over the side after the manner of Timothy Brown. The other dropped into the bottom of the canoe, and then canoe and poling boat went down the stream in a drifting battle. After that, they hung up on a split current, and the canoe passed on one side of an island, and the poling boat on the other. That was the last of the canoe, and he came into sunrise. Yes, from the way the Indian in the canoe jumped, he was sure he had potted him. That was all. This explanation was not deemed adequate. They gave him ten hours' grace, while the Lizzie steamed down to investigate. Ten hours later, she came wheezing back to sunrise. There had been nothing to investigate. No evidence had been found to back up his statements. They told him to make his will, for he possessed a $50,000 sunrise claim, and they were a law-abiding as well as a law-giving breed. Leclerc shrugged his shoulders. But one thing, he said, a little what you call a favor, a little favor, that is that. I give my fifty thousand dollar to the church. I give my husky dog, Batard, to the devil. De little favor, fears you hang him, and Dan, you hang me. It is good, eh? Good it was, they agreed that Hell's spawn should break trail for his master across the last divide, and the court was adjourned down to the river bank, where a big spruce tree stood by itself. Slackwater Charlie put a hangman's knot in the end of a hauling line, and the noose was slipped over Leclerc's head and pulled tight around his neck. His hands were tied behind his back, and he was assisted to the top of a cracker box. Then the running end of the line was passed over an overhanging branch, drawn taut and made fast. To kick the box out from under would leave him dancing on the air. Now for the dog, said Webster Shaw, sometime mining engineer. You'll have to rope him, Slackwater. Leclerc grinned. Slackwater took a chew of tobacco, rove a running noose, and proceeded leisurely to coil a few turns in his hand. He paused once or twice to brush particularly offensive mosquitoes from off his face. Everybody was brushing mosquitoes except Leclerc, about whose head a small cloud was visible. Even Batard, lying full-stretched on the ground with his forepaws, rubbed the pests away from his eyes and mouth. But while Slackwater waited for Batard to lift his head, a faint call came from the quiet air, and a man was seen waving his arms and running across the flat from sunrise. It was the storekeeper. Call her off, boys, he panted as he came in among them. Little Sandy and Bernadette just got back in, he explained with returning breath. Landed down below and come up by the shortcut. Got the beaver with him, picked him up in his canoe, stuck in a back channel, with a couple of bullet holes in him. Other buck was clock clothes, the one that knocked spots out of his squaw and dusted. Eh, what? Eh, say? Eh? 
Leclerc cried exultantly. Dat de one, fo sho. I know, I spike true. The thing to do is to teach these damned shishwashies a little manners, spoke Webster Shaw. They're getting fat and sassy, and we'll have to bring em down a peg. Round in all the bucks and string up the beaver for an object lesson. That's the program. Come on, let's see what he's got to say for himself. Hey, monsieur, Leclerc called, as the crowd began to melt away through the twilight in the direction of sunrise. I like very much to see de fond. Oh, we'll turn you loose when we come back, Webster Shaw shouted over his shoulder. In the meantime, meditate on your sins and the ways of providence. It will do you good, so be grateful. As is the way with men who are accustomed to great hazards, whose nerves are healthy and trained in patience, so it was with Leclerc, who settled himself to the long wait, which is to say that he reconciled his mind to it. There was no settling of the body, for the taut rope forced him to stand rigidly erect. The least relaxation of the leg muscle pressed the rough-fibred noose into his neck, while the upright position caused him much pain in his wounded shoulder. He projected his upper lip and expelled his breath upwards along his face to blow the mosquitoes away from his eyes. But the situation had its compensation. To be snatched from the maw of death was well worth a little bodily suffering, only it was unfortunate that he should miss the hanging of the beaver. And so he mused till his eyes chanced to fall upon Batard, head between forepaws, and stretched on the ground asleep. And there Leclerc ceased to muse. He studied the animal closely, striving to sense if the sleep were real or feigned. Batard's sides were heaving regularly, but Leclerc felt that the breath came and went a shade too quickly. Also, he felt that there was a vigilance or alertness to every hair that belied unshackling sleep. He would have given his sunrise claim to be assured that the dog was not awake, and once, when one of his joints creaked, he looked quickly and guiltily at Batard to see if he roused. He did not rouse, but a few minutes later he got up slowly and lazily, stretched, and looked carefully about him. Sacred dam, said Leclerc under his breath, assured that no one was in sight or hearing. Batard sat down, curled his upper lip almost into a smile, looked up at Leclerc, and licked his chops. I see my finish, the man said, and laughed sardonically aloud. Batard came nearer, the useless ear wobbling, the good ear cocked forward with devilish comprehension. He thrust his head on one side, quizzically, and advanced with menacing playful steps. He rubbed his body gently against the box, till it shook and shook again. Leclerc teetered carefully to maintain his equilibrium. Batard, he said calmly, Look out! I kill you! Batard snarled at the word, and shook the box with greater force. Then he upreared, and with his forepaws threw his weight against it higher up. Leclerc kicked out with one foot, but the rope bit into his neck and choked so abruptly as nearly to overbalance him. Haya, chook, mush on, he screamed. Batard retreated for twenty feet or so, with a fiendish levity in his bearing that Leclerc would not mistake. He remembered the dog often breaking the scum of ice on the water hole by lifting up and throwing his weight upon it, and remembering he understood what he now had in mind. Batard faced about and paused. He showed his white teeth in a grin, which Leclerc answered, and then hurled his body through the air in full charge straight for the box. Fifteen minutes later, Slackwater Charlie and Webster Shaw returning, 
caught a glimpse of a ghostly pendulum swinging back and forth in the dim light. As they hurriedly drew in closer, they made out the man's inert body and a live thing that clung to it and shook and worried and gave to it the swaying motion. Hiya, chook, you spawn of hell, yelled Webster Shaw, but Battered glared at him and snarled threateningly without loosening his jaws. Slackwater Charlie got out his revolver, but his hand was shaking as with a chill, and he fumbled. Here, you take it, he said, passing the weapon over. Webster Shaw laughed shortly, drew a sight between the gleaming eyes, and pressed the trigger. Batard's body twitched with the shock, threshed the ground spasmodically for a moment, and went suddenly limp. But his teeth still held fast and locked. End of Batard by Jack London Read by Robert Scott, June the 28th, 2007section eight the story of jees ak part one of the faith of men this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by m l cohen cleveland ohio june two thousand and seven the story of jees ak part one by jack london there have been renunciations and renunciations. But in its essence, renunciation is ever the same. And the paradox of it is that men and women forego the dearest thing in the world for something dearer. It was never otherwise. Thus it was when Abel bought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The firstlings and the fat thereof were to him the dearest things in the world yet he gave them over that he might be on good terms with God. So it was with Abraham when he prepared to offer up his son Isaac on a stone. Isaac was very dear to him, but God, in incomprehensible ways, was yet dearer. It may be that Abraham feared the Lord, but whether that be true or not, it has since been determined by a few billion people that he loved the Lord and desired to serve him. And since it has been determined that love is service, and since to renounce is to serve, then Jees Uck, who was merely a woman of swart skin breed, loved with a great love. She was unversed in history, having learned to read only the signs of weather and of game. So she had never heard of Abel nor of Abraham, nor, having escaped the good sisters at Holy Cross, had she been told the story of Ruth, the Moabitess, who renounced her very God for the sake of a stranger woman from a strange land. Jesus had learned only one way of renouncing, and that was with the club as the dynamic factor, in much the same manner as a dog is made to renounce a stolen marrow bone. Yet, when the time came, she proved herself capable of rising to the height of the fair-faced royal races and of renouncing in right regal fashion. So this is the story of Jesus which is also the story of Neil Bonner and Kitty Bonner and a couple of Neil Bonner's progeny. Jizak was of a swart skin breed, it is true, but she was not an Indian, nor was she an Eskimo, nor even an Inuit. Going backward into mouth tradition, there appears the figure of one Skulls, a Toyat Indian of the Yukon, who journeyed down in his youth to the great delta where dwell the Inuits, and where he foregathered with a woman remembered as Olili. Now the woman Olili had been bred from an Eskimo mother by an Inuit man, and from Skulls and Olili came Haley, who was one half Toyat Indian, one quarter Inuit, and one quarter Eskimo. And Haley was the grandmother of Jees Uk. Now Haley, in whom three stocks had been bastardized, who cherished no prejudice against further admixture, made it with a Russian fur trader called Spak, also known in his time as the Big Fat. Spak is here in class Russian for lack of a more adequate term, for Spak's father, a Slavonic convict from the lower provinces, 
had escaped from the quicksilver mines into northern Siberia, where he knew Zimba, who was a woman of the deer people, and who became the mother of Spak, who became the grandfather of Jees Uck. Now had not Spak been captured in his boyhood by the sea people, who fringed the rim of the Arctic Sea with their mystery, he would have not have become the grandfather of Jees Uck, and there would be no story at all. But he was captured by the sea people, from whom he escaped to Kamchatka, and thence on a Norwegian whale ship to the Baltic. Not long after that he turned up in St. Petersburg, and the years were not many till he went drifting east over the same weary road his father had measured with blood and groans a half-century before. But Spack was a free man, in the employ of the great Russian fur company, and in that employ he fared farther and farther east, until he crossed the Bering Sea into Russian America, and at Pastolik, which is hard by the great delta of the Yukon, became the husband of Haley, who was the grandmother of Jees Uck. Out of this union came the woman-child Tukasan. Spack, under the orders of the company, made a canoe voyage of a few hundred miles up the Yukon to the post of Nulato. With him he took Haley and the babe Tukasan. It was in 1850, and in 1850 it was that the river Indians fell upon Nulato and wiped it from the face of the earth. And that was the end of Spack and Haley. On that terrible night, Tukasan disappeared. To this day, the Toyats aver they had no hand in the trouble. But, be that as it may, the fact remains that the babe Tukasan grew up among them. Tukasan was married successively to two Toyat brothers to both of whom she was barren. Because of this, other women shook their heads, and no third Toyat man could be found to dare matrimony with the childless widow. But at this time, many hundred miles above, at Fort Yukon, was a man, Spike O'Brien. Fort Yukon was a Hudson Bay Company post, and Spike O'Brien one of the company's servants. He was a good servant, but he achieved an opinion that the service was bad, and in the course of time vindicated that opinion by deserting. It was a year's journey by the chain of posts back to York Factory on Hudson Bay. Further, being company posts, he knew he could not evade the company's clutches. Nothing retained but to go down the Yukon. It was true no white man had ever gone down the Yukon, and no white man knew whether the Yukon emptied into the Arctic Ocean or Bering Sea. But Spike O'Brien was a Celt, and the promise of danger was a lure he had ever followed. A few weeks later, somewhat battered, rather famished, and about dead with river fever, he drove the nose of his canoe into the earth bank by the village of the Toyats, and promptly fainted away. While getting his strength back, in the weeks that followed he looked upon Tukasan and found her good. Like the father of Spak, who lived to the ripe old age among the Siberian deer people, Spike O'Brien might have left his aged bone with the Toyats. But romance gripped his heartstrings and would not let him stay. As he had journeyed from York Factory to Fort Yukon, so, first among men, might he journey from Fort Yukon to the sea and win the honor of being the first man to make the Northwest Passage by land. So he departed down the river, won the honor, and was unannalled and unsung. In after years, he ran a sailor's boarding house in San Francisco, where he became esteemed a most remarkable liar by virtue of the gospel truths he told. But a child was born to Tukasan, who had been childless, and this child was Jees Uck. Her lineage has been traced at length to show that she was neither Indian, nor Eskimo, nor Inuit, nor much of anything else, also to show what waifs of the generations we are, all of us and the strange meanderings of the seed from which we spring. What with the vagrant blood in her, and the heritage compounded of many races, Jizuk developed a wonderful young beauty. Bizarre perhaps it was, and oriental enough to puzzle any passing ethnologist. A lithe and slender grace characterized her. Beyond the quickened lilt to the imagination, the contribution of the Celt was in no wise apparent. It might possibly have put the warm blood under her skin, which made her face less swart and her body fairer. But that in turn might have come from Spack, the big fat, who inherited the color of his Slavonic father. And finally, she had great blazing black eyes, the half-cast eye, round, full-orbed, and sensuous, 
which marks the collision of the dark races with the light. Also, the white blood in her, combined with her knowledge that it was in her, made her in a way ambitious. Otherwise, by upbringing and an outlook on life, she was wholly and utterly a Toyot Indian. One winter, when she was a young woman, Neil Bonner came into her life. But he came into her life as he had come into the country somewhat reluctantly. In fact, it was very much against his will coming into the country. Between a father who clipped coupons and cultivated roses, and a mother who loved the social round, Neil Bonner had gone rather wild. He was not vicious, but a man with meat in his belly and without work in the world has to expend his energy somehow, and Neil Bonner was such a man. And he expended his energy in such a fashion, and to such an extent that when the inevitable climax came, his father, Neil Bonner, Sr., crawled out of his roses in a panic and looked on his son with a wondering eye. Then he hired himself away to a crony of kindred pursuits, with whom he was wont to confer over coupons and roses, and between the two, the destiny of young Neil Bonner was made manifest. He must go away on probation to live down his harmless follies in order that he might live up to their own excellent standard. This determined upon, and young Neil a little repentant and a great deal ashamed, the rest was easy. The cronies were heavy stockholders in the P.C. Company. The P.C. Company owned fleets of river steamers and ocean-going craft, and in addition to farming the sea, exploited a hundred thousand square miles or so of the land that, on the maps of the geographers, usually occupies the white spaces. So the P.C. Company sent young Neil Bonner north, where the white spaces are, to do its work and to learn to be good like his father. Five years of simplicity close to the soil and far from temptation will make a man of him, said old Neil Bonner, and forthwith crawled back among his roses. Young Neil set his jaw, pitched his chin at the proper angle, and went to work. As an underling he did his work well and gained the commendation of his superiors. Not that he delighted in the work, but that it was the one thing that prevented him from going mad. The first year he wished he was dead. The second year he cursed God. The third year he was divided between the two emotions, and in the confusion quarreled with the man in authority. He had the best of the quarrel, though the man in authority had the last word, a word that sent Neil Bonner into an exile that made his own billet appear as paradise. But he went without a whimper, for the North had succeeded in making him into a man. Here and there, on the white spaces on the map, Little circlets, like the letter O, are to be found, and appended to these circlets, on one side or the other, are names such as Fort Hamilton, Yanana Station, Twenty Mile, thus leading one to imagine that the white spaces are plentifully besprinkled with towns and villages. But it is a vain imagining. Twenty Mile, which is very like the rest of the posts, is a log building the size of a corner grocery with rooms to let upstairs. A long-legged cachet on stilts may be found in the backyard, also a couple of outhouses. The backyard is unfenced and extends to the skyline in an unascertainable bit beyond. There are no other houses in sight, though the Toyots sometimes pitch a winter camp a mile or two down the Yukon. And this is Twenty Mile, one tentacle of the many-tentacled PC Company. Here the agent, with an assistant, barters with the Indians for their furs, and does an erratic trade on gold dust basis with the wandering miners. Here also, the agent and his assistant yearn all winter for the spring, and when spring comes, camp blasphemously on the roof while the Yukon washes out the establishment. And here also, in the fourth year of a sojourn in the land, came Neil Bonner to take charge. He had displaced no agent, for the man that previously ran the post had made away with himself. Because of the rigors of the place, said the assistant, who still remained, though the Toyats by their friars had another version. The assistant was a shrunken-shouldered, hollow-chested man, with a cadaverous face and cavernous cheeks that his sparse black beard could not hide. He coughed much, as though consumption gripped his lungs, while his eyes had that mad, fevered light common to consumptives in the last stage. Pentley was his name, Amos Pentley, and Bonner did not like him though he felt a pity for the forlorn and hopeless devil. They did not get along together, these two men who, of all men, 
should have been on good terms in the face of the cold and silence and darkness of the long winter. In the end, Bonner concluded that Amos was partly demented and left him alone, doing all the work himself except the cooking. Even then, Amos had nothing but bitter looks and an undisguised hatred for him. This was a great loss to Bonner, for the smiling face of one of his own kind, the cheery word, the sympathy of comradeship shared with misfortune, these things meant much, and the winter was yet young when he began to realize the added reasons with such an assistant that the previous agent has found to impel his own hand against his life. It was very lonely at Twenty Mile. The bleak fastness stretched away on every side to the horizon. The snow, which was really frost, flung its mantle over the land and buried everything in the silence of death. For days it was clear and cold, the thermometer steadily recording forty to fifty degrees below zero. Then a change came over the face of things. What little moisture had oozed into the atmosphere gathered into dull gray, formless clouds. It became quite warm, the thermometer rising to twenty below, and the moisture fell out of the sky in harsh frost granules that hissed like dry sugar or driving sand when kicked underfoot. After that it became clear and cold again, until enough moisture had gathered to blanket the earth from the cold of outer space. That was all. Nothing happened. No storms, no churning waters and thrusting forests, nothing but the machine-like precipitation of accumulated moisture. Possibly the most notable thing that occurred through the weary weeks was this gliding of the temperature up to the unprecedented height of fifteen below. To atone for this, outer space smote the earth with its cold till the mercury froze and the spirit thermometer remained more than seventy below for a fortnight, when it burst. There was no telling how much colder it was after that. Another occurrence, monotonous and regularity, was the lengthening of the night, till day became a mere blink of light between the darkness. Neil Bonner was a social animal. The very follies for which he was doing penance had been bred of his excessive sociability. And here, in the fourth year of his exile, he found himself in company, which were to travesty the word, with a morose and speechless creature in whose somber eye smoldered a hatred as bitter as it was unwarranted. And Bonner, to whom speech and fellowship were as the breath of life, went about as a ghost might go, tantalized by the gregarious revelries of some former life. In the days his lips were compressed, his face stern, but in the night he clenched his hands, rolled about in his blankets, and cried aloud like a little child. And he would remember a certain man in authority and curse him through the long hours. Also, he cursed God. But God understands. He cannot find it in his heart to blame the weak mortals who blaspheme in Alaska. And here, to the post of Twenty Mile, came Jee's Uck, to trade for flour and bacon and beads and bright scarlet claws for her fancy work. And further, and unwittingly, she came to the post of Twenty Mile, to make a lonely man more lonely, make him reach out empty arms in his sleep. For Neil Bonner was only a man. When she first came into the store, he looked at her long, as a thirsty man might look at a flowing well. And she, with the heritage bequeathed to her by Spike O'Brien, imagined daringly and smiled up into his eyes, not as the Swartzkin people should smile at the royal races, but as a woman smiles at a man. The thing was inevitable, only he did not see it, and fought against her as fiercely and passionately as he was drawn towards her. And she? She was Jizuk, by upbringing wholly and utterly a Toyat Indian woman. End of The Story of Jizuk Part 1「
The Story of Jeezuck, Part 2, by Jack London. She came often to the post to trade, and often she sat by the big wood stove and chatted in broken English with Neil Bonner. And he came to look for her coming, and on the day she did not come, he was worried and restless. Sometimes he stopped to think, and then she was met coldly, with a resolve that perplexed and piqued her, and which she was convinced was not sincere. But more often he did not dare to think, and then all went well and there were smiles and laughter. And Amos Pentley, gasping like a stranded catfish, his hollow cough a reek with the grave, looked upon it all and grinned. He, who loved life, could not live, and it rankled his soul that others should be able to live. Wherefore he hated Bonner, who was so very much alive and into his eyes sprang joy at the sight of Jeezuck. As for Amos, the very thought of the girl was sufficient to send his blood pounding up into a hemorrhage. Jeezuck, whose mind was simple, who thought elementally and was unused to weighing life in its subtler quantities, read Amos Pentley like a book. She warned Bonner, openly and bluntly, in few words. But the complexity of higher existence confused the situation to him, and he laughed at her evident anxiety. To him, Amos was a poor, miserable devil, tottering desperately into the grave. And Bonner, who had suffered much, found it easy to forgive greatly. But one morning, during a bitter snap, he got up from the breakfast table and went into the store. Jeezuck was already there, rosy from the trail to buy a sack of flour. A few minutes later, he was out in the snow lashing the flour on her sled. As he bent over, he noticed a stiffness in his neck and felt a premonition of impending physical misfortune. As he put the last half hitch into the lashing and attempted to straighten up, a quick spasm seized him and he sank into the snow. Tense and quivering, head jerked back, limbs extended, back arched, and mouth twisted and distorted, he appeared as though being racked limb from limb. Without cry or sound, Jeezuck was in the snow beside him, but he clutched both her wrists spasmodically, and as long as the convulsion endured, she was helpless. In a few minutes, the spasm relaxed, and he was left weak and fainting, his forehead beaded with sweat, his lips flecked with foam. Quick, he muttered in a strange hoarse voice, quick, inside! He started to crawl on his hands and knees, but she raised him up, and supported by her young arm, he made faster progress. As he entered the store, the spasm seized him again, and his body writhed irresistibly away from her and rolled and curled on the floor. Amos Pentley came and looked on with curious eyes. Oh, Amos, she cried in an agony of apprehension and helplessness. Him die, you think? But Amos shrugged his shoulders and continued to look on. Bonner's body went slack the tense muscles easing down and an expression of relief coming into his face. Quick, he gritted between his teeth, his mouth twisting with the oncoming of the next spasm and with his effort to control it. Quick, Jeezuck, the medicine, never mind, drag me. She knew where the medicine chest stood, at the rear of the room beyond the stove, and thither by the legs she dragged the struggling man. As the spasm passed, he began, very faint and very sick to overhaul the chest. He had seen dogs die, exhibiting similar symptoms to his own, and he knew what should be done. He held up a vial of chloral hydrate, but his fingers were too weak and nerveless to draw the cork. This Jeezuck did for him, while he was plunged into another convulsion. As he came out of it, he found the open bottle proffered him, and looked into the great black eyes of the woman, and read what men have always read in Mate women's eyes. Taking a full dose of the stuff, he sank back until another spasm had passed. Then he raised himself limply on his elbow. Listen, Jeezuck he said very slowly, as though aware of the necessity for haste and yet afraid to hasten. Do what I say. Stand by my side, but do not touch me. I must be very quiet, but you must not go away. His jaw began to set and his face to quiver and distort with the forerunning pangs, but he gulped and struggled to master them. Do not go away, and do not let Amos go away. Understand? Amos must stay right here. She nodded her head and he passed off into the first of many convulsions, which gradually diminished in force and frequency. Jeezuck hung over him, remembering his injunction and not daring to touch him. Once Amos grew restless and made as though to go into the kitchen, but a quick blaze from her eyes quelled him, and after that, save for his labored breathing and charnel cough, 
he was very quiet. Bonner slept. The blink of light that marked the day disappeared. Amos, followed about by the woman's eyes, lighted the kerosene lamps. Evening came on. Through the north window the heavens were emblazoned with an auroral display, which flamed and flared and died down into blackness. Some time after that, Neil Bonner roused. First he looked to see that Amos was still here, then smiled at Jesuck and pulled himself up. Every muscle was stiff and sore, and he smiled ruefully, pressing and prodding himself as if to ascertain the extent of the ravage. Then his face went stern and businesslike. Jesuck, he said, take a candle, go into the kitchen. There is food on the table, biscuits and beans and bacon, also coffee in the pot on the stove. Bring it here on the counter. Also, bring tumblers and water and whiskey, which you will find on the top shelf of the locker. Do not forget the whiskey. Having swallowed a stiff glass of the whiskey, he went carefully through the medicine chest, now and again putting aside with definite purpose certain bottles and vials. Then he set to work on the food, attempting a crude analysis. He had not been unused to the laboratory in his college days, and was possessed of sufficient imagination to achieve results with his limited materials. The condition of tetanus, which had marked his paroxysm, simplified matters, and he made but one test. The coffee yielded nothing, nor did the beans. To the biscuits he devoted the utmost care. Amos, who knew nothing of chemistry, looked on with steady curiosity. But Jesuck, who had boundless faith in the white man's wisdom, and especially in Neil Bonner's wisdom, and who not only knew nothing but knew that she knew nothing, watched his face rather than his hands. Step by step he eliminated possibilities until he came to the final test. He was using a thin medicine vial for a tube, and this he held between him and the light, watching the slow precipitation of a salt through the solution contained in the tube. He said nothing, but saw what he had expected to see. And Jesuck, her eyes riveted on his face, saw something too. Something that made her spring like a tigress upon Amos, and with splendid suppleness and strength bend his body back across her knee. Her knife was out of its sheath and uplifted, glinting in the lamplight. Amos was snarling, but Bonner intervened ere the blade could fall. That's a good girl, Jesuck, but never mind. Let him go. She dropped the man obediently, though with protest writ large on her face, and his body thudded to the floor. Bonner nudged him with his moccasin foot. Get up, Amos, he commanded. You've got to pack an outfit yet tonight and hit the trail. You don't mean to say, Amos blurted savagely. I mean to say that you tried to kill me, Neil went on in a cold, even tone. I mean to say that you killed Birdsall for all the company believes he killed himself. You used Strickland in my case. God knows what you fixed him. Now I can't hang you. You're too near dead as it is. But twenty miles is too small for the pair of us, and you've got the mush. It's two hundred miles to Holy Cross. You can make it if you're careful not to overexert. I'll give you grub, a sled, and three dogs. You'll be as safe as if you were in jail, for you can't get out of the country. And I'll give you one chance. You're almost dead. Very well. I shall send no word to the company until the spring. In the meantime, the thing for you to do is die. Now mush! You go to bed, Jesuck insisted when Amos had churned away into the night towards Holy Cross. You sick man yet, Neil. And you're a good girl, Jesuck, he answered, and here's my hand on it. But you must go home. You don't like me, she said simply. He smiled, helped her on with her parka, and led her to the door. Only too well, Jesuck, he said softly. Only too well. After that, the pall of the Arctic night fell deeper and blacker on the land. Neil Bonner discovered that he had failed to put proper valuation upon even the sullen face of the murderous and death-stricken Amos. It became very lonely at Twenty Mile. For the love of God, Prentice, send me a man, he wrote to the agent at Fort Hamilton, three hundred miles upriver. Six weeks later, the Indian message brought back a reply. It was characteristic. Hell, both feet frozen. Need him myself, Prentice. To make matters worse, most of the Toyats were in the back country on the flanks of a caribou herd, and Jesuk was with them. Removing to a distance seemed to bring her closer than ever, and Neil Bonner found himself picturing her day by day, in camp and on trail. 
It is not good to be alone. Often he went out of the quiet store, bareheaded and frantic, and shook his fist at the blink of day that came over the southern skyline. And on cold, still nights he left his bed and stumbled into the frost, where he assaulted the silence at the top of his lungs as though it were some tangible, sentient thing that he might arouse or he shouted to the sleeping dogs till they howled and howled again. One shaggy brood he bought into the post, playing that it was the new man set by Prentice. He strove to make it sleep decently under the blankets at night, and to sit at table and eat as a man should. But the beast, mere domesticated wolf that it was, rebelled and sought out dark corners and snarled and bit him in the leg, and finally was beaten and driven forth. Then the trick of personification seized upon Neil Bonner and mastered him. All the forces of his environment metamorphosed into living, breathing entities and came to live with him. He recreated the primitive pantheon, reared an altar to the sun and burned candle fat and bacon grease thereon, and in the unfenced yard by the long-legged cachet made a frost devil, which he was wont to make faces at and mock when the mercury oozed down into the bulb. All this in play, of course. He said to himself that it was in play, and repeated it over and over to make sure, unaware that madness is ever prone to express itself and make believe in play. One midwinter day, Father Champro, a Jesuit missionary, pulled into Twenty Mile. Bonner fell upon him and dragged him into the post and clung to him and wept until the priest wept with him from pure compassion. Then Bonner became madly hilarious and made lavish entertainment, swearing valiantly that his guest should not depart. But Father Champro was pressing to salt water on urgent business for his order and pulled out next morning with Bonner's blood threatened on his head. And the threat was in a fair way towards realization when the Toyats returned from their long hunt to the winter camp. They had many furs, and there was much trading in stir at Twenty Mile. Also, Jesuk came to buy beads and scarlet cloths and things, and Bonner began to find himself again. He fought for a week against her. Then the end came one night when she rose to leave. She had not forgotten her repulse, and the pride that drove Spike O'Brien on to complete the Northwest Passage by land was her pride. I go now, she said. Good night, Neil. But he came up behind her. Nay, it is not well, he said. And as she turned her face toward him with a sudden joyful flash, he bent forward slowly and gravely, as it were a sacred thing, and kissed her on the lips. The Toyats had never taught her the meaning of a kiss upon the lips, but she understood and was glad. With the coming of Jesuk, at once things brightened up. She was regal in her happiness, a source of unending delight. The elemental workings of her mind and her naive little ways made an immense sum of pleasurable surprise to the over-civilized man that had stooped to catch her up. Not alone was she solace to his loneliness, but her primitiveness rejuvenated his jaded mind. It was as though, after long wandering, he had returned to pillow his head in the lap of Mother Earth. In short, in Jesuk he found the youth of the world, the youth and the strength and the joy. And to fill the full round of his need, and that they might not see over much of each other, there arrived at twenty mile one Sandy McPherson, as companionable a man as ever whistled along the trail or raised a ballad by a campfire. A Jesuit priest had run into his camp a couple of hundred miles up the Yukon in the nick of time to say a last word over the body of Sandy's partner. And on departing, the priest had said, My son, you will be lonely now. And Sandy had bowed his head brokenly. At twenty mile, the priest added, there is a lonely man. You have need of each other, my son. So it was that Sandy became a welcome third at the post, brother to the man and woman that resided there. He took Bonner moose hunting and wolf trapping, and in return, Bonner resurrected a battered and wayworn volume and made him friends with Shakespeare, till Sandy declaimed iambic pentameters to his sled dog whenever they waxed mutinous. And of the long evenings they played cribbage and talked and disagreed about the universe, while Jesuk rocked matronly in an easy chair and darned their moccasins and socks. Spring came. The sun shot up out of the south. The land exchanged its austere robes for the garb of a smiling wanton. Everywhere light laughed and life invited. The days stretched out their balmy length and nights passed from blinks of darkness to no darkness at all. The river bared its bosom and snorting steamboats challenged the wilderness. There were stir and bustle, new faces and fresh facts. 
an assistant arrived at Twenty Miles, and Sandy McPherson wandered off with a bunch of prospectors to invade the Koyukuk country. And there were newspapers and magazines and letters for Neil Bonner. And Jeezuk looked in worriment, for she knew his kindred talk with him across the world. Without much shock, it came to him that his father was dead. There was a sweet letter of forgiveness dictated in his last hours. There were official letters from the company graciously ordering him to turn the post over to the assistant and permitting him to depart at his earliest pleasure. A long legal affair from the lawyers informed him of interminable lists of stocks and bonds, real estates, rents, and chattels that were his by his father's will. And a dainty bit of stationery sealed in monogram implored Dion Neal's return to his heartbroken and loving mother. Neil Bonner did some swift thinking, and when the Yukon Bell coughed into the bank on her way down the Bering Sea, he departed. Departed with the ancient lie of quick return, young and blithe, on his lips. I'll come back, dear Jeezuk, before the first snow flies, he promised her, between the last kisses at the gangplank. And not only did he promise, but like the majority of men under the same circumstances, he really meant it. To John Thompson, the new agent, he gave orders for the extension of unlimited credit to his wife, Jeez Uck. Also, with his last look from the deck of the Yukon Bell, he saw a dozen men at work rearing the logs that were to make the most comfortable house along a thousand miles of riverfront, the house of Jeez Uck, and likewise the house of Neil Bonner, ere the first flurry of snow. For he fully and fondly meant to come back. Jeez Uck was dear to him, and further, a golden future awaited the North. With his father's money, he intended to verify that future. An ambitious dream allured him. With his four years of experience, and aided by this friendly cooperation of the PC Company, he would return to become the Rhodes of Alaska. And he would return, fast as steam could drive, as soon as he had put into shapes the affairs of his father, whom he had never known, and comforted his mother, whom he had forgotten. There was much ado when Neil Bonner came back from the Arctic, the fires were lighted and the flesh pots slung, and he took it of all and called it good. Not only was he bronzed and creased, but he was a new man under his skin, with a grip on things and a seriousness and control. His own companions were amazed when he declined to hit up the pace in the good old way, while his father's cronies rubbed their hands gleefully and became an authority upon the reclamation of wayward and idle youth. For four years Neil Bonner's mind had lain fallow. Little that was new had been added to it, but it had undergone a process of selection. It had, so to say, been purged of the trivial and superfluous. He had lived quick years down in the world, and up in the wilds time had been given to him to organize the confused mass of his experiences. His superficial standards had been flung to the winds, and new standards erected on deeper and broader generalizations. Concerning civilization, he had gone away with one set of values, had returned with another set of values. Aided also by the earth smells in his nostrils and the earth sights in his eyes, he laid hold of the inner significance of civilization, beholding with clear vision its futilities and powers. It was a simple little philosophy he evolved. Clean living was the way to grace. Duty performed was sanctification. One must live clean and do his duty in order that he might work. Work was salvation. And to work towards life abundant and more abundant was to be in line with the scheme of things and the will of God. Primarily, he was of the city, and his fresh earth grip and virile conception of humanity gave him a finer sense of civilization and endeared civilization to him. Day by day, the people of the city clung closer to him, and the world loomed more colossal. And, day by day, Alaska grew more remote and less real. And then he met Kitty Sharon, a woman of his own flesh and blood and kind, a woman who put her hand to his hand and drew him to her till he forgot the day and hour and the time of the year the first snow flies on the Yukon. End of the Story of Jeez Huck, Part 2section 10 The Story of Jeez Huck, Conclusion of the faith of men. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, July 2007. The Story of Jesuk Conclusion by Jack London. Jesuk moved into her grand log house and dreamed away three golden summer months. Then came the autumn, post haste before the downrush of winter. The air grew thin and sharp, the days thin and short. The river ran sluggishly, and skin ice formed in the quiet eddies. All migratory life departed south, and silence fell upon the land. The first snow flurries came, and the last homing steamboat bucked desperately into the running mush ice. Then came the hard ice, solid cakes and sheets, till the Yukon ran level with its banks. And when all this ceased, the river stood still, and the blinking days lost themselves in the darkness. John Thompson, the new agent, laughed, but Jesuk had faith in the mischances of sea and river. Neil Bonner might be frozen anywhere between Chilkoot Pass and St. Michael's, for the last travelers of the year are always caught by the ice, when they exchange boat for sled and dash on through the long hours behind the flying dogs. But no flying dogs came up the trail, nor down the trail, to Twenty Mile and John Thompson told Jesuk, with a certain gladness ill-concealed, that Bonner would never come back again. Also, and brutally, he suggested his own eligibility. Jesuk laughed in his face and went back to her grand log house. But when midwinter came, when hopes die down and life is at its lowest ebb, Jesuk found she had no credit at the store. This was Thompson's doing, and he rubbed his hands and walked up and down, and came to his door and looked up at Jesuk's house and waited, and he continued to wait. She sold her dog team to a party of miners and paid cash for her food, and when Thompson refused to honor even her coin, Toyette Indians made her purchases and sledded them up to her house in the dark. In February the first post came in over the ice, and John Thompson read in the society column of a five-month-old paper of the marriage of Neil Bonner and Kitty Sharon. Jesuk held the door ajar and him outside while he imparted the information, and when he had done, laughed pridefully and did not believe. In March, and all alone, she gave birth to a man-child, a brave bit of new life at which she marveled. And at that hour, a year later, Neil Bonner sat by another bed, marveling at another bit of new life that had fared into the world. The snow went off the ground and the ice broke out of the Yukon. The sun journeyed north and journeyed south again, and the money from the being spent, Jesuk went back to her own people. Oshish, a shrewd hunter, proposed to kill the meat for her and her babe, and catch all the salmon if she would marry him. And Amago and Hayo and Wainuch, husky young hunters all, made similar proposals, but she elected to live alone and seek her own meat and flesh. She sewed moccasins and parkas and mittens, warm, serviceable things, and pleasing to the eye, withal, what of the ornamental hair tufts and beadwork. These she sold to the miners, who were drifting faster into the land each year. And not only did she win food that was good and plentiful, but she laid money by, and one day took passage on the Yukon Bell down the river. At St. Michael's she washed dishes in the kitchen of the post. The servants of the company wondered at the remarkable woman with the remarkable child, though they asked no questions, and she vouchsafed nothing. But just before the Bering Sea closed in for the year, she bought a passage south on a strayed sealing schooner. That winter she cooked for Captain Markham's household at Unalaska, and in the spring continued south to Sitka on a whiskey sloop. Later on appeared at Michalata, which is near to St. Mary's at the end of the Panhandle, where she worked in the cannery through the salmon season. When autumn came and the Siwash fishermen prepared to return to Puget Sound, she embarked with a couple of families in a big cedar canoe, and with them she threaded the hazardous chaos of the Alaskan and Canadian coasts till the Straits of Juan de Fuca were passed, and she led her boy by the hand up the hard pave of Seattle. There she met Sandy McPherson on a windy corner, very much surprised, and, when he had heard her story, very wroth. Not so wroth as he might have been had he known of Kitty Sharon, but of her Jesuk breathed not a word, for she had never believed. Sandy, who read commonplace and sordid desertion into the circumstance, 
strove to dissuade her from her trip to San Francisco, while Neil Bonner was supposed to live when he was at home. And having striven, he made her comfortable, bought her tickets and saw her off, the while smiling in her face and muttering, Damn shame, into his beard. With roar and rumble, through daylight and dark, swaying and lurching between the dawns, soaring into winter snows and sinking into summer valleys, skirting depths, leaping chasms, piercing mountains, Jeezuck and her boy were hurled south. But she had no fear of the iron stallion, nor was she stunned by the masterful civilization of Neil Bonner's people. It seemed, rather, that she saw with greater clearness the wonder that a man of such godlike race had held her in his arms. The screaming medley of San Francisco, with its restless shipping, belching factories, and thundering traffics, did not confuse her. Instead, she comprehended swiftly the pitiful sordidness of Twenty Mile and the Skins Lodge Toyot village. And she looked down at the boy that clutched her hand and wondered that she had borne him by such a man. She paid the hack driver five pieces and went up the stone steps of Neil Bonner's front door. A slant-eyed Japanese parlayed with her for a fruitless space then led her inside and disappeared. She remained in the hall, which to her simple fancy seemed to be the guest room, the show place wherein were arrayed all the household treasures with the frank purpose of parade and dazzlement. The walls and ceilings were of oiled and paneled redwood. The floor was more glassy than glare ice, and she sought standing place on one of the great skins that gave a sense of security to the polished surface. A huge fireplace, an extravagant fireplace she deemed it, yawned in the farther wall. A flood of light, mellowed by stained glass, fell across the room, and from the far end came the white gleam of a marble figure. This much she saw, and more, when the slant-eyed servant led the way past another room, of which she caught a fleeting glance, and into a third, both of which dimmed the brave show of the entrance hall. And to her eyes the great house seemed to hold out the promise of endless similar rooms. There was such length and breadth to them, and the ceilings were so far away, for the first time since her advent into the white man's civilization, a feeling of awe laid hold of her. Neil, her Neil, lived in this house, breathed the air of it, and lay down at night and slept. It was beautiful, all that she saw, and it pleased her. But she felt, also, the wisdom and mastery behind. It was the concrete expression of power in terms of beauty, and it was the power that she unerringly divined. And then came a woman, queenly tall, crowned with a glory of hair that was like a golden sun. She seemed to come toward Jizuk as a ripple of music across still water, her sweeping garment itself a song, her body playing rhythmically beneath. Jizuk herself was a man compeller. There were Ochich and Amago and Hayo and Wainuch, to say nothing of Neil Bonner and John Thompson and other white men that had looked upon her and felt her power but she gazed upon the wide blue eyes and rose-white skin of this woman that advanced to meet her, and she measured her with a woman's eyes looking through a man's eyes, and as a man compeller she felt herself diminish and grow insignificant before this radiant and flashing creature. "'You wish to see my husband?' the woman asked, and Jizuk gasped at the liquid silver of voice that had never sounded harsh cries at snarling wolf-dogs nor molded itself to guttural speech, nor toughened in storm and frost and camp smoke. No, Jizuk answered slowly and gropingly, in order she might do justice to her English. I came to see Neil Bonner. He is my husband, the woman laughed. Then it was true. John Thompson had not lied that bleak February day when she laughed pridefully and shut the door in his face. As once she had thrown Amos Pentley across her knee and ripped her knife into the air, so now she felt impelled to spring upon this woman and bear her back and down and tear the life out of her fair body. But Jizuk was thinking quickly and gave no sign, and Kitty Bonner little dreamed how intimately she had for an instant been related with sudden death. Jizuk nodded her head that she understood, and Kitty Bonner explained that Neil was expected at any moment. Then they sat down on ridiculously comfortable chairs and Kitty sought to entertain her strange visitor, and Jizuk strove to help her. "'You knew my husband in the North?' Kitty asked once. "'Sure, I wash him clothes,' Jizuk had answered, her English abruptly beginning to grow atrocious. "'And this is your boy? I have a little girl.' Kitty caused her daughter to be brought, and while the children, after the manner struck an acquaintance, 
the mothers indulged in the talk of mothers and drank tea from cups so fragile that Jesuk feared lest hers should crumble to pieces beneath her fingers. Never had she seen such cups so delicate and dainty. In her mind she compared them with the woman who poured the tea, and there uprose in contrast the gourds and pannikins of the Toyat village and the clumsy mugs of Twenty Mile to which she likened herself. And in such fashion and such terms the problem presented itself. She was beaten. There was a woman, other than herself, better fitted to bear and upbring Neil Bonner's children. Just as his people exceeded her people, so did his womankind exceed her. They were the man-compellers, as their men were the world-compellers. She looked at the rose-white tenderness of Kitty Bonner's skin and remembered the sunbeat on her own face. Likewise she looked from the brown hand to white, the one work-worn and hardened by whip-handle and paddle, the other as guiltless of toil and as soft as a newborn babe's. And for all the obvious softness and apparent weakness, Jesuk looked into the blue eyes and saw the mastery she had seen in Neil Bonner's eyes, and in the eyes of Neil Bonner's people. "'Why, it's Jesuk," Neil Bonner said when he entered. He said it calmly, with even a ring of joyful cordiality, coming over to her and shaking both her hands, but looking into her eyes with a worry in his own that she understood. "'Hello, Neil,' she said. "'You look much good.' "'Fine, fine, Jesuk," he answered heartily, though secretly studying Kitty for some sign of what had passed between the two. Yet he knew his wife too well to expect, even though the worst had passed, such a sign. "'Well, I can't say how glad I am to see you,' he went on. "'What's happened? Did you strike a mine? And when did you get in?' "'Oh, uh, I get in today,' she replied, her voice instinctively seeking its guttural parts. I no strike it, Neil. You know Captain Markham on Alaska. I cook his house long time. No spend money. By and by plenty. Pretty good, I think, go down and see white man's land. Very fine, white man's land. Very fine, she added. Her English puzzled him, for Sandy and he had sought constantly to better her speech, and she had proved an apt pupil. Now it seemed that she had sunk back into her race. Her face was guileless, stolidly guileless, giving no clue. Kitty's untroubled brow likewise baffled him. What had happened? How much had been said, and how much guessed? While he wrestled with these questions, and while Jesuk wrestled with her problem, never had he looked so wonderful and great, a silence fell. To think that you knew my husband in Alaska, Kitty said softly. Knew him? Jesuk could not forbear a glance at the boy she had borne him and his eyes followed her mechanically to the window where played the two children. An iron hand seemed to tighten across his forehead. His knees went weak and his heart leaped up and pounded like a fist against his breast. His boy! He had never dreamed it! Little Kitty Bonner, fairy-like in gauzy lawn, with pinkest of cheeks and bluest of dancing eyes, arms outstretched and lips puckered in invitation, was striving to kiss the boy. And the boy... Lean and lithe, sun-beaten and brown, skin-clad and hair-fringed and hair-tufted and mucklucks that showed the wear of the sea in rough work, coolly withstood her advances, his body straight and stiff, with the peculiar erectness common to children of savage people. A stranger in a strange land, unabashed and unafraid, he appeared more like an untamed animal, silent and watchful, his black eyes flashing from face to face, quiet so long as quiet endured but prepared to spring and fight and tear and scratch for life at the first sign of danger. The contrast between boy and girl was striking, but not pitiful. There was too much strength in the boy for that, waif that he was of the generations of Spack, Spike O'Brien, and Bonner. In his features, clean-cut as cameo and almost classic in their severity, there were the power and achievement of his father and his grandfather, and the one known as the Big Fat, who was captured by the sea people and had escaped to Kamchatka. Neil Bonner fought his emotion down, swallowed it down, and choked over it, though his face smiled with good humor and the joy with which one meets a friend. "'Your boy, eh, Jizuk? he said. And then, turning to Kitty, "'Handsome fellow. He'll do something with those two hands of his in this our world.' Kitty nodded concurrence. "'What is your name?' she asked. The young savage flashed his quick eyes upon her and dwelt over her for a space, seeking out, as it were, the motive beneath the question. 
Neil, he answered deliberately, when the scrutiny had satisfied him. Injun talk, Jizuk interposed, glibly manufacturing languages on the spur of the moment. Him injun talk, Neil, all the same, cracker. Him baby, him like cracker, him cry for cracker. Him say, Neil, Neil, all the time, Neil. Then I say that um name, so um name all time Neil. Never did a sound more blessed fall upon Neil Bonner's ear than that lie from Jizuk's lips. It was the cue, and he knew there was a reason for Kitty's untroubled brow. And his father, Kitty asked, he must be a fine man. Oh, well, yes, was the reply. Um, father, fine man, sure. Did you know him, Neil? queried Kitty. Know him? Most intimately, Neil answered, and harked back to dreary twenty mile and the man alone in the silence with his thoughts. And here might well end the story of Jizuk, but for the crown she put upon her renunciation. When she returned to the north to dwell in her grand log house, John Thompson found that the PC company could make a shift somehow to carry on its business without his aid. Also, the new agent and the succeeding agents received instructions that the woman G's Uck should be given whatsoever goods and grub she desired, in whatsoever quantity she ordered, and that no charge should be placed upon the books. Further, the company paid yearly to the woman G's Uck a pension of $5,000. When he had attained suitable age, Father Champro laid hands upon the boy, and the time was not long when Jizuk received letters regularly from the Jesuit College in Maryland. Later on these letters came from Italy, and still later from France, and in the end there returned to Alaska one Father Neil, a man mighty for good in the land, who loved his mother, and who ultimately went into a wider field and rose to high authority in that order. Jizuk was a young woman when she went back into the north, and men still looked upon her and yearned. But she lived straight, and no breath was ever raised saved in commendation. She stayed for a while with the good sisters at Holy Cross, where she learned to read and write, and became versed in practical medicine and surgery. After that, she returned to her grand log house and gathered about her the young girls of the Toyat village, to show them the way of their feet in the world. It is neither Protestant nor Catholic, this school in the house built by Neil Bonner for Jesuk, his wife, but the missionaries of all the sects look upon it with equal favor. The latch string is always out, and tired prospectors and trail-weary men turn aside from the flowing river, or frozen trail, to rest there for a space, and be warmed by her fire. And, down in the States, Kitty Bonner is pleased at the interest her husband takes in Alaskan education and the large sums he devotes to that purpose. And, though she often smiles and chaffs, deep down and secretly she is but the prouder of him. End The Story of Jizuk End The Faith of Men by Jack London